Chapter fourteen of History of Iceland by Knut Gudjursen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Great calamities in Iceland: the Danish trade monopoly, new literary activity, the religious and dynastic wars which rent Europe during the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries did not disturb the general tranquillity of Iceland, but various misfortunes occasioned much suffering and awakened serious apprehension for the future of the country overseas trade upon which the people depended for so many of their necessaries was often seriously disturbed and at times completely interrupted by the great wars pirates swarmed the ocean picking up merchantmen plying between iceland and continental ports and at any moment they might swoop down upon the unprotected shores and sack exposed coast settlements the lack of adequate protection kept the people in constant fear of piratic raids which were increasing in frequency and boldness the analyst jan espelin relates that in sixteen fourteen spanish buccaneers carried away sheep and cattle in the district of vestfjord and extorted money from the people english pirates under the leadership of john gentleman came to the vestman Nayar where the, they robbed houses and destroyed property they placed muskets before the breasts of the people with laughter and ridicule says the analyst the church bell they seized and fastened to the mast of their ship but they killed no one and they sailed then back to england trading vessels were also plundered in de Upavag in sixteen fifteen pirates came to patrick's fjord with the intention of ravaging the vest fjord districts they had seized some englishmen whom they brought with them and after plundering the neighbourhood they departed a little later spanish buccaneers came to the coast with three ships and ill-treated and robbed the people one of their ships was wrecked so that eighty of them had to seek refuge on shore these were attacked by the people under the leadership of ari magnuson acting under royal orders thirty-one of them were killed in icefjord thirteen in dryfjord and eighteen more in id and sandreyri the rest operated as robber bands until they were finally exterminated the buccaneers now became so bold in their operations that in sixteen sixteen king christian the fourth detailed war vessels to protect the icelandic trade in sixteen eighteen he sent warships under two royal commissioners frederick frius and jorgen wind to drive the pirates from the sea the commissioners were also given power to deal with all important matters both of church and state in iceland they decided many important cases at the althing says the analyst many persons both men and women were sentenced to death and executed for adultery what success they had in their operations against the pirates is not recorded but it soon became evident that they had not driven them from the ocean on june twelfth sixteen twenty seven algerian pirates entered grindavik and took a danish merchant ship with its cargo and several sailors and other people on board among others the wife of jan good laugsen and her sons and brothers meeting another vessel outside of the harbour they decoyed it with the flag from the ship which they had just seized and captured it the first one they then sent with their booty to the barbary states afterwards they sailed to Faxafloy, intending to attack besta dear but the governor holgar rosencrans had gathered men and ships in the neighbourhood he constructed breastworks and mounted some guns when they saw these preparations for defence they did not venture an assault one of their ships ran aground but they transferred their prisoners and booty to the other ships as this proved very difficult the governor was severely criticised because he did not use this opportunity to attack them they then sailed to the east fjords where they seized many cattle captured one hundred and ten persons and killed many others the greatest outrage was committed on the vest manne yar also in sixteen twenty seven arriving there with three ships and three hundred men the pirates divided into three bands and overran the whole island with loud yells massacring the terror-stricken and helpless inhabitants after driving the people together in a large storehouse belonging to the danish merchants they selected the youngest and strongest and drove them on board their ships they then set fire to the building and burned it with those who remained the priest in the islands jan thorsteinsen the hymn writer was struck dead while kneeling in prayer 
his wife and children were driven on board the ships the parish church was burned and those who tried to escape were mercilessly hunted down and slain after destroying what could not be carried away the robbers sailed back to africa where they sold their captives as slaves most of these died soon those who survived wrote such touching letters to their home folks that money was finally collected for their ransom both in denmark and iceland in sixteen thirty two king christian the fourth sent a large sum to the barbary states to secure their liberation thirty-seven persons were thus rescued besides the priest olaf eggleston who had been liberated after a captivity of two years of the people carried away by the pirates only thirteen ever returned to their native land great volcanic eruptions together with cold winters and severe epidemics increased the difficulties under which the people were struggling in sixteen ninety five and sixteen ninety six the winters were so severe that not only did the rivers freeze where they were never known to freeze before but the ocean around all iceland became ice-bound hard winters recurred in seventeen eighty four and seventeen ninety two in the latter year horses were driven across the southern haviti on the ice the twelfth of may and the frost did not leave the ground all summer these severe winters were usually accompanied by violent storms in which large numbers of boats and fishermen were lost still more destructive was the havoc wrought by earthquakes and volcanic eruptions in sixteen eighteen to sixteen nineteen volcanic outbreaks and earthquakes destroyed many farmsteads causing much suffering and loss of property a volcanic eruption in eastern iceland in sixteen twenty five lasted for twelve days and was so violent that ashes fell even in bergen norway in sixteen thirty six the great volcano hecla became active this being its fifteenth recorded eruption its activity lasted from may eight until the following winter and ashes were deposited over large areas in sixteen sixty an outbreak of the katla destroyed the presbytery and church of hoth de breca together with many farmsteads in sixteen ninety three occurred a violent eruption of the hecla the sixteenth ashes were deposited over all iceland and were even carried to scotland and norway in the eighteenth century even greater destruction was wrought in seventeen twenty seven an eruption of the orrifa yokel began august three and lasted till may twenty five the following year many farms were blotted out and hundreds of sheep and horses were killed through an earthquake at rangeveller and ice to in september seventeen thirty two eleven or twelve farmsteads were destroyed and forty were more or less damaged in seventeen fifty five an eruption of the katla destroyed thirteen farms and covered a large part of scaffa fell with a deposit of ashes so deep that fifty farms had to be abandoned in seventeen eighty three occurred a violent outbreak of the skaptar yoko one of the most destructive in the history of iceland nine farms were entirely wiped out twenty-nine more were ruined and two parishes were rendered uninhabitable for two years the meadows were devastated and a large number of animals died of starvation and disease according to reliable sources the loss of animals during the years seventeen eighty three to seventeen eighty four was eleven thousand four hundred and sixty one head of cattle one hundred and ninety thousand four hundred and forty eight sheep and twenty eight thousand thirteen horses in seventeen eighty four a great earthquake in southern iceland destroyed sixty nine farmsteads totally wrecked for sixty four and seriously damaged three hundred and seventy two of houses one thousand four hundred and fifty nine were levelled with the ground two hundred and twelve were wrecked and three hundred and thirty three were seriously damaged owing to such calamities which brought about a general dislocation of economic life famine and disease swept away the stricken people in large numbers the analysts state in seventeen o two one hundred and twenty persons died of hunger in thingayarsla alone the death rate in general was very high owing to undernourishment and unwholesome food in seventeen o seven a great smallpox epidemic swept the country carrying away eighteen thousand people or about one-third of the entire population in seventeen fifty seven twenty two thousand five hundred died of hunger in the skelholt diocese the suffering due to these causes became especially great after the eruption of the scaffels which so seriously depleted the flocks and herds of the country in a report from the whole archdiocese bishop arney thorarinson states 
that two thousand one hundred and forty five persons had died of hunger and that three hundred and fifteen farms had been abandoned as a result of this calamity it is estimated that nine thousand two hundred and thirty eight persons died in iceland of hunger and attendant diseases people fell dead from exhaustion in going from one farm to another children lost their parents in and in many households not a person survived during this century says magnus stevenson iceland experienced forty-three years of distress due to cold winters ice floes failures of fisheries shipwrecks inundations volcanic eruptions earthquakes epidemics and contagious diseases among men and animals which often came separately but often in connection with and as a result of one another statistics show how the herds were depleted and how the population of iceland was decreasing at this time population seventeen o three fifty thousand eighteen seventy seven seventy two thousand sheep seventeen o three two hundred and eighty thousand eighteen seventy five hundred thousand cattle seventeen o three thirty five thousand eighteen seventy six twenty thousand horses seventeen o three twenty six thousand eighteen seventy six thirty one thousand another cause which tended to deprive the common people of all hope of progress and economic well-being in the eighteenth century was the existing system of land ownership a large part of the soil of iceland had in course of time been converted into crown estates and church lands which the people had to till as renters the crown lands embraced in all seven hundred and thirty five farms the bishop's seat of skalholt owned three hundred and ten that of holar three hundred and twenty the various church estates included six hundred and seventy five and thirty one belonged to hospitals and funds for the poor in all two thousand seventy one farms while two thousand one hundred and sixteen were privately owned the administration of the royal estates was in the hands of the land Fogetti, who resided at bessa Tadir, later at vidi he had direct charge of all royal estates in gul bring us sla issued leases and collected the rents at the old thing he met and made public announcements of the estates which were vacant these were then leased at public auction to the highest bidder the lands belonging to the bishop's seats were managed by an administrator called economus who leased the lands hired servants for the bishop's residence and served as steward in the household the rent was usually fixed at one twentieth of the taxable value of the farm but owing to volcanic eruptions floods and other misfortunes the people were often unable to pay and would then have to part with their personal belongings to cover the deficit magnus kettleson wrote in seventeen seventy the peasants create debts every year and as they fear these i must see to my sorrow that they now offer me their own clothes and those of their wives no changes were made in the rents from generation to generation or even from century to century although the farms had often lost much of their original productivity through volcanic eruptions or poor management of impoverished renters it was stated by many prominent and well-informed icelanders that many farms still rent for the same amount as in the past could not support one-fifth as many cattle as formerly as a rule the renters also had to agree to keep the houses in repair a very heavy burden often connected with great expense as timber was very costly and difficult to procure but if anything was not in order when the renter left the manager would demand a considerable sum as indemnity the royal land fogetti would often act in a most unjust and arbitrary way about chairman dressa it is stated in a letter to the stiff tam to mather of seventeen seventy five that he was a confirmed drunkard that he abused the peasants when they were unable to pay their dues seized all their belongings and drove them from their homes to no matter at what season of the year and that he often failed to give them credit for the property he had taken he was finally dismissed from office because of his harshness and unseemly conduct the system of subletting was extensively practised the royal estates and likewise also the lands of the bishop's seats were often rented to priests officials or other persons of standing who subleased them to peasants and lived a life of leisure from incomes pressed from the real tillers of the soil the sublessees helial ag whom men were often reduced to a condition resembling villainage as they had to render service to their landlords in addition to the payment of rent for their small farmsteads which usually could keep only a cow or two and a few sheep the landlord also furnished a certain number of cattle called Gugildi, 
danish cavilder the amount of rent for the livestock was not fixed by law as a rule it was very high and had to be paid in butter and as the renter was often unable to produce enough of that commodity to pay his rent he had to content himself with a mixture of tallow and train oil on his own table one of the most perplexing features of the relation between landlord and renter was the question who should pay the loss when cattle died it was generally held that if they died of old age the owner should replace them that if they died from the lack of proper care the renter should make good the loss but this rule fair enough in the abstract created endless trouble when it was to be practically applied in case of cattle and sheep diseases losses were often great and the controversy would be accordingly bitter when the sheep disease broke out in seventeen sixty one and in ten years reduced the number from four hundred and ninety one thousand to one hundred and twelve thousand it would seem that the renters could not be held responsible for such a calamity but many landlords among others the bishop's seat of scalholt nevertheless demanded that they should pay the loss the service which the renters and poorer classes had to render the land etty and the landlords was often very burdensome one duty imposed upon the renters was the manslan which consisted chiefly in rowing the king's fishing boats during the fishing season as the land forgetty found fishing very profitable he often greatly increased the number of boats and all sorts of threats and intimidations were used to compel the people to row them the peasants had to leave their homes or send their sons to perform this hated service another form of service was the raslan at the thingi rar oyster the men had to meet with shod horses september thirty every year and make a trip which lasted from eight to ten days horses also had to be furnished to bring the stip tammether and the land fogetti the bishops and other high officials to the all thing together with quantities of food and drink for the session every fall horses and men also had to be provided to bring the stip tammether fish to the seaport towns and whenever the stip tem mater or land forgetty needed horses for home use or travel the peasants had to stand ready to render the desired service the more common form of service was the dag's work which consisted in ordinary work to be performed on the landlord's estates during haying the manslan was counted equivalent to twenty alnor forty fish and roslan ten alnor twenty fish and the dog's work five alnor these three forms of service constituted what was known as the fixed service another kind required on royal estates and lands belonging to the bishoprics but never demanded on private estates was the undefined service which consisted in help to be given in erection of buildings in repairing fences etc another burden imposed on renters was the feeding of a certain number of the landlord's cattle over winter during seasons of hay shortage this burden was very grievous as the poor peasant often had to slaughter his own cattle in order to feed those of his landlord the peasant's cheerless hovel in the lack of most ordinary comforts in his home life was a striking evidence of the hopeless poverty to which he had been reduced as the merchants brought little timber to the country because it required much room in their ships it became so scarce and expensive that the peasants could not use it even for framework in their cottages but had to build them of sod and stone the cis lu mather bigfus thorarinson gives the following description of a peasant's home the living room bath stofa is usually eight feet wide and sixteen feet long built of sod with roof of the same material and with the wooden inside walls the kitchen and pantry built of the same material and in the same way are about one half as large as the living room the general interior appearance of these peasants huts is described by jan jansen as follows the bath stofa on the common peasant farmstead was usually not covered with boards on the inside one could see between the rafters to the grass-covered roof which soon looked like ordinary sod and from which mildew and cobwebs were hanging the floor was uncovered consisting only of earth trampled hard but during heavy rains when the roof was leaking water dripped down and it soon became a pool of mud through which the people waded the walls along which the bedsteads were nailed fast were covered with a gray coat of mildew and green slime was constantly trickling down the walls especially in the winter bedclothes were very few among the poor people old hay seaweed or twigs did service as 
mattress and a few blankets constituted the covering in some houses a little loft was built a pallor two or three feet from the ground where the people of the household stayed the dark room underneath the pallor was occupied by lambs and young calves which needed special care one trouble with all dwellings though there might be considerable difference between them was the want of light in a house where there was no heating apparatus as in the icelandic bath stofa and in a climate as chilly as that of iceland it was necessary to preserve the heat as well as possible the windows were therefore both few and small and were usually placed in the roof above the bed a window consisted of only one pane and this was not of glass but of a thin membrane lick na belger stretched upon a frame and placed in a hole in the roof when the wind was strong the window would often break and the women would have to mend them it can readily be understood that these windows admitted so little light into the room that the people had to sit in continual darkness even in the middle of the day the effect of this kind of dwellings on the health and well-being of the people was injurious in the extreme magnus olafsson member of a royal commission writing about conditions in iceland at this time says one can understand how these miserably constructed houses of the poor contribute to the spread of all sorts of diseases as the houses especially in dwelling are very low there the people sit on the loft and the air is so impure that a stranger who is not accustomed to it can scarcely endure it for an hour as it is corrupted by the smoke of the train oil lamps and the respiration and perspiration of the people of whom many are affected with scurvy and other diseases when pregnant women and small children have to breathe this infected air it is not strange that many even in their youth become affected with tuberculosis and spit blood when they move about rapidly one feature still overlooked in these reports says jan jansen which did not improve the air in the bath stofa namely the fact that the men sat all day with their pipes in their mouths smoking so that the smoke rolled out as a from a factory chimney the merchants had made them believe that if they only smoked a great deal no sickness would attack them how wretched and helpless the people must have been in such an environment when smallpox epidemics and other dangerous diseases broke out can readily be imagined the sick and the well were huddled together in their dark hovels without medical aid and usually even without proper food for the weak and suffering in the eighteenth century leprosy became a most dreaded scourge due to no doubt to unsanitary conditions and unwholesome food as the lepers could not be isolated but had to live in the house with the rest it is not strange that the disease should spread the four hospitals found in the country could take care of only a small number of patients how many lepers were found in the country in seventeen seventy is not known says jan jansen but in selt Yarnarnes alone where there were only ten farms there were twenty lepers judging from these figures there must have been at that time a great number in the whole country the icelandic peasants bore their wretched lot with great patience and fortitude though complaints were often heard they scarcely ever resisted their landlords or failed in the performance of the duties imposed upon them but their hopeless condition destroyed their optimism and spirit of enterprise since various calamities had reduced them to abject poverty and since the system of land ownership made it impossible for them to own their houses or the soil they tilled they lost all hope of accomplishing anything but keeping themselves and their families alive as the farms were not improved they lost rather than gained in productivity with a stoic mental attitude developed under conditions of extreme adversity the peasants could endure hardships but their suffering and economic dependence fostered an unprogressive and apathetic spirit unfavorable to social development of the various causes which gradually plunged the icelandic people into so disheartening economic and social conditions the most grievous was probably the danish trade monopoly which prohibited all foreign intercourse with iceland for centuries the hanseatic league had controlled commerce in northern europe after its disintegration great commercial and maritime states had arisen spain portugal the netherlands france and england which entered into a sharp contest for trade advantages and colonial dominions in the western hemispheres as well as in the far east 
the prevailing economic views governing trade relations at that time were not those of competition and free intercourse but of trade monopoly and complete exclusion of rivals from markets within a nation's sphere of control the trade with distant lands was seldom carried on by the governments directly but was usually granted as a monopoly to commercial companies enjoying the most extensive privileges and powers and responsible to no one after obtaining their charters and paying the required sum to the royal treasury the netherlands which succeeded portugal and spain as the leading commercial state developed a commercial policy scarcely less tyrannical than that of spain itself the colonial trade was carried on by commercial companies which received a monopoly of traffic in certain areas establishing regulations which often resulted in incompetence and corruption the dutch west india company founded in sixteen twenty one controlled the trade west of the cape of good hope comprising commerce with the west coast of africa and the east coast of america this was virtually a corporation of privateers who even opposed the termination of the war between spain and the netherlands in a remonstrance of sixteen thirty three as the cessation of hostilities would lessen their chances to prey on spanish treasure ships the dutch east india company chartered in sixteen o two secured a monopoly of the trade eastward from the cape of good hope it established numerous trading stations in south africa on the coast of asia and on the islands in the malay archipelago where they broke the power of the portuguese and established a monopoly over many of the most valuable articles of commerce in england trade with france spain and portugal was open to all merchants but commerce with the rest of the world was carried on by chartered companies exercising a monopoly within their specified territory the eastland company controlled the trade with the scandinavian countries and the baltic provinces the russian company with russia the levant company had exclusive trade privileges in the mediterranean region the east india company in asia the guinea or african company on the west coast of africa the virginia company plymouth company and hudson bay company controlled the trade with america each within its allotted sphere in denmark norway the enterprising and energetic king christian the fourth fifteen eighty eight to sixteen forty eight sought to secure for his realms a fair share of the commerce of the world in his efforts to promote trade he pursued the general policy of the age of establishing trade monopolies and commercial companies the danish east india company was chartered in sixteen sixteen the west india company in sixteen twenty five the greenland company in sixteen thirty six the trade with iceland was treated in a similar way foreign competitors were excluded and the trade with the island was to remain exclusively in the hands of citizens of the realm in justice to the danish government it must be said then that this way of dealing with icelandic commerce did not differ from the general policy pursued by other nations at this time but the system was so faulty and the need in iceland of a well-regulated commerce was so great that the corrupt practices and limitation of the trade due to the commercial monopoly soon brought serious distress and economic disaster upon the people in sixteen o two the trade with iceland was granted to a company of danish merchants of the cities of copenhagen helsinger and malme for a period of twelve years and all foreign trade with the island was forbidden by royal orders the merchants receiving this trade monopoly should sail to the various icelandic harbors and bring thither a sufficient supply of good goods which were to be sold at the prices which had formerly obtained and according to weights and measures which had been in use in iceland if differences should arise between the merchants and the people the matter should be decided by the all thing but these regulations were not obeyed things soon took such a turn that after two years the people were forced to bring their complaints to the king not only were the goods now brought to iceland much more costly than before but necessaries like timber tar and iron could no longer be had in sufficient quantities in sixteen nineteen the king established a price schedule according to which goods were to be sold in iceland but the merchants complained that the prices on their goods were too low and brought such pressure to bear that a more favourable schedule was granted them in sixteen thirty one when this was brought before the all thing the people made vigorous protests bishop gisley odson was sent to copenhagen with a remonstrance to the king which moved him to set aside the new price schedule and order that the prices of sixteen nineteen should remain in force 
king christian the fourth died february twenty eighth sixteen forty eight and was succeeded by his son frederick the third ever since the union of the two realms established at kalmar in thirteen ninety seven the king of denmark norway had been placed on the throne through election by the danish estates an arrangement which enabled the privileged classes to exercise a dominant influence upon the government since the kings had to sign charters restricting their powers and safeguarding the privileges of the nobility the personal friends of the new king resolved to do away with these restrictions upon his power under the leadership of hans nansen mayor of copenhagen and bishop svein of sealand they overthrew the rule of the aristocracy in a coup d'etat in copenhagen september tenth sixteen sixty proclaiming frederick the third absolute hereditary monarch the nobles were forced to give their consent the charter was returned to the king as a token that the restrictions upon his power were annulled and on october eighteenth he was formally hailed as hereditary king of denmark in accordance with the principles of absolutism a new constitution the Congolov, lex regia was prepared in sixteen sixty five enumerating in detail the powers which he was to exercise without restrictions of any sort by an act of sixteen sixty one he was formally made hereditary and absolute monarch the norwegian estates summoned to meet in christiana may twenty seventh sixteen sixty one also hailed frederick the third as absolute hereditary king with this accomplished steps were also taken to secure from the icelanders a pledge of allegiance to the new regime king frederick the third issued a summons to the leading men bishops provosts priests laymen lawmen cislumen logretumen and farmers to assemble at the all thing for this purpose but as henrik beljeka the hertste jury governor-general did not arrive in iceland in time to attend the meeting he asked the men summoned to meet him near besa tadir on the coast a meeting was accordingly assembled at the cop of Og by the lawman arne odson july twenty eighth sixteen sixty two where the required oath was taken in the presence of henrik Bialka as the king's representative in order to safeguard their liberty as far as possible the representatives demanded that their laws should be preserved to them a request which Bialka seems to have granted the same summer the assembled all thing declared that the icelanders would act according to the old icelandic agreement and the icelandic laws some years before in sixteen forty nine king frederick the third sent a royal letter to the icelanders with the hearth Jori henrik bielka saying we promise you all separately and collectively to maintain for you your laws and statutes and to let you enjoy the rights and liberties which have been yours hitherto the ceremony of yielding formal homage to the king as hereditary and absolute monarch was celebrated by a festival to which all the representatives at copa vogue were invited salutes were fired and fireworks illuminated the sky the ceremony was staged by the governor chiefly in glorification of his sovereign as the icelanders had not been consulted as a matter of form they were asked to ratify an accomplished act a request which they were not in position to refuse to them the affair at copa vogue was only a new humiliation a further encroachment upon their national liberty and autonomy how they really felt in the midst of these festivities accompanied by the booming of guns can be seen from the fact that the aged magnus bjornsson for twenty-three years lawman in northern iceland upon hearing of the king's request resigned from his office and did not go to the all thing his son gisli magnusson sislu mather uh, Lidarendi, was elected to succeed him but refused to serve declaring that he would rather leave the country and go to holland than accept the office thorleif kortsen was then chosen a man notorious for his avarice and his zeal in witchcraft prosecutions a veritable scourge of his time arne odson lawman in southern iceland was already an old man but it may have been due in part to these untoward events that after the meeting in kopavog he immediately resigned in denmark where a haughty nobility had long oppressed the common people the introduction of absolutism was welcomed by many as the fatherly protection of an absolute king might tend to shield them against the wanton acts of the feudal lords
but in iceland where no nobility existed the sudden increase of royal power carried with it no such advantage on the contrary it could only serve to make the royal officials more despotic and arbitrary as it would deprive the people of all control of legislation destroy the last vestige of power and influence of the all thing and make the country wholly subservient to the dictates of a foreign ruler henrik Bielka, who was a norwegian by birth remained governor for twenty-three years but after sixteen sixty two he did not again visit iceland he sought to promote many undertakings which might be useful to the people and strove to prevent the placing of increased burdens upon them through the levying of new taxes but in his absence he was represented by Fogatar, acting as his deputies many of whom were cruel and despotic officials who failed to carry out his plans the worst of these was thomas nicholson who finally drowned in sixteen sixty five to the great relief of the people for over twenty years after the introduction of absolutism the government of iceland remained unchanged but when bielka died in sixteen eighty three many changes were made in the administration the finances were separated from the other administrative functions and placed in control of a land fogetti who was to superintend the royal estates collect the taxes and audit the payment of public expenditures he was also to watch over the enforcement of the trade laws the first incumbent in this office christopher heidemann was an able administrator jovial and liberal with his friends but harsh to those whom he disliked a new office that of stip b falling mother for iceland was created in sixteen eighty four this official was to conduct the general administration and exercise judicial authority in cases pertaining to the church but as he did not reside in iceland a resident m mother was appointed to act as his deputy this arrangement continued till seventeen seventy when the country was divided into two amps each with its own amt mother and a new superior office that of stiptem mother was created in sixteen eighty eight this office was combined with that of amt mother for the southern and western districts the stiptem mother governor-general was to live in iceland the first amt mother in iceland was the dane christian muller a man hated by the people for his rashness and blunders in the performance of his official duties in seventeen eighty seven iceland was divided into three amps one for the southern one for the western and one for the northern and eastern districts the highest authority in icelandic affairs was vested in the renta kammer in copenhagen who which had the supervision of administrative and commercial affairs judicial matters were under the control of the canceli and above all stood the king who as absolute monarch was also lawgiver and source of justice he also assumed the right to appoint bishops lawmen and the more important parish priests who had hitherto as a rule been chosen by the people the all thing lost the last remnant of its legislative power and continued to exist only as a judicial tribunal in regard to trade the policy inaugurated by christian the fourth was continued by frederick the third and his successors danish merchants were permitted to send war vessels to iceland to drive away foreign ships carrying goods to the island in fifteen fifty eight a new effort was made by the merchants to increase the prices on their goods but in sixteen sixty two the company was dissolved because they had failed to supply the country with the necessary imports according to agreement the rule that the icelanders should trade with no one but danish merchants was nevertheless enforced as strictly as ever by the ordinance of july thirty one sixteen sixty two a new company was created which received a monopoly for the period of twenty years iceland was divided into four commercial districts and it was decreed that the people should not carry on trade with any one outside their own district throughout the seventeenth century english and dutch fishing smacks often traded secretly with the icelanders but the punishments inflicted on those who violated the trade regulations were finally made so severe that no one would attempt to trade with foreigners except in cases of extreme need in sixteen seventy eight paul torfesen sus lu mather in the isafjord district bought a couple of fishing lines from an english trawler in exchange for a few articles of knitted goods which the danish merchants had refused to buy for this offence he was brought to trial and although he showed that without the lines he could not continue his catch that his boats would have to lie idle the punishment of the loss of his household articles was inflicted 
jan Bigsfusson, sis lou mather in the borger fjord district was accused of trading with foreigners and was dismissed from his office trading outside of one's district was punished with equal severity in sixteen eighty four new price schedules were established increasing the prices on goods imported and lowering the prices on icelandic articles of export at the same time punishments for violating the rules of trade were made more severe traffic with foreigners or trading outside of one's district was henceforth to be punished by flogging loss of property or incarceration in the fortress of bremerholm in sixteen ninety nine a poor peasant by the name of holmfast gudmundsson was flogged in the presence of the Atemother christian muller because he had sold a few fish outside of his own district though the danish merchant admitted that they had refused to buy the fish thomas conradson was sentenced to the fortress of bremer home for a similar offence in seventeen hundred three men in the district of isafjord were sentenced to the loss of their household goods and incarceration in the fortress of bremen hole because they had bought two ells of kersey from an english fisherman the aunt mother was secretly in pact with the merchants and received his share of the profit for their trade by an ordinance of sixteen eighty nine the number of districts was increased so that commercially the people were shut up within still smaller areas it is true that the government seems to have intended to aid the people in this way by compelling the merchants to carry goods to all parts of iceland as a provision was added that if the merchants did not bring sufficient goods the people should be allowed to trade outside of their own districts but the further restriction on free intercourse could only tend to create new hardships among the disadvantages of the monopoly trade was not only a shortage of import of necessary commodities but the fact that no market was created where icelandic articles of export could be freely sold the transportation of goods to the designated harbors in the commercial districts was usually connected with great labor and difficulty when people from far away districts finally reached the seaport with their wares the merchants would usually by only a limited quantity they could select and reject according to their own notions goods of excellent quality were often rated as rejected articles and when the merchants had loaded their vessels nothing more could be sold to bring the goods back home was connected with so much labor and expense that they were rather abandoned hundreds of barrels of train oil large quantities of meat and fish hides and pelts had to be destroyed for want of buyers thousands of sheep brought to the seaports had to be driven home again even knitted wear would be abandoned as the transportation home was connected with more labor and difficulty than the goods were worth under such circumstances the prices which could be obtained for the goods were often very low and the futility of producing goods which could not be marketed tended to destroy all spirit of thrift and enterprise the absence of competition and open markets made the difference in price between icelandic staple commodities and the imported merchant goods constantly greater and more unfair a barrel of flour which in seventeen o two cost two rigs dollar rose to ten rigs dollar in eighteen hundred while the price schedules on icelandic goods remained practically unchanged a skip pund of fish one hundred and sixty kilograms which in other markets in seventeen eighty two was worth from thirty to forty dollars was sold in iceland to the danish merchants for seven dollars often the merchants purchased commodities in iceland with high-priced brandy which was in great demand but only harmed the people in seventeen eighty eight in a period of famine and general distress seven hundred and thirty barrels of brandy were imported to gulbringu sisla and sold for twenty one thousand nine hundred rigs dollar much harm was also done because ready-made articles were imported compelling people to pay for work which they themselves might have performed flour was imported but no grain muslin was imported bleached rope and articles of iron were imported even tubs and barrels but the icelanders could only export raw materials the merchants salted in meat fish and butter exported from iceland cleaned the eider down prepared the codfish and received hides and furs only in unprepared form in sixteen ninety nine king frederick the fourth ascended the throne conditions in iceland were then so deplorable that when the people assembled at the althing to take the oath of allegiance to the new sovereign the general distress of the country was the chief topic of conversation a memorial was drawn up 
setting forth their sufferings and asking for a redress of grievances loritz gotrop a dane by birth lawman in northern iceland who was sent to denmark to present the memorial to the king was well received and a new and more favourable price schedule was established in seventeen o two as a result of his mission the severe punishments for trafficking with foreign traders were also abolished a simple fine being substituted a commission consisting of arne magnusson and paul Vitalin was sent to iceland to examine conditions and to investigate how the laws governing commerce were observed by the merchants but trade conditions did not improve the merchants who had obtained the privilege to trade with iceland became more and more indebted to the government and were unable to supply the country with the needed articles of import the government had gradually increased the sums for which the trade privileges were granted and the merchants spared no efforts to reimburse themselves by preying upon the people who had become the helpless victims of their greed in sixteen o two king christian the fourth granted the first monopoly for the modest sum of sixteen rigs dollar a year to be paid by the merchants for every icelandic harbour in which they carried on trade in sixteen nineteen this was changed to twenty rigs dollar to be paid for every ship sailing to iceland the sums charged were constantly increased in sixteen ninety thirteen thousand six hundred and seventy rigs dollar had to be paid in seventeen o six the trade with iceland was granted to a company of merchant houses especially in copenhagen till seventeen thirty three for a yearly payment of twenty thousand one hundred and ninety rigs dollar in that year the same company was given control of icelandic trade for a period of ten years for the yearly sum of eight thousand rigs dollar when this company was dissolved in seventeen forty two the trade with iceland was granted to the herk Remmer company of copenhagen for sixteen thousand one hundred rigs dollar a year conditions in iceland now became worse than ever before as the managers of this company cared little for the welfare of the people they managed the trade in such a way that there was always a lack of necessary articles but a good supply of spirits tobacco and other articles of luxury complaints were constantly made that the goods imported were adulterated the timber rotten the flour spoiled the iron useless but no reduction was made in the prices of these inferior goods not even the rules for good behaviour in intercourse with the people were observed the poor were looked down upon and often ill-treated the custom of secret bargaining was also introduced by the merchants the people were called to private conferences behind closed doors where transactions were concluded to their greatest disadvantage neither weight nor measure was properly observed but among all grievances the chief source of complaint was the shortage of food due to negligence of the company in supplying the country with the necessary articles of import in payment of such goods as could be obtained the people had to give fish meat butter and other provisions which were exported even at times when people were dying of hunger the often repeated complaints of unbearable outrages went unheeded by the government the merchants asserted that the reports were exaggerated that the charges were not true that nothing had been proved that disgruntled persons were creating trouble and discontent when volcanic eruptions and other calamities finally reduced the country to such extremity that people died of famine and hunger epidemics in large numbers the merchants filled the measure of their iniquity by shipping putrid and wormy flour to iceland which the people were compelled to use because because of prevailing famine in those days of trouble the icelanders found an able leader in Skuli magnusson seventeen eleven to seventeen ninety four who was appointed landforgeti in iceland to succeed the notorious dresser Skuli was the first icelander appointed to this important office in his fight against the merchants he proved himself courageous energetic and persevering he towered high above all the people possessing a strength of personality which made him feared and respected though he was a haughty and somewhat intemperate man when he became acquainted with the general conditions in his country he saw the urgent need of reform he became convinced that the power of the herk remmer company had to be broken and that a new basis had to be laid for icelandic economic life in seventeen forty nine he first voiced these views claiming that it was necessary to improve farming and husbandry the fisheries were controlled by foreigners to such an extent that the native population could not profit properly by this important occupation as they had no sailboats and had to fish near shore in shallow water 
the merchants complained that the knitted ware which the people brought was poorly made and showed that they were deficient in knowledge of treatment of the wool this scully regarded as a most important matter as the greater part of the people made their living by home manufacture of woolen goods he felt that the only way to solve this problem was through cooperation of the leading men of the country he urged that a stock company should be formed for this purpose as he felt sure that the government would be willing to support the undertaking if they saw that the people were determined to do something he drew up plans and the company was organized a woolen mill was built at reykjavik and german weavers were brought to iceland in seventeen fifty one scully went to denmark to submit his plans to the government king frederick v who was well disposed to the icelanders granted him a money subsidy and several estates in iceland to further the enterprise in seventeen fifty two a royal rescript was issued in sanctioning the plan the work was now begun in earnest besides the woollen mill a fulling mill a ropery and a tannery were built at reykjavik farmers were sent from denmark and norway to teach the icelanders agriculture trees were imported and planted fishing smacks were purchased abroad the fishermen were to be aided in constructing larger boats so that they could fish in the open sea and the people were to learn the best methods of salting meat and fish things promised well for a time but many difficulties were encountered the chief one being the opposition of the herkremer company which did not which did everything in its power to hinder the new enterprises the merchants claimed that the law governing the trade with iceland would be violated if the king supported this new plan they refused to handle the products of the new industrial establishments and no agreements could be reached between them and the promoters of the enterprise scully then turned to the government for aid this was promised and the important regulation was made that if the merchants would not handle the products of the new icelandic industries at prices fixed by the land forgetty those who were interested as the shareholders in the industries might export their goods directly from iceland they might also import in their own ships materials necessary in their establishments and might buy wool and hides anywhere in the country the merchants persisted in their opposition and scully finally brought suit against the company for wrongs which they had committed in iceland the legal battle became long and involved in seventeen fifty seven the company was dissolved and the trade with iceland was carried on by the government for the benefit of the royal treasury till seventeen sixty three in that year it was granted to a new company the general commercial company which also received control of the new industrial enterprises in spite of scully's protest this company pursued the same policy as its predecessor and scully continued his legal fight against it in order to rid itself of all competition it suffered the icelandic industrial establishments to fall into complete neglect in its trade with iceland the old corrupt practices of the hork remmer company were continued in 1768 it was made clear through inspection in copenhagen that the flour billed for iceland was so unfit for use that the government was obliged to forbid its shipment but the company disregarded the government order and shipped the flour when it arrived there the assist new method inspected it and found it to be unfit for human food it was so mildewed putrid and wormy that it could not even be used for feed for cattle but the merchants had tried to sell it to the people at full price and many who were poor and starving had no alternative but to buy it scully magnuson the land forgetty encouraged the people to seize and destroy the flour and a thousand barrels were dumped into the sea he then brought complaint against the company and forced it to pay a fine of four thousand four hundred rigs dollar king frederick v died in seventeen sixty six and was succeeded by christian the seventh who ruled till eighteen o eight in seventeen fifty two egert olafsson and bjarni Pullison had been sent to iceland to examine conditions in seventeen seventy a new commission consisting of two danes and the icelander thorkel jansen fjeldstedt was sent on a like mission they travelled through all parts of the country many new offices were later created as a result of their recommendations mills were built so that the people could grind their own flour the raising of cabbage and potatoes was encouraged and prizes were offered those who succeeded best in this enterprise in seventeen seventy six a law was passed providing for the improvement of roads for the carrying of mails and for granting awards to those who would build homes on devastated farmsteads of which there were many salt works were also erected these undertakings show at least an earnest desire on the part of the government to improve conditions but the trade monopoly famine and epidemics had reduced the people to such a state of misery that no real change could be brought about by belated efforts of this kind 
in seventeen seventy four the merchant company had to surrender its charter and the trade was conducted by the government till seventeen eighty six when commerce with iceland was made free to all danish norwegian citizens but even this step brought no relief after the outbreak of the volcano scapped our yokel only forty thousand remained of the whole population which now seemed to face complete extinction a committee was appointed by the government to devise means of for relief large sums of money were collected throughout the realm many cargoes of provisions and building material were sent to iceland two ships were set aside to transport necessary articles for the sufferers the government also provided credit for the people with the merchants in the icelandic towns in seventeen eighty eight the government paid the merchants fifty seven thousand four hundred and sixty two rigs dollar for supplies furnished during the same year twenty eight thousand barrels of grain were shipped to which three thousand four hundred and ninety nine barrels were added by royal orders the plan was even considered of removing the entire population from iceland and colonizing them on the heaths of jutland in this crisis the weakness and inefficiency of the government administration became painfully evident of the forty thousand rigs dollar collected throughout the realm as a relief fund not over one-fourth was ever used for the purpose for which it had been contributed the remainder was diverted to various uses such as defraying of the expenses of the coast survey etc it was quite evident that little of real importance could be done to improve conditions until a wiser policy of government should enable the icelanders to solve their own economic problems since the earthquake accompanying the volcanic eruption in seventeen eighty three wrecked the buildings at skalholt the commission investigating affairs in iceland took steps to remove the bishop's seat and latin school to reykjavik a measure which was carried into effect in seventeen eighty five in eighteen o one the holer bishopric was discontinued and one bishopric for all iceland was created with reykjavik as the bishop's seat the schools at skalholt and holar were also united into one latin school located at reykjavik when trade with iceland was finally made free to all citizens of the realm by ordinances of seventeen eighty six and seventeen eighty seven the harbour towns of reykjavik isafjord ayafjord and radarfjord grundafjord and vestmanyar received rank and privileges as commercial cities most of these places had no prospects of ever becoming commercial centers in eighteen o seven the two last named were dropped the others one in each quarter retained in name their classification as commercial towns but even reykjavik had only three hundred inhabitants at this time though the cathedral church the latin school and some commercial and industrial establishments were located there in Eyja fjord and likewise in isa fjord only two danish merchants were found in reda fjord only one and the prospect of growth of these towns was very small the icelanders had hoped that when the trade was made free for all citizens of the realm conditions would rapidly improve but in this expectation they were disappointed as no foreign merchants could trade with iceland there was no competition the people themselves were too poor to engage in trade and conditions remained about as before the merchants entered into an agreement to maintain the old prices and little improvement could be hoped for the lawman magnus stevenson undertook to present to the king a petition signed at the althing asking that foreign merchants should be allowed to trade in iceland the petition was signed by all leading officials except the stiptem mithar olaf stevenson but such a demand for freedom was viewed with suspicion by the government and the request was denied the king expressed his displeasure with the officials who had signed the petition and reprimanded them but the stiptem mather who had opposed it received the thanks of his sovereign the time for any real change of policy had not yet come not till in the nineteenth century when all restrictions on trade were removed and a more liberal form of government was established did a new era of development and general prosperity dawn for iceland after the introduction of absolutism the royal officials became more arrogant and arbitrary than before and aided the merchants in their unjust and selfish operations many acted like despots without regard even for the provisions of the law the aunt mother christian muller caused thord thorsteinson to be executed for theft after the lawman had granted the man an appeal to the supreme court a farmer albert arnfinson was flogged in the presence of the aunt mother and the landfogetti heidemann because he refused to serve as oarsman 
on a boat belonging to the merchants instances of oppressive tyranny of this sort were many arne magnuson one of the royal commissioners offered to prove to the king that muller was in league with the merchants and aided them in oppressing the people the lawman and sysluman would decide cases not in agreement with the law but according to their own opinion while higher officials would sell offices to the highest bidder to increase their income an office bought one day might be sold the next for a still higher price whatever the intention and disposition of the rulers the people became the victims of a lawless and corrupt bureaucracy always fostered by despotism how these arrogant minions of arbitrary rule flouted all human rights even the most fundamental is sufficiently illustrated by the following incident a deputy sent word to the farmer osbjorn ordering that he should row him across the fjord osbjorn replied that he did not consider it his duty to do this for nothing whereupon he was brought to trial before the lawman sigurd bjornsson who sentenced him to be flogged twice this was carried out so effectively that the man fainted each time quarrels and cabals between the officials themselves were numerous one usually trying to ruin the other especially bitter was the struggle between the clergy and the officials in which the latter had the advantage of more direct support of the government the importance of the all thing dwindled when its legislative power was lost and the number of its members was reduced the logretumen now numbered only twenty of whom ten should meet yearly at the all thing but only eight should sit in the logretta in seventeen seventy seven this number was further reduced to five from that time forth people paid but little attention to the all thing if they had cases of any importance they preferred to bring them directly to the king the men of northern iceland finally asked to be exempted from the duty of meeting at the all thing in seventeen eighty five the m mother stephan thorarinson petitioned the government to grant the people of the northern districts a thing of their own the stip dem mother Levitzow proposed that the all things should meet at Reykjavik, but at this time neither plan was carried out. In 1798, the all thing assembled for the last time at Thingveller, where it had met for 868 years. Only twelve representatives, eight officials, and four Lorgretu men came, and all returned home after a short meeting. The next session was held at Reykjavik, which henceforth became the capital of Iceland on july eleventh eighteen hundred the all thing was permanently dissolved by royal orders and in its place was created a new court the landsif retter consisting of a chief justice and two associate justices which should exercise the judicial powers hitherto vested in the all thing the eclipse of the old icelandic institution was thus made complete a true index to the loss of national autonomy of personal liberty and economic well-being of the spirit of daring and prowess which had been the icelanders proud heritage in days of old under foreign dominion they had experienced great misfortunes but none so bitter as the loss of their ancient freedom but even in these years of adversity their spirit was chastened and made strong for a new era of progress even during the time of greatest social depression and economic distress in the period of absolutism and trade monopoly the icelanders were able to maintain an active literary life in the latter part of the eighteenth century rationalism and the cosmopolitan intellectual culture of the were transplanted to iceland through the influence of the university of copenhagen and the general spirit of the age the reaction against the superstition and witchcraft delusion which had darkened the post-reformation period made itself strongly felt the new movement discarded all belief in the supernatural maintained that enlightened reason is the only guide for human life and conduct looked with contempt on national peculiarities as remnants of old plebeian habits and emphasized the universality of intellectual culture the chief representative of this movement in iceland was magnus stevenson who labored with untiring zeal to promote the new enlightenment much of value was accomplished old superstitions were eradicated and foreign cultural influence now freely introduced helped to refine the taste and enlarge the outlook of the people 
ancient customs were changing to modern ways up till eighteen hundred the icelanders both men and women dressed according to their native style says the analyst but after that time they gradually adopted danish styles the increasing use of imported articles of luxury in spite of prevailing poverty also reveals a growing foreign influence the value of new cultural stimulus to an isolated and conservative people cannot easily be overrated but much of magnus stevenson's work for the promotion of culture was characterized by an uncritical adherence to european ideas and a disregard for the value of the traditions and institutions of his own country in his admiration for foreign ways he was ready to give everything a touch of the new cosmopolitan spirit even when this would lower the intrinsic value of the culture which he sought to promote he was born in seventeen sixty two and belonged to one of the most distinguished families of iceland after entering upon his studies in the department of law at the university of copenhagen in seventeen eighty one he received an appointment to the renta commer an important government department when the volcanic eruption caused widespread devastation in iceland in seventeen eighty three he was appointed royal commissioner together with another official levitau Zau, to investigate conditions in the stricken region but the ship on which they took passage was driven by storms to the coast of norway stevenson spent the winter very pleasantly as the guest of his countryman thorkel fjellstead at the estate home guard in southern norway where he took a leading part in the gay social festivities and won the admiration of fjellstead's charming wife by his social accomplishments and skill as a dancer the following year he reached iceland and travelled through the devastated districts about which he wrote a book beskerivels over den nye vulcans its brudening seventeen eighty three after his return to denmark he was again sent to iceland to supervise the sale of the lands belonging to the skalholt bishopric finally he found time to complete his university studies in seventeen eighty eight and was appointed vice lawman and in seventeen eighty nine lawman for the northern and western districts of iceland when the althing was abolished in eighteen hundred he became the chief justice of the new court the lands Ferretta, which was created in its place a position which he occupied till his death march seventeen eighteen thirty three he married his cousin gudrun sheving and resided after eighteen thirteen on the island of vidi near reykjavik which he had purchased his intellectual interests were many besides his profession as jurist he cultivated theology singing dancing and modern languages by his countrymen he was regarded as a vain and ambitious official arrogant and intolerant of all opposition ready to stoop to intrigues in his dealings with the government he was even accused of playing into the hands of the adventurer jorgen jorgensen who attempted to foment a revolt against denmark but he was withal a very diligent man who loved his people and spent his life in devoted service to his countrymen as he understood it the discontinuance of the holar diocese and the creation of one bishopric for all iceland was largely due to his influence so also the removal of the latin schools to reykjavik where they were combined in one institution this arrangement proved to be practical and advantageous but he was justly criticized for the complete blotting out of skelholt and holar the two oldest cultural centres in iceland the permanent dissolution of the all thing was also done at his suggestion as he regarded this oldest assembly as unpractical and out of date the value of the traditions connected with these institutions dating from the people's earliest history he failed to understand as it was his aim not only to create a new intellectual life but also a new literature in his native land he was an active member of danish literary societies founded by the friends of the Alfka la rung for the promotion of culture in seventeen ninety four he founded a new society the land sup freythingar felig or a society for general enlightenment of which he himself was the head he also began the publication of the first icelandic monthly the Kloster posturin and other periodicals devoted to the cause of enlightenment assisted by geir Bidlin, later bishop of iceland he also undertook to publish a new hymn-book a work for which he possessed no qualification in order to bring the hymns into harmony with his own superficial rationalism and conception of poetic art he often destroyed their deeper spiritual meaning substituting an artificial jingle of rhymes which could not satisfy the demand of devoted christians the work 
appeared in eighteen o one but met with strong opposition in order to control the literary production he got possession of the two printing presses in iceland and combined them into one printing establishment under his management the land thing garfilug published many valuable books both icelandic works and translations from foreign literatures for the enlightenment of the people of other men of learning and influence at this time may be mentioned hans finsen who succeeded his father finner jansen as bishop of skalholt in seventeen eighty nine jan jansen espelin born seventeen sixty nine was a noted analyst known especially for his great work islands r becker e sugu for me which covers the periods twelve sixty two to eighteen thirty two and narrates much of the history of iceland during this period grim jansen thorkelin became noted as a student of northern antiquities magnus kettleson seventeen thirty one to eighteen o three sis lu mather in dalasla and an active disciple of the Alf Larung became manager of the printing press at Harapsi and published many books. Especially noteworthy is his work for Rordeninger, Ag Abne, Breva, Till Island, under den Oldenborgske Stamma, in three volumes, an important source for the study of Icelandic history. Skuli Thordarsson, Thorleiksius, and his son Bjorg R. Thorleiksius distinguished themselves as scholars the latter becoming rector of the university of copenhagen eighteen thirteen to eighteen fourteen the most noted icelandic scholar in this period was probably finner magnusson finn magnusson eight not seventeen eighty one to eighteen forty seven who won general renown especially through his research in the fields of old norse icelandic literature and northern antiquities he became president of the royal northern text society and became associated with the great danish scholar rasmus k rask in the publication of many important works but as he possessed a strange love for fantastic combinations and analogies coupled with strong imagination rather than sound scholarly judgment his voluminous production does not rank very high End of chapter fourteen chapter Fifteen of History of Iceland by Canute Gyurset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Commerce with Iceland during the Napoleonic Wars. The adventurer Jorgens, Jorgensen. Improvement of economic conditions after eighteen fourteen. The unfortunate economic conditions in Iceland, which had prevailed throughout the greater part of the period of trade, monopoly did not improve much during the first decades of the 19th century. The Napoleonic Wars, which gradually paralyzed commerce and all peaceful pursuits, brought distress and ruin also upon the maritime neutral nations. One by one, the continental powers had been defeated. Finally, England alone stood at bay in a determined struggle against the victorious emperor to crush this implacable enemy by an attack on her commerce now became his aim in eighteen o six he issued his noted berlin decree declaring the british isles in a state of blockade forbidding all trade with england not only in france but in all parts of europe over which he exercised authority including the netherlands western germany prussia and italy after the treaty of till sit in eighteen o seven he also subjected russia to this continental system in that year he issued a new decree from milan threatening to seize all ships which touched a british port the english retaliated by orders in council declaring the ports of france and her allies to be in a state of blockade but allowing neutral vessels to carry on trade between these ports and great britain for the kingdom of denmark norway the situation became more critical as the billows of war rolled ever closer to the danish border it seems to have been the purpose of the danish king to preserve neutrality as long as possible but to cast his lot with the english if finally forced into the struggle for it became evident that a rupture with one or the other of the belligerents could not long be averted even by the most watchful prudence 
after the peace of tilsit napoleon succeeded in winning to his side emperor alexander i of russia alexander promised to attempt to negotiate a peace between france and england but if the english government should refuse the terms offered by the two emperors he agreed that russia should join france denmark norway sweden and portugal would be requested to close their ports to british commerce and if they refused they were to be treated as enemies by this stroke napoleon shattered the policy of neutrality forcing the smaller nations to choose sides in the conflict the news of the alliance between france and russia caused the greatest alarm everywhere not least in england the english government imagined that denmark norway was a secret partner to the compact and without even taking the time to investigate the real state of affairs dispatched a large fleet to copenhagen an english ambassador submitted to the danish government an ultimatum that as a guarantee that denmark would be the ally of england the danish fleet should be handed over to the british for the period of the war when this was refused a battle ensued copenhagen was bombarded and after a severe engagement the danish fleet had to surrender to the english this unexpected turn of events forced denmark norway to join france the blockade of the danish norwegian coasts resulting from the war with england brought upon the whole north a period of intense suffering danish trade with iceland was wholly interrupted and as a failure of crops further increased the economic difficulties of the icelanders a shortage of the necessaries of life was soon very keenly felt often the most important commodities like salt iron tar lumber and staple articles of food could not be obtained people tried to use sea-water instead of salt they made stirrups and horseshoes of horn fish lines from rope and buried their dead without coffins danish and norwegian vessels were seized by the english a ship sailing from iceland with many passengers among whom was the chief justice magnus stephenson not knowing that war existed between england and denmark norway was captured by the british and the passengers were brought to scotland another vessel carrying the icelandic stip tam te mather count tramp was seized near the coast of sealand but the stip dem mather was allowed to proceed to copenhagen magnus stephenson was also allowed to go to denmark in the fall in scotland he had become acquainted with the english privy councillor sir joseph banks with whose assistance he was able to secure the liberation of the other icelandic captives in england and also to prevail on the english government to allow free intercourse with iceland during the war the british privateers which swarmed everywhere upon the seas also visited the coast of iceland in eighteen o eight the vessel salamine commanded by thomas gilpin came to iceland to seize the royal treasury in keeping of the acting stip tem tamather isleif einarsson the money amounting to thirty five thousand one hundred and fifty eight rigs bank dollar was taken by gilpin and his band the paper money which they considered of little value they compelled the merchants to take in exchange for coin the house of the former stip tem mather olaf stephenson was plundered likewise also the shop of the goldsmith thorgrim thomason and other acts of depredation were committed gilpin sailed to england with his booty but the english authorities did not consider his conduct against an unprotected and defenceless people justified by the existing state of war and most of the treasures were returned in the winter eighteen o eight to nine magnus stephenson went to bergen norway where he prevailed on some private citizens to send the ship providentia to iceland with supplies on february three eighteen o nine royal orders were issued that four cargoes of provisions should be sent to iceland but it appears that no ship was sent stephenson returned to iceland in the spring of that year count tramp the stip tem mather had bought the ship orion and dispatched it to iceland with the cargo but it was damaged on the coast of norway and the cargo was sold finally in the spring of eighteen o nine the ship reached iceland with tramp on board under these circumstances the english merchants found an opportunity to gain control of the icelandic trade according to the danish laws the icelanders were still forbidden to trade with foreigners but as the danish merchants could no longer supply them with the necessaries they had no alternative but to buy from the english if they were to escape starvation 
when english merchantmen attempted to trade with the people the stip them mather forbade all intercourse with the king's enemies but when english armed vessels arrived he was soon forced to desist from his opposition it seems to have been the plan of the english merchants to establish complete control over the icelandic trade an effort in which they resorted to arbitrary and even violent methods in eighteen o nine an english armed vessel the clarence owned by samuel phelps of london and commanded by captain george jackson entered the harbour of half narfjord to trade with the people on board was also the danish adventurer jurgen jorgensen who acted as interpreter when the government officials refused to grant them permission to trade the captain threatened to bombard the town of reykjavik if they persisted in their opposition as the authorities lacked all means of resisting such an attack they finally entered into an agreement with the british traders granting them permission to trade if they abstained from all violent acts the merchants then sailed to reykjavik unloaded their cargo rented buildings and began trade on march twenty two eighteen o nine the clarence returned to england but james sevignac remained in iceland to manage the new commercial enterprise there in june the stip tem mather tramp returned to iceland with unrestricted power as the governor of the island he had also bought the houses which the english merchants had rented in reykjavik the violent clash between tramp and the merchants shortly after his return can be explained only by assuming that as representative of the danish government with plenary power he undertook to drive the english from iceland not long after his arrival an english man-of-war the rover commanded by captain knott came to reykjavik negotiations were entered into with the count and an agreement was made to establish freedom of trade for all english merchants in iceland after the departure of the man-of-war and armed english merchantmen the marguerite and anne commanded by captain john liston arrived bringing samuel phelps himself the chief promoter of the icelandic trading enterprise phelps was accompanied by jorgen jorgensen who was again serving as interpreter after a short stay in the harbour captain liston and samuel phelps accompanied by james savignac jorgen jorgensen and a band of armed men marched to the residence of the stiptem mather tramp took him prisoner and brought him on board the ship they also seized his ship orion and hoisted the english flag on it on june twenty sixth a proclamation posted in reykjavik bearing the signature of jorgen jorgensen stated that all danish authority in iceland had ceased all business men and officials should remain quietly in their homes and not show themselves on the streets all powder and firearms were to be surrendered likewise the keys to all storehouses together with books and accounts all native-born people would have nothing to fear if they remained quiet but any one who failed to obey these instructions would be tried by a court-martial and if guilty would be shot within two hours a second proclamation bearing the same date and signature declared that iceland was now free from danish rule icelandic officials who would behave properly and perform their official duties well would be held in the highest esteem pensions would be paid to the widows and orphans of officials a national icelandic government was to be established as well as icelandic laws such as they had been at the time when iceland was united with norway trial by jury should also be established iceland should have its own flag and should be at peace with the whole world under the protection of great britain the schools and hospitals would be improved all debts to denmark or the danish merchant should be cancelled prices on grain lowered taxes reduced to one-half and all intercourse with denmark was to be prohibited there can be no doubt that in these affairs jorgensen acted as the tool and agent of the english merchants the leading men regarded it as treason to support him but the people were unarmed and defenceless and since a state of war existed and no aid could be expected from denmark it was considered prudent to act cautiously and await developments especially since it was thought that the king of england had sent the usurpers to seize iceland jorgensen surrounded himself with a body of vagrants whom he called guards and imprisoned several leading officials some resolute men would not watch quietly the treasonable farce enacted by jorgensen and his followers among these are judge isleaf 
einerson he made preparations to resist the usurper but his plan was divulged and he was thrown into prison on july twelfth jorgensen posted a new proclamation in reykjavik announcing that he had assumed the management of public affairs as the country's protector and that the military forces had appointed him commander both on land and sea the country's flag should be three white codfish on a blue field and he would defend it with his life and blood his own seal should be used until the people's representatives could decide regarding a permanent seal for the country all officials should pledge their obedience to the new government before july twenty those who would not submit would be treated as traitors a system of defence for the country was also to be created englishmen should have the right to trade and to establish residence in iceland as the country's protector on land and sea he assumed the title of excellency but promised to surrender his office july one the following year after a constituent assembly had established a new government the same day that this proclamation was posted the icelandic flag was hoisted over the building occupied by the english traders and was saluted by the margaret and Anne from the harbour judge isleaf einerson was released from prison and was soon installed in his former office a new stiptem mather benedict grendall was appointed and work was also begun to construct fortifications at arna hall where guns were to be mounted after making these arrangements jorgensen marched to northern iceland with a few armed followers to seize the property of the danish merchants he met with no serious opposition but the ill-will of the people was everywhere apparent on his return to reykjavik he received a letter from jan gudmundsen sislu mather in skaltafell nisla declaring that he and his followers would be treated as outlaws if they appeared east of the yokusa the redoubts at arnaho were completed and a few rusty guns were mounted on the works a few officials had been forced to yield obedience to the usurper but it was clear that the people as a whole regarded his operations only as the deeds of a hostile adventurer when the english man-of-war talbot commanded by alexander jones arrived in the harbour of reykjavik august fourteen events took a new turn the sailors of the warship began to destroy the redoubts which had been erected and threw the cannons into the sea negotiations were begun between magnus stevenson and his brother the amt mather stephen stevenson on the one side and captain alexander jones and samuel phelps on the other on august twenty two eighteen o nine an agreement was made according to which all the doings of jorgensen should be considered null and void the regular government authority should be re-established and the former officials reinstated in their offices the english should have right to trade and to reside in iceland according to the agreement already entered into with captain knott of the rover all danish property and all valuables which had been seized should be returned to their owners magnus stevenson and his brother stephen stevenson should have temporary charge of all public affairs magnus was to supervise secular matters and stephen of pertaining to the church the constructed redoubts were raised and jorgensen was retained on board the marguerite and anne count tramp was not released but was to be carried to england as prisoner the following day magnus stevenson and the land fogetti friedensburg entertained captain jones and his men at a public dinner in reykjavik the same evening the two vessels marguerite and anne and the captured orion set sail for england with jorgensen count tramp and a number of imprisoned danish sailors on board phelps also sailed for england on the voyage the marguerite and anne loaded with train oil and tallow was set on fire by some of the imprisoned sailors and burned the people on board were rescued by the orion which brought them back to reykjavik in this calamity jorgensen rendered the most valuable service and won the admiration of all for his courage count tramp was now released and was told that he could resume his former office but as he preferred to go to england where he hoped to get an indemnity from the english government he was allowed to take passage on the talbot on september four both the talbot and the orion set sail for england with jorgensen count tramp and samuel phelps on board jorgen jorgensen the son of highly respected parents was born in copenhagen in seventeen eighty at the university he was a classmate of the danish poet o lenz schlager 
and was known as a gifted but restless and adventurous character because of his reckless conduct he had to leave the university he became a sailor spending several years partly as whaler and partly as explorer in the pacific ocean in eighteen o six he returned home and became captain of a danish privateer in the war with england in eighteen o seven his vessel was captured by an english warship and he was brought to england as prisoner but he was given his freedom on the condition that he should not leave the country he then entered into the service of the english merchants as interpreter and accompanied them to iceland when he was brought back to england by captain jones he was thrown into prison because he had broken his word not to leave the country in prison he became acquainted with criminals and became a confirmed gambler after many adventures he was finally deported to tasmania where he spent the rest of his life as a member of various exploring expeditions and as policeman he died at hobartstown in eighteen forty four magnus stevenson attempted to arrange matters in the best way possible after the departure of jorgensen he sought to secure an indemnity for the money and valuables taken by the usurper and his assistants but did not succeed as jorgensen had no property and samuel phelps went bankrupt after his return to london count tramp was no more successful in obtaining an indemnity from the english government he soon returned to denmark and was made stiff semtmond of trondhjem's stift in norway between him and magnus stevenson a bitter personal controversy arose that stevenson and his negotiations with captain jones had not acted in a wholly unselfish way seems apparent it would have probably have been in his power to secure the release of tramp and to have him reinstated in his office if he had not himself coveted the highest position in iceland in eighteen ten both magnus stevenson and his brother stephan were removed from the temporary management of affairs and new officials were appointed in their place among others judge isliff einarsson who continued to serve till eighteen fourteen when a new stip tem mother kessen skilled was sent to iceland in these years of wars embargoes blockades and commercial difficulties american merchants also began to trade with iceland in the fall of eighteen o nine an american ship the neptune and providence commanded by captain samuel staples came to reykjavik with a cargo of rye oatmeal barley indigo coffee sugar rum brandy tobacco etc in eighteen ten another american vessel came to reykjavik bringing a cargo of wheat rice iron rum and many other kinds of goods except timber says the analyst s bolin on a visit to copenhagen the danish consul-general peterson reported that in eighteen ten he had persuaded an american merchant mr edward cruft of boston to send a cargo of wheat flour rice tobacco sugar hemp and other goods to iceland and that mr cruft had sold these goods at prices so low that he lost money on the venture for a return cargo he had bought at two or three places on the coast such goods as the people had to sell the following year he sent another ship to iceland with a cargo still better suited to the wants of the people but on the return voyage the ship was seized by the english in eighteen twelve he would have sent still another ship but was prevented by the american embargo and the war between england and america in eighteen fifteen he wished to resume the traffic and petitioned the danish government to grant him a concession to trade with iceland two or three years with two ships on the condition that such a concession should not be granted to any other american merchant in case such a privilege were granted he promised to bring the country only goods produced in america as the stip tem mather governor-general for iceland casten skilled testified that the cargoes shipped to iceland by mr cruft were the most valuable ever received there and that he had sold the goods very cheap the concession was granted throughout the napoleonic wars and even later american merchants seem to have made frequent voyages to iceland the analyst s bolin records for the year eighteen seventeen that in the fall a ship came drifting to skafta fell sisla there were no people on it one mast was broken and the other standing it was laden with american timber and was much damaged the same analyst records that in eighteen twenty one a scotch ship from america came drifting to ija the men came ashore and returned home with a mail ship 
commercial peace and freedom of trade with iceland was established by england in eighteen o nine but while the war lasted little was imported and the people suffered severely in eighteen o nine fourteen ships came to iceland of these three were owned by the english merchants who had established themselves in reykjavik and one was an american vessel the neptune and providence many of the ships were small and the cargoes were not always well selected as rum and brandy were often brought instead of necessaries the prices were exceedingly high and as the financial collapse of denmark made the danish paper money so nearly valueless that it became almost impossible for the icelanders to use it as a medium of exchange they could obtain the foreign goods only through exchange of home products on most disadvantageous terms the freedom of trade was but imperfectly observed as the english merchants sought to discourage all competitors on july tenth eighteen o nine the danish ship trick weber came to iceland sailing under english passport bringing ten thousand vigs dollar of government funds the english merchants entered it seized the money and then let it proceed to the harbour of dry fjord other ships were detained for longer or shorter periods before they were allowed to enter the harbours but such as it was the free intercourse established by the english was of considerable advantage as without it iceland would have been completely isolated regarding the trade with iceland and the cargo brought by the clarence in the winter of eighteen o nine magnus stevenson says though the cargo was ill-selected for trade with iceland it cannot be denied that the english trade at that time and throughout the summer with their spending of money and all sorts of plans even the most foolish gave many people especially in the winter and spring great opportunity for labor without this the general distress would have been much more keenly felt before the fisheries began in eighteen fifteen stevenson made an attempt to improve trade conditions by bringing before the danish government a proposal to establish free intercourse with iceland a commission was appointed to consider the matter but nothing was farther from the mind of the government than to remove all restrictions on trade during the long war danish commerce had been almost destroyed and now that peace had returned the government would not willingly surrender the still existing remnant the trade with iceland sweden had joined the coalition against napoleon and denmark which had been forced into an alliance with france through the aggression of england had been defeated a treaty of peace was signed at kiel january fourteen eighteen fourteen by which norway was ceded to sweden but iceland which had been united with norway since twelve sixty two was not included in the session but remained connected with denmark after the war the danish government sought to mend its broken fortunes and also to improve the conditions of icelandic trade in eighteen sixteen a so-called agreement was published providing for increased freedom of commerce danish ships sailing to iceland were allowed to carry icelandic export articles directly to foreign harbors by paying an export duty but foreign commerce with the island remained under such restrictions that it could not be carried on even the few englishmen who had established themselves in reykjavik were ordered to sell what they had and depart but in spite of the still unchanged government policy some in improvement in economic conditions manifested itself after the return of peace this is evident from the steady growth of the population of the island after eighteen fourteen the increase of herds the development of gardening fisheries and Im of import and export trade during the eighteenth century the population of iceland had been reduced six point four per cent according to some authorities and no improvement of conditions is noticeable till the return of peace and the gradual revival of commerce after eighteen fourteen from that time the steady growth of population became very marked amounting to forty one point eight per cent in the period eighteen o one to eighteen sixty in eighteen twenty three iceland again had fifty thousand inhabitants the census returns after that time show the following figure eighteen thirty five fifty six thousand thirty five eighteen forty fifty seven thousand ninety four eighteen forty five fifty eight thousand five hundred and fifty eight eighteen fifty fifty nine thousand one hundred and fifty seven eighteen fifty five sixty four thousand six hundred and three eighteen sixty sixty six thousand nine hundred and eighty seven during the same period similar progress can be observed also in the various productive occupations prior to the beginning of the nineteenth century vegetable gardening remained in a purely experimental stage in eighteen hundred there were only two hundred and eighty three gardens in iceland in eighteen ten the number had risen to one thousand one hundred and ninety four after that time the census returns 
give the following numbers eighteen twenty one two thousand seven hundred and sixty eight eighteen thirty one two thousand nine hundred and seventy seven eighteen forty one three thousand six hundred and fifty seven eighteen fifty one five thousand four hundred eighteen sixty one six thousand seven hundred and forty nine progress was also made in the production of hay through construction of drainage ditches building of fences and the levelling and fertilizing of meadows since the people of iceland derived so great a part of their income from their herds an increased yield of this important agricultural product means a general improvement of economic life statistics show a steady increase in the numbers of domestic animals after eighteen hundred according to figures already given iceland had at that time three hundred and seven thousand sheep in eighteen fifty three the number had increased to five hundred and sixteen thousand eight hundred and fifty but the destructive sheep disease of eighteen fifty six to eighteen sixty caused a sudden decline by eighteen sixty the number had been reduced to three hundred and twenty six thousand six hundred and sixty four in northern iceland the resolute m mather j p hofstein caused the infected animals to be killed in the southern district the slower and as it proved more expensive method of cure was employed after eighteen sixty one conditions improved and new progress was made in this industry during the same period the cattle herds showed little or no increase from eighteen fifty three till eighteen sixty five the number of cattle fell from twenty three thousand six hundred and sixty three to twenty thousand three hundred but horses which became of increasing importance as an article of export especially after eighteen fifty grew in number even in excess of the increase of in population in eighteen o one there were about twenty six thousand horses in iceland or about fifty five head to each hundred persons in eighteen sixty one there were forty thousand eight hundred and twenty three or about sixty one head to each hundred people the fisheries of iceland at this time second in importance only to animal husbandry also showed considerable development especially during the later decades of the period eighteen hundred to eighteen sixty the number of fishing boats had increased from two thousand in eighteen o one to three thousand one hundred and eighty six in eighteen sixty six and while the population was growing and ever larger quantities of fish products were needed for home consumption the fish export grew from seven hundred and fifty eight tons in eighteen o one to four thousand two hundred and fifty tons in eighteen fifty five after the all thing had been re-established in eighteen forty three the icelanders under the guidance of the great political leader jan sigurdsson began a new agitation for the abolition of all restrictions on trade a petition for free commerce was sent to denmark the merchants sought to obstruct the movement but in eighteen fifty three a bill was brought before the danish rigs dug and although no icelander had a seat in that assembly many supported it and argued that the time had long since come when the fetters on trade which had oppressed iceland for two hundred and fifty years ought to be removed the bill became law april fifteenth eighteen fifty four all nations could now trade with iceland without hindrance and foreign commerce especially with england soon became very profitable to the icelanders the year following the passage of the bill one hundred and twenty five ships came to iceland of which thirteen came from foreign lands icelandic products could now be shipped to ports where open markets and a ready demand could be found while free competition would lower the prices on imports and give new stimulus to commercial activity the rapid increase in the volume of icelandic trade soon proved the wisdom of the new policy in eighteen o six the grain import amounted to only about fifty thousand bushels in eighteen forty it was over one hundred and forty five thousand four hundred bushels more than twice the amount per capita even allowing for the increase in population in eighteen o six about eight thousand six hundred pounds of coffee were imported in eighteen fifty five the import of this commodity reached eighty eight thousand eight hundred pounds in eighteen fifty five four hundred and twenty six thousand nine hundred and eighty pounds the importation of sugar and syrup rose from twenty three thousand five hundred pounds to four hundred and seventy eight thousand pounds during the same period and other important commodities show a similar increase iron and steel sixty five thousand to one hundred fifty two thousand coal two thousand to twenty two thousand salt one thousand to seventy three thousand hemp fourteen thousand to thirty seven thousand a less commendable feature of the growing trade was the importation of distilled liquors which increased about two hundred per cent during this period owing chiefly to a premium offered by the government for the export of danish liquor the cost of this worse than useless article of import was greater than that of all other imported commodities combined 
of icelandic exports the products of husbandry represented in eighteen fifty five about one half of the total amount especially noteworthy is the growth of the export of wool from two hundred and sixty thousand to one million this phenomenal increase is explained by the fact that icelandic knitted wear could no longer be sold to advantage since the household industries could not compete with the much cheaper machine manufacture of foreign lands icelandic knitted articles such as socks mittens jackets etc once in great demand were disappearing from the market and the icelandic wool was sold to foreign manufacturers other articles of export also show a relatively large percentage of increase Tallow, one hundred and ninety one thousand to nine hundred and thirty thousand meat two thousand to three thousand codfish six hundred to four thousand train oil two thousand to six thousand eider down two thousand to four thousand feathers eight thousand to twenty five thousand the rapid increase of icelandic commerce during this period is shown also by the growing number of ships sailing to icelandic ports in the period eighteen hundred to eighteen o nine the average yearly number was forty eight in eighteen fifty to eighteen fifty four the number had increased to one hundred and twenty eight so notable a progress in all branches of economic life the increase of production the development of trade and the resulting growth of population show that iceland was entering upon a new era of social and economic development at this time new interest was also awakened for education the latin school which according to provision of eighteen o one was to be established at reykjavik had so little success that it was moved to bessa tadir in eighteen o five chiefly because no suitable buildings had been provided in this not very convenient place it had since remained until it had become a difficult problem to solve whether it should again be moved to reykjavik in eighteen thirty two appeared thomas siemensen's work about the schools of iceland iceland's fra den intellectuel and young sigurdsson began a vigorous agitation for the improvement of the icelandic school system he proposed that common schools for the children should be built wherever they could be accessible that agricultural schools should be founded in all quarters that the latin school should be moved from bessa to dear to reykjavik and that its courses should be improved and that a theological school with a three years course should be established at reykjavik with regard to the common schools the conditions of the country with its sparse population even now prevents the maintenance of such schools in many places but instruction in the homes under the supervision of the clergyman has proved a very efficient substitute in the early part of the nineteenth century the country was still too weak economically to carry out so extensive an educational program but the work was undertaken in great earnest the latin school was moved to reykjavik in eighteen forty six and the following year at the logical seminary was also established there jan sigurdsson had asked that instruction should also be provided in medicine and jurisprudence but since the government and many of the icelanders themselves feared the expenses connected with such a plan it was postponed though nowhere was the need of trained physicians greater than in iceland where violent epidemics were so frequent the first doctor sent there in seventeen sixty had to serve both as physician and apothecary for the whole country until he could train some assistance in eighteen hundred there were still only six physicians in iceland in eighteen fifty the number had increased to seven but in so extensive a country where travel is slow and difficult it is evident that few sick people could receive any aid from a medical service so inadequate that students of law had to study in denmark where they did not become acquainted with icelandic jurisprudence was also a great disadvantage as a result lawyers and officials often learned to look at all questions from a danish point of view and became staunch supporters of the crown in every controversy instead of cherishing a more patriotic sympathy with their own people the danish government had long regarded iceland as a province which was to be connected as closely as possible with the realm all efforts to provide home training for students of law was therefore opposed as this would lessen danish influence over icelandic officials and might tend to develop a local patriotic sentiment the danish sympathies of the upper social class consisting of merchants officials and those who had studied in denmark was a safeguard against any separatistic national movement in iceland the merchants who were conducting business in icelandic harbour still had their real homes in denmark especially in copenhagen where they 
usually spent the winter months every year socially they did not mingle with the icelandic people and with the officials and their families with the amptomather and other dignitaries in reykjavik usually devoted adherents of the crown and strong supporters of its prerogatives in their fine homes liberal hospitality was shown all danish friends and festive entertainments were arranged for those who shared their tastes and belonged to the higher social circles from the life and sympathies of the icelandic people they were as a rule isolated and far removed End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen part one of history of iceland by knut gyurset this librivox recording is in the public domain romanticism in iceland struggle for autonomy the icelandic constitution of eighteen seventy four improved economic conditions under the influence of the french revolution and of great writers like voltaire rousseau and others who sponsored it by demanding freedom of thought press and conscience the intellectual life as well as the social thought of europe at this time was undergoing a profound change in germany the ideas of the revolution had made but slight impression but due to the stimulus of the times a new intellectual movement known as romanticism was started which brought about a complete literary revolution and created a new national life strong feeling and tender emotions were expressed in the new romantic literature a strong patriotic sentiment tinged with emotionalism swept over the fatherland demanding freedom from the prevalent foreign intellectual influence on the one hand and from foreign political dominion on the other everything national was to be studied and cultivated the study of germanic philology began to flourish at the expense of the hitherto predominating interest in classical languages folk songs and fairy tales were collected and scholarly knowledge was fostered in everything pertaining to german antiquities the germans became conscious of their unity as a people discovered that they had a common national destiny and found that their strength lay in building their national political and intellectual life on their own past history and cultural traditions a new nationalism destined to win for germany political unity and independence and unequalled prosperity and power was cradled in this new movement from germany it soon spread to the north in eighteen o two the danish poet len schlager began his literary career as leader of the new movement in denmark where it soon won the enthusiastic support of the younger writers in iceland it won complete ascendancy through bjarni thorarinson seventeen eighty six to eighteen forty one and jonas hell grimson eighteen o seven to eighteen forty five the two greatest poets in modern icelandic literature during his stay in copenhagen as student at the university thorarinson became a romanticist through the influence of ellenslager and the philosopher henrik stevens in eighteen o five he wrote the song eld gamla isafold which became so popular that it has since remained the national song of iceland in his own country he stood for a time alone as representative of the romantic movement as the the alf Klarung, under the leadership of magnus stevenson was still strong in contrast to stevenson he loved all national traditions and institutions he worked with enthusiasm for the restoration of the all thing wishing that it should assemble again on the old thingstead of thing Veller he also organized a company to improve the overland routes of travel between southern and northern iceland a project in which he spent much of his own private means as a devoted nationalist he was opposed to the whole movement headed by stevenson to his rationalism his corruption of the icelandic language through the introduction of foreign words and to his disregard of the ancient traditions of iceland thorarinson was a devout christian believer he desired to restore the purity of the icelandic language and sought to arouse the people's national feeling and love for their own historical traditions that two movements so diametrically opposed could not long exist side by side soon became evident sharp clashes grew frequent but thorarinson had the advantage of rare poetic talent and the support of the reawakened national sentiment of his countrymen 
the people felt that he was a true icelander who loved his country its history and its culture with rare power he conjured up in his poems the heroic figures of the saga times gunnar of hlidarendi nayar of berg thorsval sharp Fedin and others and encouraged the people to seek the elements of progress not in imitation of foreign lands but in the fortitude and heroism which was theirs in ages past he sang of the beauty of iceland and pictured its nature and its titanic mythological grandeur here was a country to be preferred to the level denmark why should not the icelanders take heart he summons them to fight again as of old against fire and frost against enervating and corrupting foreign influence if they fail in this fight let them sink into the ocean and perish better die with honour than live in shame thorensen did not rhyme with ease or great skill he was no master of form but his poems are like trumpet calls that awakened his people to strive for new national life and progress jonas hallgrimson his younger contemporary loved nature as thorarinson loved the people of iceland as he was a great artist in versification his poems excelled those of his contemporary in form and beauty though he did not possess his power of imagination as poets the two are of equal excellence and supplement each other in their production the rawinson devoting himself principally to the inner forces and hallgrimson to the exterior side of human life hallgrimson's intimate knowledge of iceland which he acquired while travelling through the country as a natural scientist enabled him to write descriptive poems of unexcelled charm among his most noted productions are island and gunnar Holmi. when the latter poem appeared in the periodical fjornir thorarinson was so impressed that he exclaimed now i think it is about time that i quit writing poetry in the wake of these two leaders followed many poets of less note jan thoradensen was especially important as novelist gisli bern nielsen wrote political poems elegies and love songs grimmer thompson a disciple of thorarinson devoted himself especially to the writing of ballads in the style of the old folk songs sigurd bride fjord was a productive lyric poet and the last representative of the rhymer poesy in iceland hjalmar jansen stein bjorn igelsen rector of the latin school in reykjavik paul olafsson and others also distinguished themselves as lyric poets to this group must also be counted the inspired lyric poet and dramatist matthias yuck eighteen thirty five to nineteen twenty one of the most influential men in modern icelandic history also in the various fields of scholarly work learned men appeared in this great age of national awakening and intellectual productivity jan arneson collected and published icelandic folk and fairy tales under the title of eilen skar bjoth sogur og Fintiri an excellent work which has been translated wholly or in part into danish german and english in philology the icelandic scholars won great distinction especially noted in this field are conrad gislason eighteen o eight to eighteen ninety one professor of the university of copenhagen who wrote numerous philological treatises and edited many old icelandic works and gudbrand vigfusson eighteen twenty seven to eighteen eighty nine professor in the university of oxford he completed and published icelandic english dictionary published a complete collection of old norse and old icelandic poems with english translations and corpus poeticum boreal edited a number of sagas and wrote numerous treatises dealing with northern antiquities the intellectual awakening in iceland produced a literary renaissance which gradually broadened into a great national patriotic movement political as well as literary in character it had its inception in the romanticism of germany and denmark but it derived its chief strength and impetus from the revolutionary movements which convulsed europe challenging the established principles and institutions of the old regime many events contributed to the growth of liberal ideas which were remodelling european political thought the old mercantilistic economic theories had been shattered by adam smith the advocate of free trade and non-interference of government in industrial pursuits who published his epoch-making work inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations seventeen seventy six 
the american declaration of independence the founding of the republic of the united states and the framing of its constitution the french revolution and the constitutions of the french republic the spanish constitution of eighteen twelve the national uprisings against napoleon and the norwegian constitution of eighteen fourteen created a liberal sentiment and national spirit in europe which made the old benevolent despotism antiquated and ultimately impossible after the downfall of napoleon reaction triumphed for a while but the july revolution in france in eighteen thirty so strengthened the liberal movement that the frightened rulers hastened to make concessions to save their thrones in iceland as elsewhere an intense patriotic sentiment was awakened through the influence of the new national poetry and the stimulus of revolutionary ideas the people were waking from their apathy to demand freedom from oppression restoration of their all thing recognition of their rights and character as a distinct nation and rehabilitation of their country which during years of misfortune had been reduced to abject political and economic dependency in eighteen thirty five the young patriotic leader thomas sedimundson together with the poet jonas halgrimson the philologist conrad gislason and the jurist bernjalf peterson founded the periodical Fjolner, which became the rallying point and organ of the new patriotic movement the poet biarni thororensen also assisted in the undertaking according to the introduction of the periodical written by c munson its purpose should be to reform icelandic literature purify the icelandic language cultivate the people's aesthetic sense and arouse their patriotism and love of liberty by stimulating admiration for the country's ancient greatness the old icelandic institutions language and literature in a beautiful poem island printed in the first number Algrimson pictures the great national decay by comparing the present state of iceland with conditions in earlier times in former days says the poet the icelanders met at the all thing and passed laws now there is no longer any all thing but snorri godi's thing booth is used as a sheep pen only the country itself remains unchanged as beautiful as in days of yore thomas Siemensen, who had studied theology in the university of copenhagen had travelled extensively after completing his university studies on these travels he learned to see more clearly than ever how deep was the national downfall of iceland and he became inspired with an ardent desire to create among his countrymen a new national life when he returned to iceland he became clergyman in his home parish and later provost the periodical fjolner was published in copenhagen by his associates but he continued to exercise great influence on the undertaking through his untiring energy it was his wish that the chief stress should be laid on political and economic questions the fostering of national patriotism and the improvement of economic life these views he could not carry out as his associates were more directly interested in the reformation of the literature and the purifying of the icelandic language Siemensen died at a very early age seven years after his return to iceland how much iceland and icelandic literature lost by his death it is not easy to estimate says valtir gudmundsen but from his writings and letters one gets the impression that he was the greatest personality which iceland possessed in the nineteenth century denmark had remained an absolute monarchy since sixteen sixty but after the july revolution in france in eighteen thirty some of the more far-sighted statesmen deemed it prudent to begin to pay some heed to public sentiment with the support of king frederick the sixth they undertook to organize assemblies of estates which were to serve as advisory bodies to the sovereign by ordinances of may twenty eighth eighteen thirty one and may fifteenth eighteen thirty four four such assemblies were created one for Jutland, two for the duchies of schleswig and holstein and one for sealand and the islands in the latter which numbered seventy members iceland was to be represented by two delegates elected by the people this shadow of representative government in which iceland was to figure only as one of the smallest and most obscure provinces of the danish kingdom could in no way satisfy the liberal sentiment and growing national aspirations of the icelanders the arrangement was vigorously opposed by the talented icelandic jurist baldwin einarsson who maintained that iceland being so different in character from the rest of the realm should have its own national assembly as two or three icelandic delegates sitting in a large danish body wholly unacquainted with affairs in so distant a country could exercise but little real influence 
few could speak danish so well that they could serve as delegates the voyage to denmark was long and costly and the election of delegates was difficult as they were so few in number that the people had to vote for persons living in distant parts of the country neither could the interests of each district be known nor properly furthered by so inadequate a representation the difficulty connected with being a representative in denmark was also so great that few would be willing to serve as a person chosen would have to spend almost two years far away from his family and his business interests to attend one session of the danish assembly on the other hand the advantages of a national icelandic assembly would be many the people would have the opportunity to take an active part in public affairs and a centre would again be created for icelandic national life as of old this reasoning made an impression on the king and the danish political leaders in answer to a petition for a separate assembly sent to copenhagen by the icelanders steps were taken to make the icelandic representation more effective by creating in eighteen thirty eight a commission of ten royal officials which was to assemble every other year at reykjavik under the presidency of the stiptem to investigate conditions in iceland and report to the government but this arrangement was of little practical value and did not satisfy the icelanders in eighteen forty king christian the eighth who ascended the throne december three eighteen thirty nine instructed the commission to consider the advisability of establishing a national assembly or all thing in iceland with representatives chosen by the people the commissioners were to express their opinion about the organization of such an assembly whether it should be called all thing and whether it should assemble at thing veller as formerly this step on the part of the king caused the greatest rejoicing in iceland the poet jonas halgrimson greeted the news in one of his finest poems and the patriotic leader thomas Simonson, who was now a dying man rose from his sick-bed to write about the organization of the all thing he urged that it should be organized as nearly as possible like the old all thing and that it should meet at thing -Beller as in days of old an assembly differently organized a meeting in a different place he regarded as equivalent to no assembly in considering the suggestion of the king the commissioners found that it would be advisable to create a separate assembly for iceland and that it should be called all thing but with true bureaucratic spirit they held that since it was to be coordinate with assemblies of denmark and schleswig holstein it should resemble them as closely as possible also in organization they opposed the old thing stead of thegbiller as a place of meeting for the new assembly and recommended reykjavik the capital of iceland the number of representatives was to be small only twenty to be chosen by the people and four or six appointed by the king only owners of a required amount of land should be eligible or have the right to vote the deliberations of the all things should be conducted in the icelandic language but those who could not use it might speak danish such speech is to be ordered translated by the presiding officer the report of the commission was sanctioned by the danish government the all thing was re-established march eighth eighteen forty three but the defects in the fundamental law for iceland thus outlined were so apparent that a danish member of the assembly of estates balthasar christensen of copenhagen demanded many important changes such as an increase in the number of representatives the lowering of the requirements for eligibility and the right of suffrage exclusive use of the icelandic language in the deliberations of the all thing and the selection of the old thingstead a thing -biller, as the place of meeting for the new assembly but these demands were looked upon by many as radical and found little real support since many of the icelandic representatives themselves stood hesitating and without any definite plan a new leader now appeared to guide the icelanders along the path to self-government this was jan sigurdsson the greatest figure in modern icelandic history this remarkable man was born at havranseyri in north-western iceland june seventeenth eighteen eleven after entering the university of copenhagen he continued to reside in that city in his extensive scholarly activity he devoted himself especially to philology archaeology and history fields in which he showed great talent and performed a work which attracted wide attention for the royal northern text society he published two volumes of the iceland gassogur including the iceland book landemark book and six other sagas he also published the younger edda and wrote a catalogue of the icelandic manuscripts in copenhagen stockholm and Uppsala. in annular for nordisk old kindai 
he published four sagas he published the first volume of the diplomatarium icelandicum and assisted in the publication of scriptores rerum danicarum and regesta diplomatica historii danii his articles on themes dealing with history and philology were very numerous and he was an active member of many learned societies in eighteen forty eight he became secretary of the arna Magnian commission a position which he retained till his death but although he distinguished himself as a scholar it was in the field of practical activity and constructive statesmanship that he was to render his people the greatest service and to win his most lasting renown he became the peerless leader of his people in their struggle for national liberty and representative government in all fields of activity his stimulating influence was so strongly felt that the progress made by the icelanders in the nineteenth century is largely traceable to his guidance and initiative the danish writer mr Kalund, describes him as follows jan sigerson was a harmonious personality a healthy soul in a healthy body he was tall and powerful and only in his later years was he weakened by sickness his hair turned white early but his brown eyes were keen and brilliant his facial expression was kind but firm his appearance dignified and attractive his home in copenhagen was the meeting-place for all his countrymen in the city who were attracted by his hospitality though his pecuniary circumstances might often be difficult jan sigerson was a man of deep insight and trustworthy judgment who with singular tenacity of purpose devoted his life and talents to the great cause of championing the rights of iceland together with the few friends he began in eighteen forty one the publication of the periodical nye fellaskrit of which he became editor and which continued to appear till eighteen seventy three in this organ all vital questions of the day were discussed problems of education finance trade and politics of its thirty volumes jan sigurdsson himself has written about two-thirds in two articles printed in the first volume of this periodical he clearly outlines the issues which gradually became the national programme of the icelanders demanding an independent national legislature free from all control of the danish assemblies greater independence for icelandic officials the abolition of the right of the supreme court of denmark to render decisions in purely icelandic cases and finally the greatest possible participation of the people in all political activities he did not share the romantic ideas of thomas Siebenson and others who wished to re-establish the old all thing at thing beller this form of representation he considered antiquated and unpractical he wished the new assembly to be a legislative body of popularly chosen representatives like the national legislatures of other lands as its place of assembly he favoured Reykjavik, the capital of the country and the growing centre of its new national life the icelanders were strongly opposed to the plan proposed by the danish government on the basis of the report of the royal commission petitions were sent to the king and the crown prince one signed by sixty-three farmers in eastern iceland and others signed by the two icelandic representatives in the danish assembly and all the icelanders in copenhagen asking for changes in the organization of the proposed icelandic assembly but the government paid no attention to these requests on march eighth eighteen forty three the new all thing was created in accordance with the recommendations submitted by the royal commission it was to consist of twenty-six representatives twenty of whom were to be elected by the people and six to be appointed by the king it should be an advisory body equal in rank to the assemblies of estates in denmark and schleswig holstein its meeting-place was to be reykjavik where it assembled for the first time in eighteen forty five the new all thing though faulty in many respects represented a most important victory for icelandic national aspirations since the introduction of absolutism in denmark in sixteen sixty iceland had been regarded as an integral part of the danish kingdom governed by royal danish officials and often according to danish laws though it had retained its old code the jan's book which was still in force through the establishing of a new assembly the rights of the icelanders as a distinct people were recognized and iceland was given rank with the duchies of schleswig holstein reykjavik became a centre of icelandic political life a national representation had been created through which the will of the people could express itself and the patriotic sentiment was greatly strengthened 
that the representative government established in eighteen forty three failed to satisfy the popular demand became apparent even during the first session of the all thing the rather stormy and excited debates made it clear that the new assembly was regarded only as an initial step in the direction of representative self-government from all parts of iceland petitions were submitted asking for various changes in the new system of representation but the royal commissioner read a letter from the king stating that no further concessions would be made with mixed feelings of gladness and disappointment the first session closed without definite action on the pending problems when the all thing again assembled in eighteen forty seven the debate on the proposed changes was renewed the chief points at issue were increase of the number of representatives to the all thing extension of the suffrage public sessions of the all thing publication of its deliberations and the exclusive use of the icelandic language in its sessions other questions like that of diet and travelling expenses of the representatives were also discussed for pecuniary reasons the demand for an increase in the number of representatives was finally dropped but the removal of the restrictions on suffrage the introduction of direct voting in such a way that each five voters should choose one elector the publication of the proceedings of the all thing and the exclusive use of the icelandic language in its sessions were reforms insisted upon it was resolved to address a petition to the king asking for revision of the fundamental law on these points while the all thing was taking these initial steps in its work the political situation was suddenly changed through the death of king christian the eighth january twenty eighteen forty eight the growing national sentiment in the german duchies of schleswig holstein was developing into a strong desire for autonomy resulting in a bitter antagonism between these duchies and the kingdom of denmark where a strong political party demanded unity of the realm with the eider river as the southern border a name which if accomplished would result in the absorption of schleswig in the danish kingdom the liberal political ideas had now grown so strong that the new king frederick the seventh shortly after his accession to the throne issued a rescript january twenty eighth eighteen forty eight promising to grant his kingdom a constitution in the hope that this would conciliate the dissatisfied elements throughout the realm the old absolute regime would give place to a limited monarchy a general legislative assembly for denmark and the duchies of schleswig holstein would be created but the assurance was given that no change would be made in the existing provincial assemblies the union of schleswig holstein or the relation of the two duchies of holstein and lorenburg to the german confederation iceland was to retain its all thing as before but how the proposed change would affect the status of their country naturally filled the minds of the icelanders with nervous apprehension in dealing with the demands of the icelanders for an autonomous home government two aspects of the question had to be considered the isolated location and natural condition of the country made it advisable as baldwin einarsson had pointed out to establish a separate icelandic assembly the law of eighteen forty three had been framed chiefly on the basis of this policy of expediency little attention had been paid to the question whether iceland had any right to local self-government as a distinct people united with denmark under a common crown as the custom had grown up of considering iceland an integral part of the danish kingdom but this question had already been raised by jan sigurdsson and with the awakening national sentiment not only in iceland but throughout all europe it was clear that no satisfactory settlement of the question touching iceland could be made until the relation and mutual rights of the two countries should be more clearly defined shortly after the appearance of the royal rescript of eighteen forty eight sigurdsson published in the nyfella an article entitled hug the ja till icelandinga in which he clearly set forth the views of his people regarding their national rights and the relation of iceland to the danish realm he showed that in the study of the history of governments in iceland three chief features must especially be noted in twelve sixty two iceland was united with norway under the agreement known as the gamli sat mali which defined the rights and position of the icelanders in sixteen sixty two they were persuaded to surrender many of their rights into the hands of the king by swearing allegiance to king frederick the third at kappa Vag as hereditary monarch but now that the king through his own declaration had renounced his absolute power and had taken steps to establish constitutional government the rights which the icelanders had surrendered to the king reverted to them 
their relation to the realm was now the same as under the gamli set mali the only existing union agreement according to this covenant neither the danes nor any other people had any rightful power over iceland or any show of right to control icelandic affairs the icelanders would deal with the king alone regarding the constitutional provisions and all questions touching iceland for to him alone they pledged their allegiance of their own free will in twelve sixty two the icelanders he continues are a distinct people with their own language and national life which makes it necessary for them to have their own government the chief demands raised by sigurdsson on the basis of this interpretation of iceland's position were that the icelandic althing should have the same power in dealing with icelandic affairs that the danish rigsdag had in dealing with danish affairs that a viceroy or governor should be appointed for iceland responsible to the althing that a minister for icelandic affairs should have a seat in the king's cabinet and that the icelandic finances should be separated from those of denmark jan sigurdsson had stripped the issue regarding iceland of all romantic theory and had given it so definite and practical a form that his compatriots adopted his views as their program in the struggle for national freedom before the plan suggested in the royal rescript of january twenty eighth eighteen forty eight could be carried out the french revolution of february eighteen forty eight further aggravated the political situation in denmark the news of the revolution created the greatest unrest throughout europe at kiel in holstein and flensburg in schleswig intense excitement prevailed the danish statesmen had adhered with short-sighted tenacity to the policy of a united danish kingdom with the eider river as the southern border a policy which was adopted also by the danish liberal leaders in opposition to their effort to unite the whole of schleswig with denmark a strong party was organized in the duchies to maintain the union of schleswig and holstein the german population in the duchies in their struggle for autonomy looked for assistance to prussia and the german confederation while the danes turned for sympathy and support to the scandinavian kingdoms norway and sweden and succeeded in developing a strong pan-scandinavian and anti-german sentiment throughout the north the uncompromising attitude of the two parties increased the growing tension rendering a peaceful settlement of the controversy impossible when news was received of the february revolution in paris a meeting of representatives of the two duchies in flensburg decided to send a deputation to copenhagen to demand a separate constitution for schleswig holstein and the incorporation of schleswig in the german confederation the danish leaders learning of this move met in the casino in copenhagen and drafted vehement resolutions demanding a constitution for denmark including schleswig as an integral part of the danish kingdom to this pressure the king yielded in a conference with the delegates from the duchies he stated that he would grant holstein a constitution and permit it to remain united with the german confederation but with regard to schleswig he would strengthen its indissoluble union with denmark this proposal was rejected and war was precipitated between denmark and schleswig holstein during this conflict the king and his advisers were able to carry out their constitutional program according to their own views on april four eighteen forty eight the king revoked the rescript of january twenty eighth and summoned the assemblies of jutland schleswig sealand and the islands to consider the calling of a constitutional convention the icelandic althing although coordinate with these assemblies was not summoned or consulted according to the plan submitted by the government the convention should consist of one hundred and forty five delegates from denmark and schleswig elected by the people and forty-eight to be appointed by the king among the latter should be five delegates from iceland and one from the faroe islands the arbitrary and unjust character of this proposal is at once evident the all thing was ignored and iceland should have no popularly chosen representatives only five delegates appointed by the king when this news reached iceland an assembly of notables was convened at reykjavik which demanded that four of the five delegates should be popularly chosen a petition to this effect was sent to the king but this rather lame step did not satisfy public opinion in iceland the people of arnesisla and of borgarfjard darcisla sent petitions to the king demanding a popularly elected legislative assembly for iceland on august the fifth nineteen of the foremost men from the various districts of iceland met at thingvella to consider what measures should be taken to safeguard icelandic interests a petition was drawn up and signed 
in which they took cognizance of the king's promise to grant a constitution but they held that the plan of establishing constitutional government could be realized for iceland only by making the old thing a truly national assembly of popularly chosen representatives they pointed out that the proposed icelandic representation in the constitutional convention to be assembled would be wholly inadequate to safeguard icelandic interests finally they demanded that the measures passed by this convention so far as they had reference to iceland should be submitted for ratification to an icelandic assembly as popularly chosen as that of denmark and that a representative national assembly should be established for iceland with the same powers as that of the danish assembly which was to be created the petition drawn up at thingveller was repeated in nearly all districts of the country in all eighteen like-worded petitions bearing one thousand nine hundred and forty signatures were sent to the king by the stig tom mather matthias tons rosenorn who added in a communication to the government his own views on the situation in iceland he stated that although the news from denmark had caused great excitement in iceland the people were very loyal to the king but being imbued with a strong national patriotism they wished to share in the benefits to be derived from a change in the form of government and would not be satisfied if this change was made without the cooperation of the all thing they would not object to being represented in a general legislative assembly dealing with the affairs of the whole realm if matters involving icelandic interests would be referred to the all thing and if the interests of iceland would be properly respected and safeguarded in the reorganization of the government the petitions together with this communication from the stiptum mather made such an impression on the king and government that a very courteous reply was returned september twenty three eighteen forty eight stating that although the king under the existing circumstances had found it necessary to grant iceland a representation in the constitutional convention different from that of the danish provinces it was not his intention that constitutional provisions touching iceland should be finally adopted before an icelandic assembly had been given an opportunity to consider them the members of the danish constitutional convention were chosen october twelfth and it caused general satisfaction in iceland that among the five icelandic delegates appointed were the two political leaders jan sigurdsson and jan gurd munson the leading advocates of icelandic autonomy at the opening of the convention october twenty three eighteen forty eight the chairman a w moltke stated that measures regarding iceland would not be definitely resolved upon before an icelandic assembly could be consulted the outline of a constitution together with a draft of an election law were submitted to the convention in the constitution iceland was not mentioned but in the election law it was provided that iceland should have seven representatives in the danish legislative assembly the rigsdag denmark one hundred and fifty three schleswig forty two and the faroe islands two it is evident that such an icelandic representation could exercise so little influence in a large legislative assembly that the position of iceland would be that of a province or district in the danish kingdom through the efforts of the icelandic delegates the paragraph proposing this representation was stricken from the document with the understanding that this matter was to be adjusted later the same was done also with a similar paragraph regarding the representation from schleswig and the faroe islands with these and a few other minor changes the drafted constitution was adopted and received royal sanction june five eighteen forty nine as adopted it affected only denmark not iceland schleswig or the faroe islands the election law which was also passed was sanctioned by the king the sixteenth of the same month in iceland the sentiments and opinions touching the new constitution were expressed in numerous articles in the leading icelandic periodicals judge thorder jonasson representing the most conservative view urged the importance of preserving the union with denmark and the need of an icelandic representation in the danish rigsdag together with an icelandic national assembly organized according to an agreement to be made with the icelanders themselves in the new liberal newspaper the yoru Ulfer, the priest svein bjorn Hallgrimson is editor wrote a series of articles in which he made more radical demands by advocating a national constitution and government for iceland in the knee 
Villa Skrid. It was also urged that an Icelandic representation in the Danish Riksdag would be useless, that Iceland should have its own constitution defining its relation to the rest of the realm, and that the government officials should reside in the country and should be responsible to the Althing, which should be a properly constituted legislative assembly similar opinions were advanced also by other writers who argued that the relation between iceland and denmark was that of a confederation of the two countries under a common king that the old thing must be an assembly in every way coordinate with the danish rigsdag that an icelandic executive government responsible to the old thing should be created which should act together with the king through a minister residing in copenhagen and that the all things should be reorganized on the basis of political equality for all and the most extensive suffrage public meetings were held in all districts throughout iceland to discuss these important questions most notable was an assembly of one hundred and eighty men representing nearly all the election districts of the country convened at thingveller june twenty eighth to twenty nine under the presidency of peter peterson church historian and later bishop of iceland petitions from local meetings were read and a memorial was drawn up to be presented to the all thing a new election law was outlined according to which the restrictions on suffrage should be reduced to the least possible and the national assembly should consist of forty-eight representatives forty-two of whom should be chosen by the people in direct elections in conformity with the principle announced by the king september twenty three eighteen forty eight and sanctioned by the danish constitutional convention that provisions touching iceland could not be adopted before an icelandic assembly had had the opportunity to consider them the icelanders now took steps to deal with their own problems in connection with the new constitution since the old thing is a purely advisory assembly did not possess the power to deal with questions of this kind a constitutional convention would have to be called in iceland as had already been done in denmark but before delegates could be chosen the new election law framed by the danish constitutional convention would have to be submitted to the all thing for ratification on july two eighteen forty nine the all thing assembled but the royal commissioner had not yet arrived from copenhagen the assembly was therefore called to order by the strip aunt mather rosenorn Jan Sigurdsson was chosen president of the assembly, but as he had not yet arrived from Copenhagen, the vice president, Reverend Hannes Stevenson, presided over its session till his arrival. The question of the new election law was brought up, but since the draft prepared by the Constitutional Convention had not yet come from Denmark, the one proposed by the meeting at Thingveller was submitted to the assembly and referred to a committee headed by Jan Gudmundsson after some days jan sigurdsson arrived in iceland accompanied by the royal commissioner paul melsted who brought the new election law this differed from the thingveller plan on many important points instead of an increased number of representatives to the national assembly direct elections and only slight restrictions on suffrage and eligibility to office proposed by the latter this law provided for a small number of representatives indirect elections and unequal representation of the election districts it was therefore rejected by the all thing the thing bill of draft was adopted with but few modifications and sent to the king together with a petition asking that he would give it his sanction and return it at the earliest possible date in order that representatives might be chosen to the convention some fear was entertained that the king might object to the law but it was sanctioned september twenty eighth eighteen forty nine and returned as requested in may eighteen fifty the election of representatives took place and everything was ready for the meeting of the convention july fifteenth of that year in the meantime the new reaction which was spreading through europe was beginning to exert its influence also in denmark the wave of liberal sentiment following the revolution of eighteen forty eight had spent its force in france the populace had begun to greet president napoleon with the shout of long live the emperor soon to be followed by a coup d'etat and the restor restoration of the empire in italy the liberal national movement was crushed in the battle of novara march twenty three eighteen forty nine the hungarian republic was overthrown in july of the same year in austria the liberal movement was completely suppressed and in germany the vacillating king frederick william the fourth had thrown himself into the arms of the reaction the prussian diet was dispersed by troops and finally formally dissolved december five eighteen forty eight the war between denmark and schleswig holstein was renewed after the expiration of an armistice signed at Malmö, august twenty sixth eighteen forty eight 
but prussia which had hitherto supported the duchies now took the same attitude as russia and the two powers gave the king of denmark free hands to suppress the uprising of schleswig holstein which was no longer regarded as a struggle for national self-determination but as rebellion against their legitimate sovereign at Istead, the danes won a decisive victory july twenty five eighteen fifty pressed by the great powers and seeing the uselessness of continuing the struggle the schleswig holsteiners dissolved their assembly and disbanded their army under these circumstances the attention of the king and the political leaders in denmark was directed chiefly to the strengthening of the unity and solidarity of the realm the final determination of the relation between its various parts was to be carried out with a view of uniting all into a firmly consolidated kingdom while iceland was preparing for the meeting of the convention which according to royal rescript was to assemble july fifteenth eighteen fifty orders were received from copenhagen postponing the session till july four of the following year the reason for this strange act was said to be that the provisions regarding the future relation of iceland to the realm which were to be submitted had not yet been formulated and that it would not be expedient to make final arrangements with regard to iceland while the question concerning other parts of the realm was still pending it is quite evident that the situation in iceland was nearly the same as in schleswig in both countries there was a strongly expressed desire for full autonomy and complete self-government in local affairs while the king and government wished to incorporate both schleswig and iceland in the danish kingdom under a common constitution it was undoubtedly feared that any concession to iceland at this moment would be cited as a precedent and would tend to encourage the national aspirations in schleswig holstein the disappointment and apprehension created by this unexpected action of the government only increased the people's interest in the constitutional question the periodicals continued to publish articles dealing with all phases of the relation to denmark and the features of the new constitution the the or the ofer which maintained that the only bond of union with denmark was a common king advocated a liberal self-government for iceland patterned on that of norway local meetings continued to be held throughout iceland the more representative assemblies being convened at thingveller on august tenth eighteen fifty two hundred representatives met at the old thingstead to consider the question regarding the constitution reports and opinions of local meetings were heard and a committee was appointed which through its chairman jan gudmundsson presented a report demanding complete autonomy for iceland together with a national government consisting of a jarl or governor with an icelandic cabinet an icelandic minister in copenhagen full law-making power for the althing and a return to the old agreement between norway and iceland as the basis of union it was further decided that local committees should be chosen in all election districts with a central committee stationed at reykjavik which in conjunction with the local committees should consider all features of the pending questions on august twenty three the central committee at reykjavik began the publication of a periodical the under Bunnigsblad, in which the important features of the proposed constitution were discussed the government viewed this movement with growing alarm among other steps taken to discourage it the stiptem mother count tramp issued a regulation forbidding all unlawful meetings when the first impulsive order ebbed away some of the leaders hesitated and the first vigorous demands were followed by more calm deliberation one of the members of the central committee stated that to consider the various features of the constitution before the government proposals had been submitted was useless and confusing but on june twenty eighth eighteen fifty one a new meeting of one hundred and forty delegates was assembled at thingbeller the main features of an icelandic council constitution were outlined the authing according to this plan was to be a law-making body with full legislative power in conjunction with the king with full power to raise revenues fix public expenditures levy taxes and to deal with all matters which would naturally come within the scope of authority of such an assembly when popularly organized an executive branch of government consisting of officials responsible to the people should be established within the country itself and a minister for icelandic affairs should be stationed in copenhagen the demand of the year previous that a jarl should be placed over iceland was dropped after passing resolutions that this draft should be placed before the convention when it assembled the meeting adjourned 
after the termination of hostilities in schleswig-holstein an assembly of notables was convened at flensburg may fourteenth eighteen fifty one to consider plans for the organization of the realm according to the opinion of the majority of the representatives holstein should have nothing in common with the rest of the realm but the king foreign affairs and the navy but schleswig should be so closely united with denmark as to have only a slight degree of local autonomy the plan of separating the two duchies was opposed by the powers and could not be carried out but the desire of the danish leaders to unite all parts of the monarchy into a well consolidated whole had been clearly expressed that iceland would be treated like the rest of the realm would naturally be inferred since no provisions were suggested with regard to it End of chapter sixteen part one chapter sixteen part two of history of iceland by canute geurset this librivox recording is in the public domain on july fourth eighteen fifty one the convention assembled at reykjavik and after a new delay caused by the failure of the government to forward in time the drafts of the measures to be considered the law defining iceland's relation to denmark was finally submitted the constitution of the kingdom of denmark was attached as a supplement and was to be accepted in iceland without discussion it was stated that since the Kongolov and the act of seventeen o nine through which it was promulgated in denmark expressly stated that iceland was a part of the danish kingdom this could no longer be subject to discussion and since the king by granting a constitution had sanctioned a popular form of government within the limits established by the Kong love only the manner in which the various provisions should apply to iceland could be submitted for consideration with regard to the constitution itself the government admitted that many provisions in it could not apply to iceland and that others could not be made operative because of the natural conditions of the country but it was argued that it was not necessary to omit these paragraphs as it was evident that they could not be enforced the constitution as applied to iceland would have to be given an interpretation based on good judgment the proposed law regarding iceland's relation to the realm numbered sixty paragraphs of which the first ten contained the most essential provisions according to this measure the danish constitution of june five eighteen forty nine should apply also to iceland in matters affecting the whole realm the king and the rigsdag should have complete authority even if iceland was not represented in the assembly but an opportunity would be given the icelanders to elect representatives to the rigsdag according to the number of their population in all exclusively the icelandic affairs the king's law-making function should be exercised in conjunction with the althing and not with the rigsdag also in these matters he should act through his ministers who should be responsible to the rigsdag and not to the althing the revenues should be divided in such a manner that all indirect taxes should go to the common treasury of the realm which should pay the government officials the judges of the superior court the bishops the teachers of the higher institutions of learning and the expenses connected with the mail service between denmark and iceland the direct taxes should go to a local icelandic treasury which was to defray the expenses of the althing and the local government as an alternative it was suggested that instead of such a division of the revenues iceland might contribute a fixed sum to the general government but it was feared that it would prove difficult if not impossible to determine what this sum should be the king promised not to levy new taxes or to increase the burdens on the icelandic treasury without the consent of the althing so far as possible the consent of the althing should also be obtained to any change in the laws of iceland proposed in the rigsdag and finally it was proposed that the icelanders should send six representatives to the danish rigsdag two to the upper and four to the lower branch provisions regarding the election of members to the althing and the draft of a law governing trade and intercourse with iceland were also submitted as distinct measures proposed by the government in the consideration of the submitted proposals a stern 
opposition of the convention to the whole government plan and the reasoning upon which it was based soon manifested itself the claim that iceland was a part of the danish kingdom could never appeal with force to the minds of those who possessed knowledge of icelandic history while the declaration that the danish constitution which had never been promulgated in iceland should be the fundamental law of the land without the sanction of the convention assembled to consider it was an evident violation of the royal rescript of september twenty three eighteen forty eight stating that no constitutional provisions touching iceland should be finally adopted until an icelandic assembly had been given the opportunity to consider them the union of iceland with norway under a common king had been established by mutual agreement the icelanders retaining as before their national assembly their laws and local administration no change in this relation was effected either by the union between norway sweden and denmark established at kalmar in thirteen ninety seven or through the proclamation of absolute hereditary kingship sanctioned at copa vogue in sixteen sixty two since the danish congolov lex regia of sixteen sixty five was never promulgated in iceland even that document could constitute no basis for the claim set up by the danish government it is true that absolutism was established in iceland through any agreement at kuppa vogue but the weakness of the position taken by the danish leaders in the union controversy was their claim that they by iceland became a part of the danish kingdom that icelandic nationality was submerged in that of denmark the icelanders claimed that nothing of this sort had happened they had done homage to the king as absolute monarch as did also the danes and norwegians but this did not change the relation existing between the two countries the icelanders continued to be a distinct people with their own national assembly their local institutions and system of jurisprudence all laws had to be promulgated by the althing before they could take effect in iceland and although the althing was finally dissolved in eighteen hundred the lands fur edder was created in its place and in eighteen forty three the althing was re-established as a recognition of a separate icelandic nationality no better evidence could be desired that iceland was still a separate country with its fundamental right of self-determination than the royal rescript of september twenty three eighteen forty eight the course now pursued by the government could find no justification in an appeal to the historic past it could only be interpreted as an arbitrary reaction against the liberal policy inaugurated in eighteen forty eight the committee to which the proposed acts were submitted by the convention returned a minority and a majority report the minority were willing to accept the measures at least in principle though they could not sanction the method pursued by the government in trying to establish the danish constitution in iceland they would limit their opposition to a demand for amendments to various subjectionable provisions the majority of the committee would not surrender the principle of iceland's separate nationality and existence as a political entity they held that the only basis of union with denmark was a common king and that iceland should be mentioned in the king's title like other parts of the monarchy they would not accept the proposed constitution as a whole as this might lead to endless confusion and serious dangers for the future they proposed instead that a separate constitution should be framed for iceland for which they submitted a draft based as far as possible on the danish constitution according to this proposal iceland should remain united with denmark under a common hereditary king a joint foreign department same flag currency university and system of weights and measures other common interests could be arranged according to mutual agreement in purely icelandic affairs the all things should take the place of the danish rigstag the judicial power should remain in the icelandic courts of law and the administration of icelandic affairs should be conducted as far as possible in the country itself neither the minority nor the majority would therefore accept the government plan as submitted the royal commissioner count tramp stimpton mother of iceland who represented the government in the deliberations had gained great popularity through his ability to use the icelandic language as well as through the interest he had first shown in the liberal movement in eighteen fifty he had served as chairman of the central committee appointed by the patriotic meeting at thingveller but when he discovered the changed attitude of the government 
he gradually withdrew from the movement in march eighteen fifty one the committee announced that its chairman could no longer preside at its meetings because of pressing official duties and that he had even forbidden the printing at reykjavik of the reports of the local committees so that the periodical founded by the central committee had to be published in copenhagen his hostility to the patriotic movement in iceland had become so pronounced that in the summer of eighteen fifty one he issued the already mentioned regulation forbidding an all unlawful meetings in the convention where he served as royal commissioner he showed irritation and haughty ill-will when the government proposals encountered opposition it was also thought that it was in answer to his request that military forces were sent to iceland together with secret instructions that he might use them according to his own discretion a very unusual measure in a country where military uniforms were never seen and where the people were so peaceful and loyal as to dream of no resistance to government authorities when it became clear that the government proposals would not be accepted as submitted the steptem mother grew angry proposals of amendments or any real deliberations by which an understanding might be arrived at he would not tolerate on august eighth it was announced that the convention would meet the following day at twelve o'clock when the royal commissioner would bring up a very important matter at the stated hour the delegates were in their seats and deep silence prevailed outside the soldiers came marching with fixed bayonets and loaded cartridges taking their position near the convention hall the silent anticipation was growing very tense when the royal commissioner stepped forward attired in official uniform he drew a document from his pocket and began to speak to the delegates in a sharp and upbraiding tone stating that they had wasted their time and that the purpose of the convention had miscarried the session could not be prolonged and he declared the convention dissolved jan sigurdsson chairman of the constitutional committee interrupted him by asking if he would be allowed to explain the action of the committee and the convention but the presiding officer a royal officer answered no the count continued saying i believe the delegates have heard that in the name of the king i have dissolved the convention jan sigurdsson responded then i protest in the name of the king and the people against this procedure and reserve the right of the assembly to complain to the king of this unlawful act whereupon the whole assembly rose and cried in chorus we all protest when the count and the presiding officer had left the hall someone called out long live king frederick the seventh a cry which was repeated by all the delegates the stip tem mather in dismissing the convention probably acted in harmony with the wishes of the government it was evidently the plan to secure the consent of the convention to the government proposal as quickly as possible without much deliberation and especially without counter-proposals on the part of the assembly the session had lasted only five weeks and one week had passed before the proposed acts had been submitted the statement of the count that the delegates had wasted their time could therefore not be taken seriously if the assembly in considering so important measures should exercise any deliberative functions after the dissolution of the convention thirty-six of the delegates addressed a remonstrance to the king in which they defended the position of the convention and protested against the procedure of the stip temp mather and the presence of troops to intimidate the delegates they asked that the management of icelandic affairs be placed in the hands of native icelanders enjoying the confidence of the people that the functionary in copenhagen who had to deal with icelandic affairs be given seat and voice in the king's cabinet that a constitution for iceland be drafted in harmony with the outline submitted by the majority of the constitutional committee and presented to a new constitutional convention chosen in the same manner as the one just dismissed this remonstrance was brought to denmark by jan sigurdsson and jan gudmundsson an address was also directed to the icelandic people defending the action of the convention 
the people on their side show their approval of the course pursued by the convention in resolutions sent to individual delegates and by addressing a petition to the king of similar contents as that sent by the constitutional committee bearing two thousand two hundred signatures but these steps failed to elicit a favorable response from the government on may twelfth eighteen fifty two the king issued a manifesto to the icelandic people denying the petition of the thirty-six delegates this document asserted that the views advanced by the delegates and shared by the signers of the petition were in conflict with the laws of the realm and would lead to the ruin of iceland and the dissolution of the danish monarchy that under the existing confusion of ideas it was not advisable to submit a new constitution the all thing should continue its sessions until the time arrived when the king should deem it advisable to make new regulations regarding iceland's position in the realm in accordance with this provision elections of representatives to the new all thing were ordered but none of the officials who had signed the petition of august ten were to be chosen on january twenty eighth of the same year the king had issued a proclamation under pressure of the great powers announcing that schleswig would not be incorporated in the danish kingdom that the duchies of schleswig holstein and lorenburg should have their own local assemblies of estates and that a constitution would be granted for the whole realm but the proclamation contained no mention of iceland under these circumstances a meeting which was convened at thingbella under the leadership of sir hannes stevenson addressed the petition to the all thing of eighteen fifty three as soon as the all thing assembled it sought again to bring the constitutional question to a successful termination by directing a new petition to the king reminding him of the promises given in the rescript of september twenty three eighteen forty eight and in the proclamation of january twenty eighth eighteen fifty two the petitioners prayed that in presenting new proposals regarding iceland's relation to the realm the king would grant the all thing law-making power in matters in which it already acted as an advisory body that a local administrative government should be established at reykjavik consisting of three officials who should have seats in the all thing that the number of judges and the jurisdiction of the superior court of iceland should be increased that iceland might get a representation according to its population in the new assembly to be established for the whole realm and that an icelandic minister should be appointed the petition was carefully and courteously worded and was approved by the royal commissioner melstead but the king again refused to grant the desired reforms in an address directed to the all thing eighteen fifty five the promise given in the royal rescript of september twenty three eighteen forty eight had already been fulfilled by the assembling of the constitutional convention of eighteen fifty one it was stated but the principal reason for denying the petition was represented to be that such changes in the icelandic constitution could not be granted because of the burdens which would be placed on the icelandic people and that iceland contributed nothing to the general treasury of the realm shortly after the adjournment of the all thing the danish government published on october two eighteen fifty five a constitution for the whole realm together with a law governing the election of members of the riggs rod the new assembly of eighty members which was to represent the whole danish monarchy iceland was not mentioned either in the constitution or in the election law the members of the riggs red were to be chosen from denmark schleswig holstein and laurenburg but even in the division of the realm into election districts no mention was made of iceland which was to be considered a danish province this view was clearly expressed in a work published by the danish jurist j e larsen october sixth eighteen fifty five entitled om islands hid till the renda statsre liga stilling in which he attacks the position of the committee majority of eighteen fifty one and attempts to prove that iceland is an integral part of the danish kingdom in reply jan sigurdsson wrote a work on islands Stansreg, stilling in which he refutes with great clearness larsen's whole reasoning and the premises on which it is based 
but in spite of sigerson's convincing arguments the policy of the government with regard to iceland remained unchanged the danish rigsdag enacted regulations regarding icelandic trade and debated the icelandic budget without hearing the opinion of the all thing some measures were nevertheless passed which affected favorably the situation in iceland one cause which young sigurdsson had earnestly sought to promote was the improvement of icelandic commercial intercourse which was still under such restrictions that only citizens of the realm could engage in trade with iceland in his writings he urged the necessity of making icelandic trade free to all nations a view which at first met with determined opposition in denmark petitions were sent to the government from many parts of iceland praying for the removal of restrictions on icelandic trade in answer to this growing demand a law was finally passed april fifteen eighteen fifty four making icelandic trade free to all nations thus removing an economic yoke under which the people has suffered for centuries freedom of the press for iceland was also established by a law of may nine eighteen fifty five after it had been introduced in denmark in january eighteen fifty one and in answer to a petition from the all thing a more liberal election law was published january sixth eighteen fifty seven in response to an all thing petition the king also granted in eighteen fifty nine that both the danish and icelandic texts of all laws for iceland should be signed by the king this was a matter of importance as the people would have officially signed laws in their own language instead of being subject to loose interpretations of laws written in a foreign tongue the ownership of all wrecks thrown ashore an old right of which the icelanders had been deprived by a royal ordinance of night fifteen ninety five was also restored to them the reference to iceland's economic condition and failure to share in the general burdens of the realm contained in the king's address to the all thing eighteen fifty five raised new issues which further complicated the controversy which had developed between denmark and iceland it became evident that in order to solve the constitutional conflict it was necessary to make clear the financial relation between the two countries what iceland had paid or ought to pay to the general treasury could only be determined by careful analysis of danish administration of icelandic affairs after eighteen twenty five repeated complaints had been made by the government at that there was a constant deficit in the icelandic treasury that the island was unable to pay its own expenses and had to receive aid from denmark but a little inquiry into the true status of affairs revealed that large sums derived from various icelandic sources had been appropriated by denmark without returns depriving iceland not only of her just belongings but of her sources of revenue a fair adjustment of accounts would make denmark the debtor and not the creditor on the financial balance sheet before the reformation iceland had been self-supporting the expenses connected with maintaining her church establishment were paid from incomes derived from church lands and the revenues of the monasteries for the current expenses of the all thing and the local administration adequate provision had also been made after the reformation the king became the head of the church as well as of the state and the government assumed the management of the church administration the king issued several rescripts stating that the incomes from the church estate should be used for the establishing and maintaining of schools he expressly stated that the church lands belonged to the people of iceland the same attitude was taken also with regard to the revenues funds and valuables of the cathedral churches and monasteries whenever these passed under government supervision a formal receipt was issued for them unfortunately the incomes from the church lands were not devoted to the support of the icelandic schools as at first suggested but were swept into the royal treasury in sixteen seventy four the king ordered henrik bielke governor of iceland to sell the lands belonging to the icelandic monasteries this order was carried out and lands were sold for the amount of twenty four thousand one hundred and sixty two rigs dollar other tracts belonging to the various monasteries were sold from time to time until eighteen sixty six in a similar way the valuables which had once belonged to the catholic churches of iceland as well as the church lands were sold and the proceeds turned into the general treasury when the skalholt bishop's seat was moved to reykjavik the king issued a rescript 
april twenty ninth seventeen eighty five ordering the church lands of the diocese to be sold for the benefit of the royal treasury with the proviso that the government should pay the bishop's salary and maintain the latin school by royal rescript of october two eighteen o one the bishopric and latin school of hola were consolidated with the bishopric and latin school of reykjavik and the church lands of the old bishopric were sold in order to give better financial support to the new school and bishopric the sale brought the amount of one hundred and twenty three thousand one hundred and ninety nine rigs dollar but this sum was not credited to iceland on the budget cash funds of various kinds were also seized to these sums must further be added the greater share of the relief fund collected for the famine-stricken people of iceland in seventeen eighty four to seventeen eighty five not over one-fourth of which had been used for the relief of the sufferers the rest remained in the general treasury or was used for purposes of no interest to iceland the benefit derived by danish citizens from the monopolized icelandic trade and the economic losses suffered by the icelanders due to that monopoly would also have to be considered even the direct proceeds from appropriated funds and sale of icelandic property formed a capital which according to the lowest possible estimates amounted to three hundred and fifty thousand rigs dollar iceland's resources had thus remained in the hands of denmark for centuries the income derived from them was entered into the budget as danish not as icelandic revenues and as the officials connected with the church and civil administration drew their pay from the general treasury it would naturally appear that iceland did not pay her share in the expenses of the realm what part of those expenses could be justly regarded as iceland's share of the public burdens would also need to be determined and would naturally have to be computed to some extent on the basis of the services rendered the country by the danish government these had often been very small being usually limited to the sending of a governor and a few higher officials to iceland no defence had been provided against attacks of pirates and freebooters the icelandic coasts were unguarded the people unarmed and defenceless without military protection of any sort in time of war denmark had been unable to give iceland any assistance leaving the country to the mercy of the enemy economically the icelanders had derived even less benefit from danish rule as their trade had remained in the hands of the merchant companies who made it impossible to foster home industries or develop icelandic resources it would therefore seem that iceland's share of the public burdens would be limited to the expenses connected with maintaining her schools her civil administration and her church establishment burdens which the people were willing enough to carry if the government would establish a legislative assembly and local administration and give them control of their own affairs political liberty was thus found to be so closely connected with economic independence that the icelanders raised the demand for restitution of the funds and resources appropriated by denmark separation of finances and the organization of an independent icelandic budget in eighteen sixty one a joint committee consisting of three danes and two icelanders was appointed to devise a plan for settling the financial question three different reports were submitted by this committee jan sigurdsson who had first started the inquiry into the financial relations of the two countries and in articles published in nye fellows grit had thoroughly discussed the question was a member and submitted a report of his own he held that iceland should receive yearly the sum of one hundred and nineteen thousand seven hundred and twenty four rigs dollar in lieu of interest due on icelandic funds in the general treasury and that the icelanders should pay proportionately their share of the royal appanages of the expenses connected with the administration of the joint affairs of the realm two other members the icelander Adgir Stevenson and the Dane Major Tershurning proposed a yearly payment to Iceland of twenty nine thousand five hundred rigs dollar and later an additional twelve thousand five hundred rigs dollar for a period of ten years after which time the payments should be reduced five hundred rigs dollar a year. A third report by the two Danes Bjering and Nutshorn proposed the payment of twelve thousand rigs dollar a year and in addition yearly payments of thirty thousand rigs dollar for a period of six years after which time these payments should be reduced two thousand rigs dollar a year 
all members of the committee agreed that the separation of the icelandic finances from those of denmark would be very desirable but that this matter could be settled only in conjunction with the constitutional question the old thing again petitioned the king that as soon as possible he would order new election of representatives to a convention to this petition the king answered in an address to the all thing june eighth eighteen sixty three that the question regarding an icelandic constitution was so closely connected with the question regarding the finances of the country that the former could not be settled except in conjunction with the latter he stated that a committee had been appointed in eighteen sixty one and had closed its labors in eighteen sixty two that the ministry of justice and the ministry of finance would now deliberate regarding the financial question neither the question of the constitution nor that of finances was submitted to the all thing of eighteen sixty three the attempt of the government to unite the duchies of Schleswig holstein more firmly with the rest of the danish monarchy by granting a constitution for the whole realm met with strong opposition from the european powers so strong was the pressure brought to bear on denmark in favor of the german population of the duchies that on november sixth eighteen fifty eight the government annulled the constitution so far as it applied to holstein and Lorenburg the leaders who desired a strongly consolidated monarchy now planned to unite schlesberg with denmark with the eider river as the southern border of the realm this program proved equally unwelcome to the powers especially to the german states but the government would make no further concessions on september twenty eighth eighteen sixty three a joint constitution for denmark and schlesberg was submitted to the Rysrod the assembly approved it but before it could be signed king frederick the seventh died and was was succeeded by christian the ninth november fifteenth eighteen sixty four both prussia and russia had protested against the new constitution but the king signed it under pressure of a strong public sentiment in his kingdom as a result the united armies of prussia and austria entered the duchies in the war which followed eighteen sixty four denmark was defeated and had to cede schleswig holstein and Laurenburg, about two-fifths of the area and population of the realm thus vanished suddenly the hope of the danish leaders of a strong centralized monarchy the problem now confronting them was to save their country from utter collapse with this in view the settlement of the constitutional question had to be undertaken on the basis of the change condition in the realm the all thing had repeatedly sent petitions to the king and government in an effort to bring about a solution of the constitutional controversy but these were always denied the reasons assigned were either that no general settlement of the relation between the various parts of the realm had yet been effected or that the constitutional question could not be solved so long as the financial problems still remained unsettled as in the answers returned in eighteen sixty one and eighteen sixty three but the change in national affairs after eighteen sixty four made the government more willing to listen to the supplications of the icelanders in eighteen sixty five the king submitted to the all thing a law proposing a settlement of the financial question the promise being given that as soon as this matter was arranged the question of a constitution would be considered according to this proposal iceland was to receive forty two thousand rigs dollar a year for twelve years after that time the danish rigs dog should fix the amount to be paid this proposal was rejected and the all thing demanded that a constitutional convention should be assembled to frame a constitution for iceland containing provisions for the settlement of the financial question on july twenty eighth eighteen sixty six a revised danish constitution prepared by a committee of the the Riggsrad under the direction of the ministry was signed by the king iceland was not mentioned her relation to denmark remained as undefined as before no constitutional convention was called in iceland as requested but through the efforts of hilmar finsen stip Mathur of iceland a grandson of bishop hannes finsen the question of a constitution for iceland was nevertheless 
brought a step nearer its solution in eighteen sixty seven the government submitted to the althing a draft of a constitution proposing that iceland should have its own legislative assembly and the management of its local administration the supervision of icelandic affairs should be placed in the hands of one of the ministers of the king's cabinet the old thing should meet once every three years it should consist of one chamber and should have the same number of representatives as before in framing laws regarding the common affairs of the realm iceland should have no voice such laws should only be published to become effective the proposal as a whole was favorably received but amendments to various provisions were submitted according to which the old thing should meet once every two years the bicameral system should be established and the number of representatives increased regarding the position of iceland in the realm the althing held that instead of making iceland a part of the kingdom of denmark as proposed in the submitted draft it should be a part of the danish monarchy with individual rights as a distinct part of the realm the question as to what amount iceland should contribute to the general budget should not be decided by the king alone as proposed in the government draft but by the king in conjunction with the all thing and finally it was demanded that the officials in charge of administrative affairs in iceland should be made responsible to the all thing regarding the financial settlement the government proposed to pay iceland a yearly sum of thirty seven thousand five hundred rigs dollar and twelve thousand five hundred for a period of twelve years the latter sum to be diminished by five hundred rigs dollar a year the old thing on the other hand asked a yearly sum of sixty thousand rigs dollar it is evident that the old thing in suggesting the amendments sought to be as moderate as possible and it was hoped that they would be accepted by the government the difference between the proposals regarding the financial settlement was so small that in eighteen sixty eight a motion was introduced in the danish rigsdag to grant iceland a permanent yearly sum of fifty thousand rigs dollar and a ten thousand dollar annuity for a period of years if negotiations had been continued in a conciliatory spirit a final agreement could probably have been reached but some of the danish leaders had not yet learned that a union founded on mutual goodwill is stronger and more enduring than an artificial compact of constitutional provisions based on distrust and injured national sentiment the bill proposing a settlement of the icelandic financial question did not pass orla lehman a fiery patriotic danish leader more noted for his eloquence than for discretion and for political sagacity said in discussing the measure that it had perhaps never happened before that one had to beg and beseech a people yes even promise them money in order to move them to accept their liberty and the fedre landed a leading danish paper stated that the honor of adding the picture of a codfish to the danish coat of arms and to maintain the union with an old norwegian colony was dearly paid for the attitude of the danish leaders toward iceland was still that of dictation from above and hostile opposition to its national aspirations after the opening of the all things session in eighteen sixty nine the government commissioner disputed the right of the three members to, to their seats in the assembly one of these being jan sigurdsson who had constantly been re-elected from the same district and who had repeatedly served as president of the all thing with the exception of one member who did not vote the representatives unanimously resolved to seat the three members and jan sigurdsson was again elected president of the assembly the danish rigsdag continued to discuss icelandic affairs and to propose plans for establishing the relation between the two countries without consulting the icelanders in eighteen sixty nine a new law defining the relation of iceland to the realm was submitted to the all thing together with the constitution outlining the administration of icelandic local affairs but both proposals were rejected as wholly unacceptable a bill was then passed by the danish rigsdag january two eighteen seventy one defining iceland's relation to the realm it declared that iceland was an inalienable part of the danish kingdom but that it should have its own government in purely domestic affairs the royal treasury should grant iceland an annuity of thirty thousand rigs dollar and an additional twenty thousand rigs dollar for ten years the latter sum to decrease by one thousand rigs dollar yearly until it ceased to be paid 
the danish hoesterit should be the highest judicial tribunal but in other respects the domestic suits should be separated from those of denmark as this law was to become effective april one eighteen seventy one it was evident that it could not be submitted to the all thing that the question was to be settled without reference to the wish of the icelanders a procedure which would violate even the constitutional right of that assembly to act as an advisory body when the all thing met in eighteen seventy one it received notice of the passage of this law and the draft of a constitution was also submitted the committee appointed to consider these measures returned two reports the majority held that the law of eighteen seventy one did not concern the icelanders as it was only a danish proclamation the constitutional draft was also found to be unsatisfactory especially the features that the icelandic minister should reside in copenhagen and that the highest official in iceland should be responsible to him and not to the all thing some amendments were therefore proposed the most important being the highest executive official should reside in iceland and should be responsible to the all thing the minority agreed with the majority on most points and as they hoped to bring about a settlement of the constitutional controversy they maintained an attitude of compromise and reconciliation they would not refuse to accept the law of eighteen seventy one and would be satisfied with a minister residing in copenhagen the majority report was adopted by the all thing but the minority report was also submitted the government would not accept the proposals of the all thing and decided to let the matter rest for a while the arbitrary spirit in which the danish authorities continued to deal with icelandic affairs could only increase the bitterness of the struggle and strengthen the icelandic opposition ordinances were passed without paying any attention to the all thing judges of the icelandic superior court were appointed without consulting the icelanders in eighteen seventy two a new office that of lands of inga or governor of iceland was created without consulting the althing or the wishes of the people acts of this kind showed that the old bureaucratic despotism though moved by good intention and draped in new constitutional forms had not yet been regenerated by a truly democratic spirit before a real settlement of the controversy could be effected the old bureaucracy would have to learn to bow to the will of the people and do homage to the spirit of a new age the growing discontent in iceland found expression in numerous petitions addressed to the king upholding the all thing and denouncing the law of eighteen seventy one numerous local meetings were also convened to discuss the pending questions and to express the demand for an autonomous local government a society of friends of the people was organized to defend the country's rights and to further its interests with all available means the press of the country was divided into two camps the two oldest and most widely read papers the the your fur and the ne Anfari, as well as the ne fellas grit founded by jan sigurdsson and the gangu rofer edited by the poet jan olofsson championed the national cause without compromise while the paper timmin founded in eighteen seventy one was more neutral and the vic Vergi, founded in eighteen seventy three was a government organ edited by paul melsted councillor in the superior court and jan jansen secretary of the land show Ingi. the government threatened the editor of the the orfer jan Gubmanson, councillor in the superior court that his lawyer's permit would be revoked jan olofsson editor of the balder and later of the gangu lofer was repeatedly prosecuted and fined but the fines were always paid by his patriot friends until finally he was forced to leave iceland to avoid new prosecutions and his paper ceased to appear the north Thunfari advocated that the icelanders should try to enlist the sympathy of other nations or seek union with some other country if they failed in this attempt they should emigrate to america to escape the oppression of danish overlordship brazil and north america were praised as lands of freedom and a movement of emigration was set on foot which soon carried thousands of icelanders to the united states and canada after eighteen seventy this emigration continued to grow from year to year but it must be ascribed to economic rather than to political conditions as most of the emigrants were poor people from impoverished districts where suffering was general
in eighteen seventy four a millennial festival was to be celebrated in iceland in commemoration of the colonization of the country a farmer suggested that this festival should be made an occasion of national mourning and farewell of an emigrating people a provost in the church of iceland wrote begging the people to wait one more year to see if the king would grant the long-expected constitution for this great event and to leave the country only if this last hope was disappointed societies were founded the members of which pledged themselves not to taste distilled liquors in order that the government might not derive any revenue from these on new year's night the students of reykjavik marched through the streets singing the icelandinga brager a biddle political poem because it thought of the poet jan olafsson had been prosecuted demonstrations were also made in front of the home of the stiptem mothler hillman finson on april one eighteen seventy three the day on which he was to assume the new office of landschofingi a black flag was found fastened to the flagpole in front of his house bearing the inscription down with the landschofingi so bitter was the popular feeling that no one ventured to show him any public attention on june twenty sixth eighteen seventy three a public assembly was convened at thingvellir consisting of thirty-five representatives from the various districts of iceland members of the althing and many people from all iceland came to attend this meeting among others also jan sigurdsson who arrived from copenhagen jan gudmundsson was elected chairman of the meeting and only the chosen representatives could have the right to vote nineteen petitions from various districts regarding the constitutional question were submitted the committee appointed to consider these drafted a complete outline of a constitution declaring among other things that iceland was a free and independent country united with denmark under a common king and that a bill should become a law when it had been passed three times by the all thing unaltered even if the king did not sign it jan sigurdsson and jan gudmundsson opposed these declarations strongly they argued that such a plan could not be carried out that iceland could be a free country even if it had some things in common with denmark to those who understood affairs of government it seemed dangerous to break completely with denmark danish merchants have indeed oppressed the icelanders said the speakers but if we had established close relations with other nations the situation would probably not have been different the first draft of a petition to be submitted to the king expressed strongly the excited feelings of the people but the arguments of sigurdsson and gudmundsson made such impression that a new draft was prepared in a more modified tone even this was so radical that jan sigurdsson refused to present it and jan gudmundsson agreed to do so only if it received the sanction of the all thing it was feared that the strong party feeling which had developed during this period of excitement would bring about violent clashes within the all thing when it again assembled but instead the men representing different views sought to become reconciled and an unexpected unanimity prevailed in the assembly it was agreed to ask the king to grant the country a constitution which would give the all thing full legislative power and control of icelandic finances in answer to this petition the king issued a constitution june five eighteen seventy four granting legislative power to the all thing and establishing self-government for iceland in domestic affairs the manner in which this constitution and the law of eighteen seventy one were issued did not please the icelanders as they were not allowed to participate in the framing of the new fundamental laws except in so far as they had expressed their wishes in petitions to the king on many points the measures did not grant what the people desired but the most important demands had nevertheless been realized the icelanders were given control of their own finances the number of representatives and the all thing was increased and the bicameral system was established the all thing was to consist of thirty-six members six appointed by the king and thirty elected by the people the upper house every deed should have twelve members six appointed by the king and six chosen by the elected members from their own number the remaining twenty-four representatives constituted the lower house or nephri deald the assembly was to meet on the first workday in july in reykjavik every other year for six weeks special sessions could be called at the king's pleasure the king could also dissolve the all thing and order new elections no bill could become a law without his signature bills might be introduced in either branch of the assembly and the parliamentary procedure was to be the same as in other modern legislative bodies 
the executive power in domestic affairs, who was not made responsible to the offing but to the minister for icelandic affairs in copenhagen iceland was not represented in the rigsdag had no voice in the general affairs of the realm and paid no part of the national expenditures the lutheran church was recognized as the state church the liberty of conscience was granted to all inhabitants titles and privileges of nobility were abolished sanctity of the home security of private property freedom from forced labor freedom of the press of association and assembly and rights of municipal government were guaranteed the icelandic government was thus very limited in power the king's absolute veto in legislation and the responsibility of the governor to a minister residing in copenhagen were especially objectionable features much would depend on the good will of the land show Fingdinge and the minister and the extent to which they would respect the decisions of the all thing the new election law passed september fourteen eighteen seventy seven divided the country into nineteen election districts of which eight elected one representative each the others two suffrage was granted to all male citizens not servants twenty-five years of age who had lived one year in the election district and were paying a tax of eight kroner a year as farmers or citizens of towns or as peasants were paying a yearly tax of twelve kroner further also to all graduates of the university of copenhagen and of the theological seminary and medical school of reykjavik eligible to office were all voters thirty years of age who had resided in the european part of the danish realm for a period of five years the millennial festival could now be celebrated as an event of rejoicing over the new era of autonomy and national progress to which the icelanders could look hopefully forward as the constitution should become effective august one eighteen seventy four the celebration arranged for this occasion would have the double purpose of commemorating the thousandth anniversary of the settlement of the country and of inaugurating a new national government this great event was made memorable also by the visit of the king of denmark christian the ninth who sailed to iceland to take part in the festivities and bring the people his personal greetings delegations from many foreign lands from sweden norway france germany and the united states and england also arrived in reykjavik on august two commemorative services were held in the cathedral where bishop peter peterson preached the american poet bayard taylor who was present on this occasion writes lights were burning in the chandeliers on the altar and between the gallery pillars wreaths of heather decorated the walls choirs and galleries and there was a glow of flowers around thorvaldsen's baptismal font the dull red of the walls and dark panels of the wooden ceiling harmonized well with these simple adornments the building wore an aspect of cheerful solemnity becoming at the occasion the seats filled rapidly during the chant men and women sitting together as they could find places then the service commenced after the ancient lutheran fashion in fact it was nearly an exact repetition of that which we have seen in thornshaven except that the icelandic language was used the hymns were simply and grandly sung and the psalm of praise written by matthias jokinson and composed by svein bjornsson the first musical work by a native icelander i am told produced a powerful effect in whichever direction i looked i saw eyes filled with tears the repetition of the refrain islands pace under islands thousand years rang through the cathedral in tones which were solemn rather than proud and gave expression to the earnest religious spirit in which the people had come together the services were followed by a banquet in the hall of the college where the king spoke expressing the hope that the people would be satisfied with the constitution he had granted them and closing with the toast long live old iceland the band struck in with the cheers that followed and the ships thundered their salute from the harbor in the evening a popular festival was celebrated on the hill of Askjulith, near the city a rostrum for speaking had been erected a tent for the king and two thousand people were assembled an elaborate program was carried out with singing and speaking admiral lagerkrantz spoke for sweden the author nor dahl rothson for norway and bayard taylor for the united states the formal part of the program was followed by popular merry-making consisting of dancing and fireworks the king and his party and the foreign representatives also visited the geysers of iceland and took part in a public festival at thingbeller where greetings were read from the universities of copenhagen 
Uppsala, Lund, and Christiania, from students' societies in Denmark and Norway, from Norwegian patriotic societies, and from the Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen, which acknowledged the great sculptor Thorvaldsen to be an Icelander. Bayard Taylor brought the greetings of America in a poem written for the occasion. At the door of the pavilion, a chorus sang a song, Mini Corins of Thing Veller, written by Matthias Jakinson. A banquet was then served, and the king and his party returned to Reykjavik. Better days had at last dawned for Iceland. Politically, the people had won recognition of their rights as a distinct nation. A new spirit of enterprise and national self-consciousness had been awakened. Economic conditions were improving, and export and import trade had increased after the commercial monopoly was abolished this shows that the export of important commodities like fish train oil meat skins feathers and eiderdown had increased extensively the decrease in the export of tallow was due to the fact that people now sold it to the fishermen instead of bringing it to the merchants in spite of the decrease in the sale of some commodities of less importance the total volume of the export trade was growing of still greater benefit to iceland was the change effected in the relation of prices between imported and exported goods in eighteen forty nine a barrel of rye flour cost eighty nine point six kilograms of dried codfish in eighteen seventy two it cost only forty four kilograms in eighteen forty nine a barrel of rye flour was in exchange for thirty nine point five pounds of wool in eighteen seventy two for fifteen point two pounds because of this favorable change in prices importation increased in value much faster than exportation and the people were better able than hitherto to procure the staple commodities the increase in number of ships arriving in icelandic harbors also shows a considerable growth in trade and intercourse during the period of eighteen fifty sixty five to eighteen seventy two the trade with denmark was decreasing while the traffic with other countries was constantly growing in eighteen seventy two many ships from england and scotland also began to arrive in iceland to purchase horses an article of export which from this time forth became of increasing importance reykjavik had now become the chief trading centre in iceland with isa fjord as second in rank another evidence of the general progress was the steady growth of population in eighteen seventy iceland had seventy thousand thirty one inhabitants an increase of three thousand forty three since eighteen sixty end of chapter sixteen part two chapter seventeen of history of iceland by knut gyurset this librivox recording is in the public domain realism in icelandic literature modern intellectual life in iceland the year eighteen seventy four when iceland received its constitution and entered upon a new era of national development coincided very closely with the beginning of a new period of european political and intellectual life following the franco-prussian war of eighteen seventy to eighteen seventy one that eventful conflict between the two leading european nations dispelled the romanticism which had hitherto remained bound up with the memory of napoleon's military glory and the resplendent greatness of france the war shattered the napoleonic empire and taught the world a new military science but it also created the bloody conflict in paris between the old social order and militant communism and turned the mind of europe to new political and social problems new forces also made themselves felt in european life and thought the woman's movement raised the demand for women's rights socialistic ideas were spreading and international labor unions were organized the darwinian theory of evolution expounded and popularized by able writers like thomas huxley and herbert spencer offered a new explanation of man's life and his relation to the universe in such an age people naturally felt that they were not living in the realms of dreams but in a practical world with difficult problems which awaited their solution 
the inquiring and critical spirit of the age found its expression in a realistic literary movement and a literary criticism based on the new views which soon rendered archaic the romanticism of the earlier decades of the nineteenth century in iceland the new realistic literary movement began to develop about eighteen eighty the leaders of this movement were the icelandic students in copenhagen who had come under the influence of georg brandis the chief representative of this school of thought in denmark in eighteen seventy one brandis began a series of lectures at the university of copenhagen later published under the title the main currents of the nineteenth century literature romanticism and the old views were sharply assailed and the most radical ideas in politics religion philosophy and literature were advanced christian faith and national patriotism were considered antiquated remnants of an unscientific age destined to disappear in the broad daylight of modern scientific inquiry in contradistinction to the nationalists the adherents of the new movement called themselves europeans and affected an air of superiority because of their scientific reasoning and cosmopolitan views all established tenets and institutions all relations in family society and state were subjected to a searing scrutiny all human problems were discussed in this new literature which aimed to picture life as it really is most of the young authors in denmark norway and sweden were soon found in the ranks of the realists and it was natural that the icelandic students in copenhagen should also join in the new movement as the periodical Fjolner had been founded as the special organ of the romanticists a new periodical Ver Fondi was founded by the four young authors berthel e o thurleifsson einar kajor leifsson gesture pallison and hannes hafstein to champion the new realistic views the first number contained the poem storm by hannes hafstein the very fine short story kajor leek schemilleth by gesture pallison and another short story up og nither by einar a your leafson productions of great excellence but the verthandi lived only one year he was succeeded by two new journals suthi published in reykjavik eighteen eighty three to eighteen eighty seven and heimdallur published in copenhagen eighteen eighty four but these two died soon in the larger european countries realism performed a useful mission by making literature a weapon in the hands of social reformers but in iceland where no class distinction industrial conflicts or social problems existed it could be nothing but a new literary style little understood or appreciated by the people the cosmopolitan atmosphere and pessimistic critical attitude which characterized the realists was little suited to solve the problems which confronted the icelanders the reawakening of the old national spirit the romantic love of their own country the pride in their ancient traditions the confidence in their ability to make iceland as prosperous as it is beautiful fostered by the devoted enthusiasm of the romanticists had accomplished great things for iceland the critical and often negative realists could bring no such encouraging message in their effort to picture conditions in their naked reality they could only point to the shady side of life the poverty and discouraging economic conditions the solace and encouragement found in the christian faith they usually discarded the greatness of past ages they regarded as idle fancies the pessimism and discontent fostered by this attitude could only tend to swell the number of emigrants who at this time were yearly leaving iceland some of the realist leaders themselves setting the example of emigrants migrating to america but although realism could have no direct mission in iceland as a regenerating social force it has been of great importance to modern icelandic literature and intellectual life to the realists is due in a great measure the development of the modern icelandic novel though it had begun to flourish before their time through their discussion of present-day conditions they have fostered among their people a better understanding of the modern world with its complex social life so necessary to all deeper analysis of human life in our age 
by discarding the rather grandiose style of the romanticists they have given literary production a sombre and critical spirit but also a cosmopolitan character which reaches beyond the purely local and national and makes the icelandic novel and drama of to-day distinct contributions to the twentieth century literary art the foremost novelists of the new school were gestar palsen eighteen fifty two to eighteen ninety one jonas jonasson eighteen fifty six to nineteen eighteen and einar jor leifsen born december nine eighteen fifty nine gesture paulsen pursued the study of theology at the university of copenhagen but left without taking his final examinations returning to iceland in eighteen eighty two for some years he published the paper Su three in eighteen ninety he emigrated to america settling in winnipeg canada here he became editor of the icelandic paper heimskringla but died at an early age in eighteen ninety one in his novels and short stories he pictures icelandic life and social conditions with great force and clearness dwelling especially on the misery of the poor and the greed hypocrisy and egoism of the well-to-do the leaders in society who pretend to promote the general welfare when they are only furthering their own interests are made to feel the sting of his bitter irony his delineation of character is striking and his psychological analysis of great mental struggles are true and artistically wrought his novels have been translated into german danish norwegian english and bohemian jonas jonasson was a very productive novelist devoting himself chiefly to the picturing of social conditions in ancient and modern times einar hyor leifsson attracted attention as a story-writer even while attending the latin school in eighteen eighty five he emigrated to america becoming associate editor of the icelandic paper heimskringla in winnipeg canada later he served as editor of the icelandic weekly the logberg of the same city from eighteen eighty eight till eighteen ninety five when he returned to iceland he is one of the most noted and influential of icelandic writers since nineteen ten he has received a government stipend for literary work among younger icelandic novelists may be mentioned gudmundur magnusson better known by his pseudonym jan trausti eighteen seventy three to nineteen eighteen who also received an author's stipend from the government benedict bjornsson born eighteen seventy nine and gunnar gunnarsson born eighteen eighty nine hannes halfstein one of the founders of the verthandi is an idealist and a gifted lyric poet but as he became one of the leading statesmen of iceland he has accomplished less in literature than he otherwise might have done as he has been chiefly occupied with political questions in a busy public life among the foremost lyric poets of this school was thorsten erlingson eighteen fifty eight to nineteen fourteen for a time teacher in copenhagen in religion he was an evolutionist in political views a radical his poems were written to serve as a vehicle for his radical and evolutionistic political and social views einar benedictson born eighteen sixty four is a lyric poet of great power in nineteen o three he organized the political party known as the land varnar floker or party of national defense which deposed the amendment to the constitution proposed by the government since nineteen o seven he has lived abroad usually in england the icelandic dramatic literature has found able representatives in johan sigurd jansen eighteen eighty to nineteen nineteen and gud munder kamben born in eighteen eighty eight both have written dramas which have been played with success also in many foreign lands in the field of religious literature valdemar briam born february one eighteen forty eight has distinguished himself as one of the great hymn writers in the north since nineteen o nine he has been vice-bishop of the skalholt diocese he was a member of the committee appointed to prepare a new hymn-book also of the committee on ritual for the icelandic church Briam has written many collections of hymns in eighteen eighty six the committee of which he was a member gave iceland a new hymn-book of the six hundred and fifty hymns which it contains one hundred and forty two are by him the hymn-book edited by magnus stevenson in seventeen eighty one had been in use till eighteen seventy one when a revised edition was published this was superseded in eighteen eighty six by the new hymn-book which is still in use in nineteen twelve appeared a new bible translation the first icelandic bible translation from the original texts the translation of the old testament was done by haraldur nielsen professor of theology in the university of reykjavik the new testament 
was translated by bishop thor holler or yarn narson jan helgeson professor of theology in the university of reykjavik and eiriker Briam, instructor in the same university the cost of publishing was defrayed by the english bible society in the various fields of learning the icelanders have shown increased productivity during this period in history archaeology mathematics and natural science they have able writers in philology and northern antiquities they have especially distinguished themselves a noted scholar in this field was Eirikur magnuson born eighteen thirty three and educated at the theological school in reykjavik in eighteen sixty two he went to england to superintend the publication of an icelandic bible translation was appointed assistant librarian at the university of cambridge and became m a of trinity college in eighteen ninety three in england he devoted himself especially to the translation and publication of old icelandic literature his chief work of this kind was the saga library saga translations by Eriker magnusson and william morris published in london in eighteen ninety he has written articles on northern mythology and antiquities in various publications also articles dealing with political and social conditions in his own country Finner jansen born at akurairi in northern iceland in 1858 became instructor and finally professor of icelandic language and literature in the university of copenhagen and has long been regarded as one of the greatest scholars in this field of his numerous works on literature history and philology may be mentioned den old norske og ildeslandske litteratur i history a compendious and scholarly work in three volumes he has been knighted and is a member of many literary and learned societies bjorn m olsen a distinguished scholar was born in northern iceland july fourteenth eighteen fifty died january sixteenth nineteen nineteen after completing his studies at the university of copenhagen he travelled in italy and greece upon his return home he became teacher in the latin school at reykjavik and in eighteen ninety five he was chosen rector of that institution from nineteen eleven until nineteen eighteen he was professor in the university of reykjavik of which institution he became the first rector he has written many works on literary and philological subjects voltier goodmanson born in eighteen sixty is also a noted philologist since eighteen ninety he has been professor in the university of copenhagen in eighteen ninety six he visited the united states at the invitation of mrs cornelia horsford to examine ruins in massachusetts supposed to be of norse origin he has written many works dealing with northern antiquities of icelandic historians must be mentioned bogey the melsted a grandson of the poet bjarni thorarinson born in eighteen sixty he is the author of many works among others of icelanden saga a large history of iceland of which two volumes have appeared he resides in copenhagen and receives a stipend from the icelandic government for continuing his historical research jan jansen eighteen sixty nine to nineteen twenty also received a stipend as historian from the icelandic government from nineteen eleven he was professor of history in the university of reykjavik his works on the history of iceland are many among others may be mentioned his iceland saga a short history of iceland jan thorgerson the younger born in eighteen fifty nine editor of diplomatarium islandicum is director of the national archives in reykjavik and one of the founders of the icelandic historical society of his historical works may be mentioned om dignengen pa island edet fifteen de og sixteen odd r hundred eighteen eighty eight and saga jorundar hunda dags kong so eighteen ninety two in the field of art little had been accomplished in iceland till the latter part of the nineteenth century in earlier times the icelanders had skilled wood carvers tapestry weavers and metal workers as can be seen from numerous articles in the reykjavik museum in the national museum in copenhagen and in the nordiska musette in stockholm but these activities had gradually declined owing no doubt to the poverty and general misery prevalent in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries but the new intellectual awakening and improved economic conditions revived also the long neglected artistic talents of the people and there is now a prospect of a rich contribution of modern icelandic art sigurdur 
goodmanson eighteen thirty three to eighteen seventy four was a talented painter he founded the reykjavik national museum and devoted himself to the history of art especially of his own country these activities consumed so much of his time that he found little opportunity to produce original works of his own but he rendered valuable service by rekindling the love of art among his countrymen thorarin thorlaksen and asgrimur jansen have shown great talent especially as painters of icelandic landscapes einar jansen born in eighteen seventy four is iceland's first sculptor many of his works as dawn evolution emir og ad humla and monument to queen victoria have attracted wide attention he has also sculptured monuments of jonas Hallgrimson, jan sigerson king christian the ninth and ingolf arnarson probably his greatest production is the outlaw in which he is delineated with powerful realism in the facial expression of the central figure as well as in the composition of the whole group the tragedy of hopeless struggle against the curse of a people pursuing the offender even into the recesses of an uninhabitable wilderness with face set in defiance but furrowed with anxiety the outlaw carries on his back the body of his dead wife to inter her remains in consecrated soil his right hand rests on a spade on his left arm he carries his child wrapped in a sheepskin clinging to him confidingly in its helplessness and his shaggy half-starved dog follows him with a shy and wondering look the agony of suffering and hopeless loneliness could scarcely be more pathetically portrayed the icelandic state has brought the sculptor's works to iceland where they are preserved as a treasure of national art in music the icelanders have made great progress since the middle of the nineteenth century before that time little had been done to cultivate this art the church hymns were sung in a primitive way to the earliest old melodies of musical instruments only a few crude string instruments were in use especially the langspil peter gud jansen eighteen twelve to eighteen seventy seven and jonas helgeson eighteen thirty nine to nineteen o three both organists in the cathedral in reykjavik did much to create interest both in vocal and instrumental music organs are now found in nearly all icelandic churches played by organists who have studied music in reykjavik in the towns pianos are found in the homes of the more well-to-do and the guitar and violin are in common use of late years icelandic composers have appeared the most prominent being svein bjorn svein born in eighteen forty seven for a long time a resident of edinburgh scotland his compositions with english texts have been published there of other icelandic composers may be mentioned bjarni thor steinson born eighteen sixty one sigfus einarsson arni thor steinson jan fried jansen and Heilge helgeson the system of public education has of late years been brought to a very high state of completeness and efficiency in iceland a school of jurisprudence was established in nineteen o eight in nineteen eleven the school and those of medicine and theology were consolidated into the university of iceland and a department of philosophy was added on june seventeenth of that year this university was dedicated with fitting ceremonies of other institutions of learning there is one latin school or college located at reykjavik two popular high schools four agricultural schools and one nautical school the facilities for study and research have also been greatly increased the national library in reykjavik containing rich stores of the best books of all lands together with large manuscript collections has continued to grow until it is now the most complete collection of icelandic books in the world the national archives covering the last two hundred years of icelandic history are also very complete the national antiquarian museum in reykjavik contains a collection of more than five thousand five hundred articles and the natural history museum founded in eighteen eighty nine contains nearly all specimens of fishes plants and birds in iceland also in the field of vocational training able instruction has been provided and great progress has been made the industrial exposition in reykjavik in nineteen eleven showed broven tapestries and hand-carved articles of wood and whalebone wrought with rare taste and skill of workmanship showing that these old arts in which the people used to excel in earlier ages are being revived under the stimulus of a new intellectual awakening and social development which has placed iceland among the most progressive as well as the most enlightened of modern nations 
End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of history of iceland by knut gjurset this librivox recording is in the public domain the struggle for independence iceland proclaimed a sovereign state recent economic development the constitution granted in eighteen seventy four contained many features distasteful to the icelanders it was accepted as a first instalment of liberty in the hope that new concessions could be obtained later but it was evident that the people were not satisfied with an autonomy so imperfectly accomplished it is said that the first time king christian the ninth met jan sigurdsson after the millennial festivities he asked him if the icelanders were satisfied with the constitution to which sigurdsson replied that since the chief wish of the icelanders had not been granted his majesty could not expect them to be satisfied this answer expressed very pointedly the relation existing between the two countries no one could doubt that the constitutional struggle would be renewed though king and government were sure to falter at every step towards a more perfect democracy the icelanders wished their administration to be entrusted to native officials residing in reykjavik but it was still directed from copenhagen no minister for icelandic affairs had ever been appointed as provided in the constitution the management of these matters had been left to the danish minister of justice who had often advised the king to veto bills passed by the all thing when jan sigurdsson died in eighteen seventy nine his able lieutenant benedict Sveinsson, at one time associate justice of the lands and later sis lu mather of thinge yarsle reopened the constitutional conflict by proposing in eighteen eighty one a revision of the constitution according to the plan submitted both the office of lands show thingy and that of minister for iceland were to be abolished and an icelandic administrative government was to be created in reykjavik consisting of a viceroy with a ministry of not more than three members appointed by himself but responsible to the all thing to become law all bills passed by the all thing had to be signed by the king or by the viceroy who should exercise full royal power constitutional amendments should be signed by the king in person the ministers if accused should be tried by a special tribunal consisting of some members of the upper branch of the althing and the justice of the lands of etter or highest icelandic court all members of the althing thirty-six in number should be popularly chosen and a supreme court of appeal was to be created for iceland this proposed revision was submitted to every session of the althing till eighteen ninety five it was always passed by the lower branch but met determined opposition in the upper branch it was at last passed by two succeeding all things as provided in the constitution that is eighteen eighty five and eighteen eighty six eighteen ninety three and eighteen ninety four but it was promptly vetoed by the king in the reasons for the royal veto submitted in november two eighteen eighty five it was stated that it would be a violation of the danish constitution and of iceland's position as an inseparable part of the danish kingdom furthermore the proposed changes would also entail too big expenses for so poor a country as iceland the more moderate political leaders in seeking a way out of the difficulty began to consider acceptable compromises in eighteen eighty nine sigurdur stephenson jan jensen ira kerr Briam, and paul Briam framed such a compromise the mythlon patterned on the government of the dominion of canada but it was not passed by the all thing in the session of eighteen ninety five the majority of the members resolved to drop the old revision plan which was again submitted in its place a resolution was passed requesting the government to submit a plan for revision but this request was also rejected by the government among the people great confusion prevailed some were in favor of continuing the struggle along the lines hitherto followed others thought that this would be useless because of the determined opposition of the government but all agreed that the existing conditions could no longer be tolerated 
in eighteen ninety seven voltier gudmundsson professor in the university of copenhagen who had been elected member of the all thing submitted a compromise plan in order to shape an issue which might gain general support according to this plan nearly all the main provisions in the constitution were to be retained but a minister for iceland capable of speaking the icelandic language should have a seat in the all thing should take part in its deliberations and should be responsible to it for all his official acts this provision however if carried through would bring about a greater change than at first apparent as it would virtually establish parliamentary government it is therefore quite noteworthy that the government agreed to accept the plan the bill was passed in the upper branch of the offing but in the lower branch it was defeated by a majority of three votes in eighteen ninety nine it was again passed by the upper branch but failed to pass in the lower the plan did not provide for an icelandic administration in Reykjavik, as the icelandic minister should remain in copenhagen in consequence it failed to pass as it did not solve the constitutional question in a way satisfactory to the majority of the people the election of nineteen hundred gave the supporters of gudmundsson's bill a slight majority in nineteen o one it was introduced in the all thing for the third time in a slightly altered form and was passed by both branches the bill provided for an increase in the number of popularly chosen representatives to thirty-four eight of whom should sit in the upper branch in order that the popularly chosen representatives might be in the majority in both branches of the assembly suffrage was extended to all male citizens not servants twenty-five years of age who were paying a yearly tax of four kroner the sessions of the all things should last for two months even before the measure had been voted upon in this upper branch word was received that a liberal ministry had been formed in denmark and that a dane had been appointed minister for iceland a memorial was therefore addressed to the king stating that a fully satisfactory solution of the constitutional question could be reached only when the icelanders received a government of their own residing in reykjavik to this memorial the king returned a very favorable answer saying that the desired modifications of the constitution among others also that a minister for iceland capable of speaking the icelandic language and taking part in the deliberations of the all thing would be granted that a government proposal would be submitted to the next session of that assembly containing a plan for establishing an icelandic ministry in reykjavik in the next election the home rule party was victorious the government proposal providing for an icelandic minister residing in reykjavik was submitted to the all thing and was passed by both branches new elections were ordered in nineteen o three the home rule party again receiving a majority the government amendments to the constitution passed almost unanimously by the new all thing received royal sanction october three nineteen o three iceland had now received home rule the revised constitution which was to become effective february one nineteen o four abolished the office of lands show thingy likewise those of the two amtmen the icelandic minister was to reside in reykjavik he was to be able to speak and write icelandic and should take part in the deliberations of the all thing and should be responsible to it for all his official acts from time to time he should go to copenhagen to lay before the king and cabinet meeting bills and other important matters the all things should be assembled july one every other year and should remain in session eight weeks it was to consist of forty members thirty-four of whom should be elected by the people and six to be appointed by the king in organizing itself for legislative work it should divide into two branches the efri deild or upper branch to consist of fourteen members and the nethri deild or lower branch of twenty-six members male citizens not servants and paying a yearly tax of four kroner should have the right to vote mayor and sislu mother hannes Afstein was appointed minister for iceland there can be no doubt that the danish government at this time made an earnest effort to solve the constitutional controversy in a manner satisfactory to the icelanders and all hoped that political peace and good understanding would now prevail but the changing of an old conservative fundamental law to fit a new time spirit is something like the task of remodelling an old house one change necessitates another and many alterations will have to be made which at first were neither foreseen nor contemplated 
together with the provision in the revised constitution that the icelandic minister should reside in reykjavik it was stipulated that he should submit to the king at meetings of the cabinet new laws and other important matters for his signature this had been done and could easily be done so long as the minister resided in copenhagen but no provision in the constitution had existed regarding this matter already in the summer of nineteen o two before the constitutional amendments were passed anonymous writers began to oppose this provision in the revised constitution and sought to prevent its adoption a new party was formed led by judge jan jensen and the political leader bjarni jansen to oppose this feature of the revision program this new group calling themselves landvarnar floker or party of national defense soon received the support of the conservatives now calling themselves the progressive party from sok narflaker who also were opposed to the minister this opposition to the new administration became as formidable as it was determined the cry was raised that through the revised constitution iceland had been incorporated in the danish kingdom that the law of eighteen seventy one regarding iceland's relation to the realm had been accepted vigorous objection was also raised because the danish authorities had signed the appointment of afstein as icelandic minister as this indicated that they still wished to exert influence on purely icelandic affairs with regard to the provision in the constitution that bills passed by the offing should be submitted to the king in cabinet meeting it was demanded that icelandic affairs should be separated from those of denmark and should not be laid before the king in the meeting of the whole cabinet as this would give his danish advisers the right to deliberate and decide on purely icelandic matters and would still make the icelandic government subservient to the danish authorities up till nineteen o four the danes had always taken for granted that iceland was an integral part of the danish kingdom even when important concessions were made to the icelanders in their struggle for national autonomy it had been assumed that no other relation could exist between the two countries to this view the icelanders had never acceded as a rule they held the view of their great leader jan sigurdsson who had made it clear that after the king had renounced his absolute power the gamli sat mali was the sole remaining union agreement according to this view the more aggressive leaders claimed that only a confederate union existed between denmark and iceland as had been established between norway and iceland in twelve sixty two we have seen that according to the gamli sit mali the icelanders were to retain their own laws and institutions their national assembly and full control of their own affairs but they promised to receive a jarl or governor-general appointed by the king to act as his deputy it was unfortunate that the danish statesmen should have become so attached to the idea of the unity of the realm as to insist that under all circumstances iceland must be considered an integral part of the danish kingdom they had already made great concessions to the national aspiration of the icelanders but their theory gave offence the struggle was carried into the realm of principle like the taxation controversy between the american colonies and king george the third rendering practical adjustments difficult in the light of such a theory the icelanders could only view all bonds which united them with denmark as fetters designed to keep them in a state of inferiority and subjugation questions were sure to arise about icelandic commerce flag and other important matters as they had done in norway and sweden under similar circumstances political peace and mutual goodwill between the two partners in the union could be established only by recognizing their essential equality no one could doubt that the struggle would continue until iceland's complete independence as a sovereign nation should be definitely acknowledged when the all thing assembled in nineteen o five the chief measure under consideration was a proposal submitted by the minister hall hafstein regarding a projected plan for telegraphic and telephone service in iceland the great northern telegraph company had agreed to lay a telegraphic cable to the faroe islands and iceland if subsidies were granted by the icelandic government in the plan submitted it was provided that such a subsidy should be granted together with funds for the construction of the telegraph and telephone lines between southern and northern iceland since eighteen ninety one this project has been discussed and a strong sentiment had been created in its favor but the opposition backed by the paper isafold began a determined fight against it in an effort to defeat the minister securing an offer from the Maconi, 
company of wireless telegraphic service to iceland they held that this would be cheaper and argued that the subsidies necessary to secure the projected cable would drain the treasury as thorough investigation finally showed that the cable would be the safest and most advantageous telegraphic connection to be secured the bill was passed october twenty eighth nineteen o five the following year a cable was laid to sadisfjord and telegraph and telephone lines were soon extended to akurairi and reykjavik the political events in norway in nineteen o five which led to the dissolution of the swedish norwegian union gave added strength to the demands of the icelanders for complete independence when frederick the eighth ascended the throne in nineteen o six he extended an invitation to the icelandic althing to visit denmark on the voyage from iceland the representatives discussed the question of iceland's position in the union and agreed on the following points a joint commission consisting of members of the danish rigsdag and the icelandic all things should be appointed to draft a new law defining iceland's position in the realm to take the place of the law of eighteen seventy one the annuity paid by denmark to iceland should be converted into a fixed sum to be paid to the icelandic treasury the name iceland should be added to the king's title so that it should henceforth read king of denmark and iceland and the appointment of a minister for iceland should be signed either by that minister himself or by his predecessor in office on july twenty ninth the althing representatives were received in the rigsdag building by a large danish delegation during their visit they set forth the plan agreed upon on the voyage this was courteously received king expressing the hope that he would be able to visit iceland the following summer on behalf of iceland the althing representatives extended a formal invitation to the king and forty members of the rigsdag and in the summer of nineteen o seven king frederick the eighth visited iceland accompanied by the rigsdag delegation shortly after his arrival a commission was appointed consisting of thirteen danes and seven icelanders to draft a new law defining iceland's position in the union but elections had not been held for some time and the members of the althing were no longer in sympathy with the prevailing political sentiment for this reason the liberal party groups demanded an election before the appointment of the commission in order that the members when appointed might represent the prevailing public opinion but minister hafstein supported by the heim ast jornormen or home rule party which favoured a strong union with denmark disregarded this demand and the icelandic members were chosen from the old all thing representation the commission assembled in copenhagen february twenty eighth nineteen o eight in may of the same year it submitted a draft of a new law defining iceland's position in the realm according to its provisions iceland should be a free and autonomous country united with denmark under a common king and through such joint matters as should be specified in the proposed law the name iceland should be inserted in the king's title as the icelanders desired the royal treasury should pay to the treasury of iceland once for all the sum of one million five hundred thousand kroner and thereby the financial question between the two countries should be settled the joint matters were to be a common king foreign affairs and defence on land and sea together with the same flag protection of the fisheries common right of citizenship and a common supreme court no treaties should be made regarding affairs in which icelanders was interested unless the icelandic government was consulted the icelanders should have the right with the consent of denmark to increase their supervision of the fisheries and territorial waters they might also grant a citizenship which should be in force in denmark and they might establish a supreme tribunal for icelandic cases if the constitutions of both countries were amended to this effect it was also provided that a judge should be appointed to the danish supreme court who possessed knowledge of the icelandic language and government affairs danes and icelanders should enjoy the same right respectively in denmark and iceland they should also have the same right to participate in the fisheries and territorial waters of the two countries but denmark should exercise protective control icelandic students should be granted stipends by preference and the icelanders in iceland should be exempt from military service when twenty-five years had elapsed after the passage of the law it should be revised if either the danish rigsdag or the icelandic althing should demand it after thirty-seven years either denmark or iceland might demand a complete separation in all matters except those of a common king foreign affairs and defence all the icelandic members of the commission with the exception of skuli thoradsen signed the draft of the proposed law 
schooley refused to sign and submitted a report of his own in which he said the icelanders will not be satisfied except it be clearly stated that iceland is a sovereign state that it controls all its affairs and stands on an equal footing with denmark only with the common king temporarily but this according to my opinion is not possible since certain affairs foreign affairs and national defence are exempted from revocation and given into the hands of the danish government so that iceland can have no part in their control or can assume management of them without asking the consent of the danish law-making assembly minister Halfstein had been one of the most active members of the commission but the opposition to the law which he had helped to frame was very determined Schooley Thoridsen's party, the from so gnar Floker, or Progressive Party, which after 1905 called itself the P. U. Thur Fis Floker, or Popular Government Party, opposed it. So did also the Land Varnar Floker, or National Defense Party, led by Judge Jan Jensen and Bjarni Jansen, these parties feared that the new law, according to which Iceland should still be a part of the Danish kingdom, would only rivet more firmly the chains which bound them to Denmark. Iceland was not to have her own flag, and the request that Icelandic affairs should not be considered in meetings of the Danish cabinet had not been granted. In their opinion, the new law would only be a covenant, giving sanction and permanence to existing conditions, only a compromise which would be sure to retard the work for national independence together the two parties had called a convention at thingbella june twenty ninth nineteen o seven this assembly passed resolutions demanding that the covenant to be established between denmark and iceland regarding the relation of the two countries should expressly acknowledge the iceland to be a free country united with denmark under a joint king and possessing full equality with the danish kingdom and full sovereign control over its own affairs it was further to be understood that this covenant could be abrogated by either party to the compact a proposal was also adopted that iceland should have its own flag consisting of a white cross on a blue field resolutions were passed protesting against any covenant falling short of these demands stating that nothing but complete separation of the two countries was possible if such conditions were not granted after this meeting the popular government party still led by scully thoridsen called itself the Svalf stead thur floker or independence party and its political program became complete separation from denmark jan jensen one of the leaders of the land or nor floker or party of national defence now left his party and gave his support to minister Halfstein and the heimmast jornar men or home rule party but the land var nor floker led by bjarni jansen continued to oppose Halfstein. a violent agitation against the proposed law was begun supported by the paper isafold and its able editor bjorn jansen in the elections held september tenth nineteen o eight the first in iceland in which the australian system of secret ballot was used the opponents of the proposed measure were victorious of the 8,146 votes cast, 3,475 votes were registered for the measure and 4,671 against it. The opposition had elected 24 members to the Althing, its supporters only 10. When the new Althing assembled, it passed a vote of lack of confidence in the ministry, and Avstein resigned in April 1909. He was succeeded by Bjorn Jansen, editor of the Isafold, one of the leaders of the opposition, who had been chosen president of the Althing the new minister promised to work for a better understanding between iceland and denmark and it was agreed that the measure regarding iceland's position in the realm should not be submitted to the althing instead the althing majority passed a new measure declaring iceland to be a free and sovereign kingdom united with denmark under a joint king and through such common affairs as might be agreed upon while remaining in office bjorn jansen was especially occupied with the question regarding the management of the bank of iceland even before his appointment rumors had been abroad that the bank management had been lax with regard to loans on real estate and the, to the fisheries charges were also made against the cashier of the bank halder 
Janssen, the new minister appointed a committee to examine the status of the bank it was found that it had suffered heavy losses but that these were covered by a reserve fund which would show a credit balance of two hundred and fifty thousand kroner after all losses were paid as to the officials of the bank the committee found that no blame could attach to them the minister however did not feel wholly reassured having lost confidence in the bank officials he removed the cashier halder Janssen, the two controlling directors k r janssen and iriker briam and the general manager trig v gunnarsson a man of great business ability a member of the all thing for many years this arouses general resentment as the people felt that the removed bank officials had been unjustly treated at a big mass meeting in reykjavik in which to seven thousand people are said to have participated the following resolution was drafted the people assembled protest against minister bjorn jansen's treatment of the bank officials and regard his action to be an arbitrary use of official power as well as a flagrant disregard of the true interests and honor of iceland since the people assembled find his action to be a positive proof that he can no longer be tolerated in the high office which he now holds they demand his immediate resignation the leading merchants of reykjavik also addressed to him sharp letters of protest when he refused to reinstate the bank officials after they had been declared blameless by the investigation committee his former friend judge k r johnson one of the removed directors brought suit against him for personal injury and defamation of character pleading that since he had not been appointed by the government but had been elected by the all thing the government had no jurisdiction in the matter and could not remove him the case was decided in his favour the minister appealed to the landsif for retter but the decision of the lower court was sustained even then the minister would not yield his paper isafold announced that a new appeal would be taken to the danish hersterit or supreme court but the case was never brought before that tribunal judge keor jansen was satisfied with his legal victory and did not resume his office as bank director the all thing representatives also mixed in the fight many of them demanding a special session of the all thing in order that the bank question might be considered by the people's chosen representatives party feeling ran high both in iceland and in denmark in copenhagen many leaders assembled to protest against the separation movement which it was claimed was headed by minister bjorn jansen himself even many icelanders took part in this meeting to deprecate this movement a personal union would be equivalent to separation they claimed and separation would mean the ruin of iceland no one spoke more vehemently than the young icelandic lawyer svein bjornsson i see the danger to the union between denmark mark and iceland he said in the fact that minister bjorn jansen stands at the head of a party which openly works for separation of the two countries when he comes to denmark he talks in another tone but he cannot be trusted this i tell you members of the government who are here present he is a man who either lacks reason or suffers himself to be controlled by unscrupulous men a danish journalist proposed to send a warship to iceland to arrest the leaders of the independence party such hysterical outbursts found little favour with the people of denmark but the secession movement supported by a radical group in iceland which in nineteen ten passed a resolution declaring that absolute separation was the only proper solution of the union question created genuine alarm minister bjorn jansen was a strong and upright man an energetic worker ever ready to aid any one in need or in distress he always remained faithful to his purpose of rendering efficient and unselfish public service in the high office to which he had been appointed as leader of the prohibition forces he succeeded in passing the prohibition law which received a majority vote in both branches of the all thing in nineteen o nine and was signed by the king in june the same year in spite of the opposition of several european nations including spain but his stand on the bank question and his views regarding iceland's relation to denmark aroused a strong opposition which constantly grew more hostile and determined in nineteen eleven schooley thorodson the leader of the independence party and others introduced in the Althing a motion of lack of confidence in the minister the motion was passed with a small majority and bjorn jansen resigned while he remained in office his paper isafold was edited by his son olaf bjornsson through the father's political defeat the paper lost prestige and support to such an extent that olaf no longer dared to accept articles written by him for this reason bjorn jansen founded a new paper magni in which he defended his position in the bank question as well as on the very important question touching iceland's relation to denmark the 
say y'all fasted dis flocker hoped that the king would now appoint the leader of their party schooley thordson to succeed bjorn jansen as minister as twenty-one members of the althing gave him their enthusiastic support but the king selected instead keor jansen chief justice of the lands sifur retter who was a member of schooley's party jansen accepted the office incurring the bitter enmity of all his former political friends a large mass meeting was assembled in reykjavik to protest against his course of action in accepting the office as he was not supported by a majority of the popularly chosen representatives in the all thing so bitter was the feeling that he was formally ousted from the party the same day a motion for a vote of lack of confidence in the new minister was introduced in the all thing it was passed in the lower branch but was not put to a vote in the upper branch jansen therefore continued to hold his office though he was no longer regarded as the leader of any party group in the press he was violently assailed the liberal leaders claiming that he had violated the principle of parliamentary government to satisfy his own personal vanity the new minister was born at gautlandum in thingayarsla in eighteen fifty two he had been sislumother in gulbringusla later judge in the lanzi ferretta and since nineteen o eight chief justice for many years he had been controlling director in the bank of iceland and royally appointed representative to the all thing when he assumed the office of minister he emphasized in a speech to the all thing that his policy was to be to create peace and good understanding and to secure the passage of a much needed finance law in april nineteen eleven the hindmast your norman or home rule party which supported him introduced a bill for amending the constitution stipulating that the all thing henceforth should consist of forty members all of whom should be elected by the people all men and women twenty-one years of age should have the right to vote for all thing representatives the executive branch of the government should consist of three ministers responsible to the all thing proportional party representation was also provided for the measure was passed by the all thing but since it was a constitutional amendment it would have to be passed anew after another general election before it could be submitted to the king for his signature in the summer of nineteen eleven a bill was also introduced in the althing providing for a separate flag for iceland to consist of a white cross on a blue field this raised another important issue as denmark regarded it as another step in the direction of complete separation of the two countries the icelanders held that without a flag of their own they had no national emblem expressive of their nationality that the danish flag flying on their ships and public buildings were was only a token of danish overlordship the old thing however failed to pass the bill k r jansen and his supporters did not secure a majority in the next general election he therefore tendered his resignation and was again appointed chief justice in the lansifer etter in july nineteen twelve hannes hofstein succeeded him as minister the same year the general prohibition law for iceland passed three years before during the ministry of bjorn jansen took effect in so far as it affected importation of liquors according to this law no liquors containing more than two and one half per cent of alcohol can be imported except for medical industrial and chemical use it is noteworthy that in passing this great social reform iceland was several years in advance of other nations when Abstein for the second time entered upon his duties as minister thirty-one members of the althing declared that they would unite in bringing about a solution of the union question by making such changes in the plan of nineteen o eight as would meet with the approval of the majority of the voters and would lead to a final agreement with denmark in his speech to the all thing Halfstein had called attention to the unfavorable economic condition of the country saying money is wanting credit is lacking icelandic bonds cannot be sold in foreign markets and sympathy with civilization and desire for progress are decreasing why is this i am convinced that it is no exaggeration to state that one of the chief causes is dissension quarrels and party strife at home together with unsettled disputes abroad this weakens confidence creates gloom and increases all that which is inimical to cultural endeavor hindering the increase of the true capital of culture which is required in order to turn credit to profitable account 
it is my conviction that one of the first steps to be taken in order to remedy this trouble is to bring about a satisfactory settlement of the disputes with our sister nation the danes regarding the union question which so long has diverted the attention from other important matters and in later years has added fuel to strife and disunion in our own country in the fall of nineteen twelve minister Halfstein went to copenhagen to confer with the danish government about the resumption of negotiations on the union question in these preliminary conferences it was pointed out by the danish leaders that since the plan of nineteen o eight had been rejected by the althing the icelanders would have to submit new proposals before the negotiations could be resumed upon his return to iceland Halfstein sought the advice of a number of althing representatives a new plan was outlined which the minister said was neither his own nor one proposed by the danish government but which it was hoped would gain the sanction of the danish authorities when it was published it met the determined opposition the paper isafold considered it wholly undesirable and the whole liberal icelandic press rejected it in the fall of nineteen thirteen a new revision of the constitution was submitted to the althing based on the plan of nineteen eleven but differing from it on many points this measure was finally passed in both branches of the assembly it provided for an icelandic minister popular election of all representatives to the althing proportional party representation women's suffrage in general elections and eligibility to all offices the question of a separate flag for iceland had also been debated repeatedly in the althing but the measure had met with defeat in the upper branch of the assembly finally on november twenty two nineteen thirteen the king sanctioned an icelandic proposal for a separate flag with the understanding that it should be so designed as not to resemble too closely the flags of other nations and that the danish flag should always be hoisted with it on government buildings in the next general elections the opponents of minister Halfstein secured a majority of the all thing representatives he accordingly tendered his resignation and was succeeded by sigurdur eggers who was appointed minister for iceland july five nineteen fourteen shortly after eggers appointment followed the outbreak of the world war and serious problems confronted the icelanders the old thing took steps to safeguard the country as far as possible laws were passed providing that necessaries of life such as grain coal salt petroleum machine oil fishing gear and medical supplies should be bought by the government that the ready money in the treasury should be used for this purpose so far as it could be spared that a loan of five hundred thousand kroner should be negotiated for such purchases and that public expenses should be curtailed the export of necessaries of life was prohibited and a commission was appointed to assist the government in taking the necessary steps to safeguard the country in an address to the althing august three nineteen fourteen minister eggers called attention to the problems confronting the government the proposed revision of the constitution was still pending so also the question of a separate flag for iceland he expressed the hope that the king would sanction these measures and that the people would then turn their minds to internal affairs we ought to devote more attention to our farming and husbandry than heretofore he continued the fisheries must be developed the means of communication on land and sea must be improved the icelandic steamship company especially should be encouraged he expressed the hope that in those perilous times the government and the legislature would cooperate in every way in the protection of the country so that no apprehension of danger would need to be entertained a commission appointed to consider the eventual design of the icelandic flag found that the one hitherto used consisting of a white cross on a blue shield could not be adopted as it resembled too closely the flags of sweden and of greece a new design would have to be submitted the revision of the constitution passed in nineteen thirteen was again brought before the althing in nineteen fourteen and was passed a second time by both branches of the assembly without change the king had promised that if the amendments passed in nineteen thirteen should again be passed unchanged by a new all thing he would sanction the measure with the understanding however that no change could be made in the practice which had hitherto obtained that all measures should be submitted to the king in cabinet meeting to this practice the king stated he would adhere until he had sanctioned a law regarding the relation between denmark and iceland agreed to by both the rigsdag and the all thing which should establish a different regulation the commission appointed to consider the design of the icelandic flag submitted a report commending that the flag 
flag should consist of a red cross with white borders on a blue field it was hoped that minister eggers in going to copenhagen would secure the king's signature to both measures but word was soon received that he had failed in his mission in the negotiations with the minister the king reiterated his promise to sign the measures but with the proviso that they should be presented in cabinet meeting this in the opinion of the minister raised the issue whether icelandic measures were to be regarded as joint matters to be considered by the whole cabinet or as separate icelandic affairs he refused to yield on this point which he regarded as a vital issue and tendered his resignation december nineteen fourteen early in nineteen fifteen the king invited three members of the independence party to denmark for consultation on the union question one of these was einar arnarson who was soon appointed to succeed eggers as minister for iceland arnarson born in eighteen eighty was still very young but he was already a prominent jurist in nineteen o eight he became instructor in law in the university of reykjavik in nineteen eleven he was made professor of jurisprudence in nineteen fourteen he was elected member of the althing where he quickly rose into prominence as leader of the independence party he had written several works dealing with the relation of iceland to norway and denmark opposing the views of the danish professor knud berlin he maintained that danish authorities had no right whatever to meddle with icelandic affairs in iceland a movement was developed in opposition to what was regarded as too supine an attitude on the part of the all thing in the union question complaint was made that important decisions on vital icelandic questions had been left to the king the supporters of this movement which finally led to the organization of a new progressive group were found especially among the adherents of the independence party they demanded a vigorous national policy and active efforts in promoting icelandic enterprises arnason's visit in copenhagen to carry on private negotiations with the king regarding the union question had aroused suspicion and ill-will among the members of this group would he too suffer the king to exert a controlling influence over icelandic affairs when arsenison entered upon the duties of his office they convoked large public meetings in reykjavik demanding that he should cause the all thing to be dissolved in order that new elections might be held but the minister had sufficient support in the all thing to remain in office the negotiations regarding the icelandic flag and union question were renewed and since the new minister did not urge the question regarding the submitting of icelandic matters in cabinet meetings as his predecessor had done the king sanctioned both measures june nineteen nineteen fifteen in accordance with the report of the committee appointed to consider the design of the flag it was to consist of a red cross with white borders on a blue field it should be used within the country and in icelandic territorial waters but the danish flag should be hoisted with it on government buildings the design of the icelandic coat of arms was also changed by royal order of nineteen o three it was decreed that it should be a silver falcon on a blue field still earlier it had consisted of a device in which a split codfish was the principal feature in nineteen fifteen it received its present symbolic and attractive design according to the constitutional amendments passed by the althing in nineteen thirteen and nineteen fourteen and sanctioned by the king in nineteen fifteen there should be an icelandic ministry in reykjavik responsible to the althing and taking part in its deliberations the number of cabinet members to be fixed by law the icelandic prime minister should hold no other office he should be able to speak and write icelandic and should go to copenhagen to present bills and other important matters to the king for his signature the old thing has forty members but this number can be changed by law it is divided into two branches the efri dield or upper branch consisting of fourteen members and the nethri dield or lower branch or of twenty-six members the number of members in both branches can be changed by law thirty-four of the althing representatives are elected directly by their constituencies within their respective districts for a period of six years six representatives are chosen at large and according to proportional party representation for the period of twelve years these six members have seats in the upper branch of the assembly the other eight members constituting it are chosen by the thirty-four representatives elected in the districts from their own number at the assembling of the althing only one half of the total number of representatives are chosen at each election men and women twenty-five years of age who have resided in the country five years immediately preceding the election can vote for the district representatives men and women thirty-five years of age can vote for the representatives elected at large 
the old thing meets july first every other year but extra sessions must be called by the king when a majority of both branches demand it such sessions last only four weeks unless the time is prolonged by the king by law of nineteen sixteen the number of members of the icelandic cabinet was fixed at three minister einar arnarson now resigned and the king invited jan magnusson to form a cabinet according to the new provision the members of this cabinet were jan magnusson leader of the hindmast jornar men or home rule party bjorn christiansen leader of the majority faction of the schall fast stayed bis flocker or independent party and sigurdar jansen of the newly organized benda flocker or agrarian party this coalition was created at the request of the party leaders to secure the greatest possible cooperation in view of the difficult situation caused by the world war the three parties represented in the ministry controlled thirty-six out of the twenty total forty votes in the all thing in nineteen seventeen bjorn christiansen minister of finance and the new ministry resigned and former minister for iceland sigurdur eggers was appointed to succeed him through their constitution as finally amended the icelanders had established complete democracy in their political institutions parliamentary government unrestricted suffrage for men and women and a legislative assembly elected by the people they had gained control of their finances and the executive branch of their government had been located in reykjavik but difficult problems still remained unsolved the all-important controversy regarding iceland's relation to denmark had not been settled and the question of a separate icelandic flag had so far found only a preliminary solution the flag already granted was little more than a decoration restricted to local use in connection with the flag of denmark as icelandic commerce was expanding the flag question was revived it was evident that this was no longer a matter only of national sentiment but of growing practical importance in nineteen fourteen the icelandic steamship company was organized with a capital stock of one million two hundred thousand kroner the icelanders in the united states and canada subscribing a large part of the stock and the icelandic government contributing four hundred thousand kroner four steamers were to be built the first of these the gullfoss was launched at copenhagen in nineteen fifteen the question would naturally arise whether icelandic ships in foreign waters should continue to sail under the danish flag in august nineteen seventeen a measure was introduced in the all thing requesting the assembly to demand an icelandic merchant flag the proposal was adopted and the icelandic prime minister jan magnusson went to copenhagen to lay it before the king in a meeting of his cabinet november twenty two nineteen seventeen the king refused to sanction the measure in stating the reasons for his refusal he said i cannot sanction the proposal submitted by the icelandic minister but i wish to add that when danish and icelandic views do not coincide negotiation no matter how they may be inaugurated will do more than direct action on a single question to create that good understanding which ought to form the basis for the relations between the two countries after considering carefully the king's words all political parties in iceland agreed to try negotiations the danish rigsdag appointed a commission to meet a similar body of icelandic representatives in reykjavik the danish members arrived in iceland june twenty ninth nineteen eighteen the negotiations were begun at once and on july nineteenth the icelandic telegraphic bureau wired a message that full agreement had been reached regarding the flag question and the relations between iceland and denmark an act of union defining iceland's position was signed by all the delegates and submitted to the danish rigsdag and the icelandic all thing after these assemblies had approved the measure it was finally ratified in iceland by a general plebiscite in the all thing the measure was carried by thirty-eight against two votes in the plebiscite twelve thousand forty votes were cast in its favor and only eight hundred and ninety seven against it on november thirtieth nineteen eighteen it was signed by the king the following day sunday december one iceland was proclaimed a sovereign kingdom in union with denmark according to provisions in the act of union the danish flag dane brog was lowered and the new national flag was hoisted over iceland the city of reykjavik was decorated for the occasion shortly before twelve o'clock the orchestra opened the program for the occasion by playing the icelandic national anthem eld gamum la Icefold minister eggers then spoke saying in closing 
by sanctioning the act of union the king has carried out the thoughts of frederick the eighth who possessed the most intimate understanding of our affairs to-day the king has decided to grant iceland its own flag which is now raised over the icelandic state our sovereign has won the sympathy of every icelander the flag is the symbol of our sovereignty of the most resplendent thoughts of our nation the honour of our flag is our national honour we pray god the almighty to preserve our state and our king we pray god to help us to carry our flag to honour may the good fortune of king and people follow it so let us hoist this flag as the flag rose to the top of the staff the orchestra played the icelandic flag song and the danish man of war islands falk lying in the harbour fired a salute of twenty-one shots captain lork of the islands falk spoke for denmark the orchestra played the danish national song king christian and along lived the king echoed through the city a speech of a speech by city judge johannesson president of the all thing was followed by three times three cheers for the king from copenhagen the following telegram was received from king christian the tenth after signing in meeting of my cabinet the danish icelandic act of union which upon preliminary negotiations between danish and icelandic delegates has been passed by the legislative assemblies of the two countries and ratified in iceland by a general vote and after having determined the appearance and use of the icelandic flag i wish to express the hope that this new arrangement may form the basis for a happy national development and cordial relations between the two peoples i also send my dear and faithful icelanders my royal greetings and best wishes for iceland's future success and happiness danish icelandic act of union denmark and iceland are free and sovereign states united by a common king danish citizens in iceland are to enjoy equal rights and privileges with the citizens of iceland and vice versa the citizens of each country are exempt from military service in the other country access to fishing within the maritime jurisdiction of both countries is equally free to danish and icelandic citizens regardless of residence danish ships in icelandic harbors have the same rights as icelandic ships and vice versa denmark will act in iceland's behalf in foreign affairs in the ministry of foreign affairs there will be a representative appointed in consultation with the government of iceland and familiar with icelandic conditions attaches who are well informed on icelandic affairs shall be appointed to the already existing consulates and legations all agreements entered into by denmark with foreign countries and already published shall in so far as they concern iceland be in force for that country also agreements ratified by denmark after the proposed law of confederation has gone into effect shall not be binding upon iceland without the express consent of the icelandic authorities concerned until such time as iceland shall decide to take charge of the inspection of fisheries in whole or in part this duty will be performed by denmark under the danish flag the monetary system shall continue to be the same for both countries as at present so long as the scandinavian monetary system exists should iceland desire to establish her own coinage the question of acknowledgment by sweden and norway of the coins and notes stamped in iceland will have to be settled by negotiation with those countries denmark's supreme court has jurisdiction in icelandic cases until iceland shall decide to institute a supreme tribunal of her own until then one member of the supreme court shall be an icelander matters of importance to both countries such as coinage trade customs navigation mails telegraphs and radio telegraphs administration of justice weights and measures as well as financial arrangements shall be regulated by agreements of the authorities of both countries the sum of sixty thousand krona contributed annually by denmark to iceland shall be discontinued and instead denmark shall establish two funds of one million krona each one at the university of copenhagen and one at the university of reykjavik for the promotion of intellectual intercourse between the two countries there shall be established an advisory body of at least six members one half from iceland and the other half from denmark to be appointed by the althing and the rigsdag respectively to deal with any bills brought forward in the parliament of one country which also touch the interests of the other if differences of opinion should arise concerning the provisions of this law of confederation which cannot be adjusted by the governments they shall be laid before a court of arbitration consisting of four members two to be appointed by each country this court of arbitration shall settle differences by a plurality of votes and in case of a tie the matter shall be submitted to an arbitrator appointed alternately by the swedish and the norwegian governments 
this law of confederation may be revised until the year nineteen forty upon the request of either the rigsdag or the althing the agreement may be abrogated only by a two-thirds vote of each parliament which must afterwards be confirmed by a plebiscite denmark will communicate to foreign powers its acknowledgment of iceland as a sovereign power in accordance with the provisions of this law of confederation at the same time denmark will announce that iceland declares itself to be perpetually neutral and has no naval flag of its own in accordance with the provisions in the act of union a danish minister is stationed in reykjavik as denmark's official representative in iceland the icelanders are similarly represented in denmark through their own minister in the summer of nineteen twenty one elaborate preparations were made in reykjavik to receive the royal family who were to visit iceland for the first time in their history the icelanders were to greet a king and queen of their own during the last two weeks reykjavik has been the busiest city in the world says a report from iceland of june twenty seventh nineteen twenty one houses have been painted streets repaired and many hundred people have been busy decorating the city for months the committee on arrangements has labored to make the reception an honor to iceland in the forenoon of june twenty sixth the danish man of war valkyrie carrying the royal visitors entered the harbor of reykjavik a triumphal arch had been erected where the king and queen were received by the city authorities and greeted by the huzzas of the populace at twelve o'clock the bishop of iceland conducted religious services in the cathedral church then followed a royal reception in the althing building where the king spoke in icelandic to the assembled people in response to an address of welcome by the althing president gifts from the people of iceland were presented to all the members of the royal family the queen receiving a beautiful national costume in describing the festival editor sven paulsen wrote in the berlingsik tinda at seven o'clock in the evening the streets of reykjavik resounded with huzzas and orchestral music the royal pair were coming the king wore a general's uniform the queen was attired in Icelandic festival costume wearing a golden diadem with white veil flowing over a black silk dress ornamented with gold embroidery and fastened about the waist with a belt of pure gold the costume a present from the women of iceland to their first queen cost seventy thousand kroner queen alexandra looked very beautiful in it and the people were highly elated at the royal dinner icelandic girls in national costume waited on the guests the royal family also visited thingveller where they were received by a large number of people in national attire many of whom had come from a great distance to greet the king and queen of iceland when the king ascended the mount of laws a body of icelandic trumpeters struck up their solemn measures as a welcome to the distinguished guests from this old centre of icelandic national life on july one the royal family visited the great waterfall Gullfoss, stopping on the way in a typical icelandic farmhouse which the king examined thoroughly with great interest after a trip to geyser they proceeded to olfusa to view the great suspension bridge spanning that stream on saturday july two the royal visitors were brought in automobiles to the waterfall ira Fals, whence they returned to reykjavik on sunday the royal family attended religious services in the cathedral church at one o'clock the king gave a luncheon at the royal residence for the icelandic officials and the officers of the men of war valkyrie heimdall phila and beskiturin forming the royal escort squadron the afternoon was spent in viewing men's and women's gymnastic exhibitions and national sports monday july four the royal family left reykjavik on the man-of-war valkyrie sailing to hafnarfjord where they embarked on the steamer island for a trip to greenland before returning to denmark before departing king christian the tenth created an icelandic order of knighthood the order of the falcon with the three classes grand cross commanders and knights the insignia of the order is a white enamel star-shaped cross with gilt edges in the centre of the cross is a blue oval bearing the icelandic symbol a silver falcon ready for flight on the reverse side is the name of the founder of the order in gold on white enamel surrounded by a blue border with the inscription first d december nineteen eighteen the ribbon of the order is blue with white borders containing a red stripe the same colors as the icelandic flag the knights of the grand cross carry also an eight-pointed star bearing the device of the order the head of the order is king christian x during the last decades 
political freedom and economic progress have transformed iceland into a prosperous and progressive modern state the old pursuits have become more productive than past generation would have considered possible great national resources are being made available which were wholly unknown in the past and new pursuits are developing which give promise of still greater progress in the future of special importance are the fisheries which of recent years have grown to be the most paying pursuit and chief source of income in the country in, in 1895 iceland had only 70 fishing vessels in 1902 the number had increased to 144 iceland has now over 20 steam trawlers over a 100 sail and motor cutters 600 motor deck boats and about 1000 fishing boats a fishing fleet which gives employment to nearly 11000 people or about one-eighth of the population of the country in nineteen thirteen the export of fish products brought a total income of thirteen million three hundred and twenty seven thousand kroner or more than twice the amount derived from animal husbandry which gave a return of five million one hundred and ninety five thousand kroner and yet the rich fisheries in icelandic waters have been only partially utilized by the icelanders themselves in nineteen thirteen one thousand four hundred and thirteen fishing steamers and sail ships entered icelandic harbors and there is no sign of any decrease in the vast schools of fish and herring in these waters also in animal husbandry and farming considerable progress has been made though not in the same proportion in nineteen eighteen iceland had twenty four thousand three hundred and eleven cattle six hundred and forty four thousand nine hundred and seventy one sheep and fifty three thousand two hundred and eighteen horses especially important is the development of dairying a pursuit which has been taught the people by the danes just as the valuable herring fishery has been taught them by the norwegians the first icelandic creamery was built in nineteen hundred in nineteen o six the number had been risen to thirty four during the last few years the annual export of butter is valued at five hundred thousand kroner it is thought that dairying in the rich lowlands of southern iceland if properly developed could support the entire present population of the country but because of lack of proper means of transportation dairying can yet be pursued with profit only during the summer months for this reason the project has been set on foot to build a railway about seventy miles in length one hundred and eleven kilometers from reykjavik to thingveller self os and Fjorsa, with a short sideline to Irurbaki. this road will open this important district to new economic development daring is now pursued also in northern iceland but lack of transportation facilities makes further progress difficult during the winter the ice-bound harbors are closed to traffic not till the northern districts are connected with reykjavik and southern iceland by railways can their economic possibilities be fully developed in all iceland there are six thousand five hundred and fifty eight farms one half of these are owned by the farmers who till them the other half of the farming population are renters about one-tenth of the soil is owned by the state but the government estates are now being sold as rapidly as possible at low prices and on easy terms relatively the farming population is decreasing in number for some time the number of farms has remained stationary though large areas could yet be cultivated the work of developing new farmsteads cannot be done as the growth of the fisheries and the increase in trade and traffic have attracted the young people to the sea-coast districts in nineteen hundred iceland had a population of seventy nine thousand of which only nine thousand lived in the towns in nineteen fifteen the population was eighty nine thousand fifty nine of which twenty thousand seven hundred and five lived in the towns the growth of population in the decade nineteen ten to nineteen twenty was nine thousand five hundred and thirteen from eighty five thousand one hundred and eighty three in nineteen ten to ninety four thousand six hundred and ninety six in nineteen twenty during the same decade the rural population fell from sixty five thousand nine hundred and eighty seven in nineteen ten to sixty five thousand thirty two in nineteen twenty but great progress is being made towards better conditions in rural life the old primitive farmhouses built of sod and stone are disappearing and fine modern homes are built of lumber or concrete usually two stories high with large windows and jutting chimneys the new houses are built according to american far west 
models says a recent writer a similar transformation is being wrought in the means of communication and travel fifty years ago there was not a bridge across a single river nor was there a wagon in use in all iceland now two-fifths of the revenues of the country are used for building roads and improving the means of communication fine roads are being built in all parts of the country so that the old horseback caravans will soon be replaced by wagons and automobiles from Reykjavik, a fine road has already been built to Thingbiller, and another almost to Hecla. All great rivers have been spanned by costly bridges, and fine highways are already in use along the valleys and streams in all parts of the country. Fifteen times a year the mail caravans go to all parts of the island, so that every home receives its mail regularly. Houses have been built and equipped at regular intervals along the mail routes as places of refuge for the mail carriers in stormy weather in nineteen o six a telegraphic cable was laid to iceland and the first telephone lines were constructed in the island in nineteen fourteen the icelandic steamship company was organized regular steamship service is now maintained with denmark and around the whole coast of iceland sixty places being entered by the steamers on their trip around the island motor boats are also plying the navigable rivers before many more years the tourists may be able to travel on electric railway trains from one place to another in the saga islands industry is still of little importance in iceland but possibilities exist of great future development in this field lignite or coal is found in several places and beds of bituminous coal have also been discovered these coal deposits will probably be of value only as fuel for private homes but iceland possesses a great supply of water power which can be made available as motor power in industries and on electric railways of the countries of europe france has the greatest amount of water power amounting to ten million horsepower norway has about seven million five hundred thousand sweden about six million austria six million italy six million germany one million five hundred thousand spain one million five hundred thousand england three hundred three thirty three thousand switzerland one hundred and sixty seven thousand the amount of water power in iceland is not definitely known but it has been estimated to be not less than two million five hundred thousand horsepower or as much as that of germany switzerland spain and england combined foreign companies have already purchased great icelandic waterfalls and the building of railways and factories already planned will undoubtedly be begun in the near future a fair index to the growth of prosperity in iceland in late years is the rapidly increasing volume of trade in the period eighteen eighty to eighteen ninety the yearly export and import together amounted to ten million kroner in nineteen ten this total had amounted to thirty million kroner in nineteen thirteen before the outbreak of the world war thirty six million kroner the export being sixteen million kroner the import nineteen million kroner in recent years this rapid growth of commerce has continued the official statistics show the greater share of this trade is carried on with denmark great britain norway sweden united states spain and germany in the period eighteen eighty six to eighteen ninety the average number of ships which came to iceland from foreign lands every year was two hundred and sixty four since that time that average has increased in nineteen twenty the population of iceland numbered ninety four thousand six hundred and ninety six a correspondent from reykjavik to the danish paper berlingske tadinda wrote in 1921 there is scarcely another scandinavian city which in the last fifty years has experienced such a development as the capital of iceland when christian the ninth in 1874 landed in reykjavik it consisted of a cluster of houses around a small church at the upper end of faxi bay many of the houses were built of sod and stone the town gave the general impression of a primitive village or a group of fishermen's homes when frederick the eighth and members of the danish government and rigsdag landed in iceland in nineteen o seven reykjavik had become a city of about ten thousand people but the king and members of the rigsdag had to land on a small pier on the open shore and the town with its unpaved streets and low houses irregularly placed gave the impression of a large country town now at the time of the visit of christian the tenth and queen alexandra the town is nearly twenty thousand people and is not only a real city but it deserves to be called the capital of iceland when the royal squadron entered the harbor a beautiful sea-coast town lay stretched before it with an elegant 
brilliantly constructed harbor ready to receive the king and queen stood the population of a well-built capital a city with government buildings churches colleges public library museums hospitals in short the whole complex equipment belonging to a european capital the age of the small tripping horses is past automobiles and motor trucks speed through the streets of reykjavik the old general stores with their collections of all sorts of wares from ship anchors oil coats and empty herring barrels to candy and millinery have been replaced by stores of the latest model carrying only special lines of goods some so large and well equipped that they compare favorably with the stores in any scandinavian city down by the harbor the only great commercial harbor in the north atlantic great steamers are loading and unloading at the wharves instead of as formerly when the goods had to be brought from the ships to the shore and from the shore to the ships and barges reykjavik has also a fleet of modern trawlers and large motor fishing boats not equaled in any danish city not even in esberg the city is a real capital where nearly all of what iceland possesses of political administrative and academic talent and ability is gathered an evidence of the high moral character of the icelandic people is the almost total absence of crime in their country in nineteen o four sixteen persons were convicted of crimes or minor offences one being a woman in 1905 and 1906 the number of cases were 22 men and two women and 28 men and five women respectively but only two-thirds of their accused received a prison sentence the prisons in iceland usually stand almost empty when we consider that more than one-fifth of the whole population live in seacoast towns and are engaged in trade and fisheries this is so unique a record that we must give the icelanders the credit of being the most orderly and law-abiding people in the world End of chapter 18。chapter 19 of history of Iceland by Knut Gyurset。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Icelandic immigration。the Icelanders in America。a feature of singular interest and importance in the modern history of iceland as of the other european countries is the emigration to america a movement in which also the icelanders have participated the economic development which during the last few decades has wrought such improvement in social conditions everywhere in the north had not made itself felt at the time when the real emigration from iceland began some progress had been made but the condition of the peasantry and the poorer classes was so little improved that emigration to america from all scandinavian countries was increasing rapidly under the stimulus of improved facilities for ocean travel this migratory movement of the venturesome and depressed of europe to the new world with its hopes and opportunities exerted its influence also on iceland the economic conditions there were still very unfavorable and the bitter and hitherto fruitless struggle for political liberty had led leading newspapers to advocate emigration as the only solution of the pending national questions emigration from iceland to the united states and canada may be said to have begun in eighteen seventy but even long before that time a few icelanders who had been converted to mormonism had sought new homes in america in eighteen fifty one two icelandic mormons from copenhagen came as missionaries to the vast man in eighteen fifty five a few persons who had accepted that faith among others samuel bjarnason and his wife emigrated to the united states founding a settlement at spanish fork in the state of utah other converts followed later in eighteen fifty seven thirteen persons from iceland arrived in the colony of late years many of the icelandic mormons have returned to the lutheran faith and the colony at spanish fork is neither large nor prosperous in eighteen sixty three the first emigrants to brazil departed from iceland under the leadership of magnus ericsson a few left later at different times going by way of copenhagen to germany where they joined german emigrants going to south america but this emigration was never of great importance and no icelandic settlement was founded there in eighteen seventy three many persons signified their desire to go to brazil but as magnus ericsson who had hitherto acted as guide declared that he would no longer act as leader of emigrants going to that country they joined another group going to the united states and canada 
the immigration to the united states begun in eighteen fifty five was continued in eighteen seventy when four young icelanders from Irorbaki came to milwaukee they settled on washington island wisconsin thus founding the second icelandic settlement in america a few more immigrants arrived the following year but although the colony still exists it has never grown beyond a small group of families in eighteen seventy two almost three hundred icelanders came to america among these were the leaders sig triger Jónsson, one of the founders of the large icelandic colony new iceland paul thorlaxson who founded the icelandic settlements in north dakota and hansby thorgrimson who took the lead in founding the icelandic lutheran synod in america in eighteen seventy three a ship carrying one hundred and fifty three emigrants sailed from Akureyri in northern iceland to canada thirty more emigrants who found no room on the ship followed later in the fall all agreed to settle in the same place but when they arrived at their destination some went to nova scotia and a few to milwaukee wisconsin but the greater number founded a colony on the russo river near muskoka ontario where the post office hecla was built many men who later became prominent among the icelanders in america were in this group of immigrants among others the poet stephen g stevenson baldwin l baldwinson and jan jansen bardal in that year came also reverend jan bjarnason who later became so prominent a leader in the icelandic church in america he had been moved to come to america with his wife through letters from his friend paul thorlaxson who had entered the theological seminary of the german lutheran missouri synod at st louis bjarnson and his wife came to milwaukee and after a few days proceeded to st louis where they met paul thorlaxson reverend bjarnson did not enter the theological seminary in st louis but went instead to decor iowa where he became assistant to reverend v corin one of the leading ministers of the norwegian lutheran synod in january eighteen seventy four he was appointed teacher in luther college decor iowa but in the spring of that year he resigned and returned to milwaukee wisconsin when news was brought that iceland had received a constitution the icelanders in milwaukee arranged a celebration in which all the icelanders in the city took part speeches were made by rev jan bjarnson by the editor jan olafsson who had accompanied him from reykjavik and others at this time the an icelandic society icelandig avelig was founded for the purpose of promoting intellectual interest among the icelanders in america a movement was also set on foot to find a suitable place for an icelandic colony where the immigrants might dwell together as wisconsin did not seem to offer the desired opportunity committees were appointed to investigate where a suitable location might be found sigvis magnuson and jan haldorson were sent to nebraska as a result of their visit a few icelanders settled in that state but it was not selected as a site for the new colony another committee led by olafur olafsson and jan olafsson was sent to alaska about their expedition jan olafsson later published a book alaska lysing alandi aglan custom etc washington d c eighteen seventy five probably the first icelandic book printed in america but alaska was not found to be a suitable place for a colony the canadian government carried on active work and sent paid agents to iceland to encourage immigration to canada in september eighteen seventy four the steamer st patrick brought three hundred and sixty five icelandic immigrants directly to quebec at the entrance to the harbor a governor officer accompanied by johann arngrimson who had come to america in eighteen seventy two met them and sought to persuade them to settle in canada many of the immigrants said that they intended to go to the united states but after some negotiations they entered into an agreement with the government representatives promising to settle in canada on the following conditions they were to enjoy full liberty and right of citizenship at once on the same terms as native-born citizens a sufficiently large and suitable tract of land for a colony was to be granted them they were to preserve unhindered their personal rights their language and their nationality for themselves and for their descendants forever 
the reason for this agreement was that the immigrants believed that there was more freedom in the united states than in canada journeying westward from quebec to ontario they founded a settlement at kinmount about sixty miles north of toronto but the land here proved to be so poor that the settlers grew discontented and wished to find a better location in the fall of eighteen seventy four johann arngrimson representative of the canadian government came to kinmount and urged the discontented settlers to move to nova scotia where a suitable tract for a settlement would be granted them about eighty families promised to go they moved early in the spring of eighteen seventy five and others followed later in the summer about thirty miles from the coast of, at a place which they called elgschether they founded the settlement markland but as the land was stony and covered with timber it was little suited for cultivation the following year more people from iceland came to the settlement it is thought that it numbered at one time about two hundred people brynjolfr brynjolfsson was the leader in the settlement in all things pertaining to religious and educational work he was a gifted man and worked with untiring zeal to promote the welfare of his people but the settlement did not prosper in eighteen eighty one to eighteen eighty two most of the settlers moved away to join their countrymen in other localities in eighteen seventy five goon logger peterson and his wife who had settled in wisconsin in eighteen seventy three moved to lyon county minnesota more settlers from wisconsin joined them the following year and in eighteen seventy seven many immigrants from iceland arrived people of other nationalities also settled there but the Icelanders are very numerous around Minneota and Marshall, Minnesota. In 1878, the Icelanders in this settlement organized a society for the purpose of printing books and papers, for establishing a common burial ground, and for gathering together for the reading of the scriptures on Sundays. The first clergyman who visited the settlement and helped to organize congregations was the pioneer leader, Reverend Paul Thorlaxen, who visited the settlement in 1877 and 1878. Four congregations were organized, all of which were served by the same minister. In 1897, an Icelandic quarterly, the Kenarin, was founded, edited by B. B. Janssen and Reverend Janus A. Sigurdsson of Accra, North Dakota. This periodical continued to appear till 1905. In 1902, the Icelanders in Minnesota began the publication of a monthly, edited by Thorder Thordersen, M. D. and Reverend Bjorn B. Janssen. The periodical ceased to appear in 1908. Among the prominent men reared in this settlement is Honorable G. B. Bjornsson, editor of the Minneota mascot for years, a leader in the Minnesota state legislature. As the Icelanders in eastern Canada were dissatisfied with conditions in the localities where they had settled, Lord Dufferin, governor-general of canada who was very friendly to them moved the canadian government to grant them financial aid to move their colony to a new site john taylor who had become acquainted with the icelandic settlers at kinmount offered to serve as guide in searching for a better location in eighteen seventy five a committee headed by sig trager was sent from muskoka under the guidance of Taylor, to find a suitable place for a colony. They selected a strip of land along the west shore of Lake Winnipeg, calling it New Iceland. In the fall of that year, a few settlers from Ontario arrived in the new colony. The following year, about 1,200 immigrants arrived from Iceland. The colony grew so fast that it already numbered about 1,400 people, the largest Icelandic settlement in America on january fourth eighteen seventy six a general meeting was held and a council of five was chosen to act as temporary government for the colony shortly after new iceland had been founded the two most influential church leaders among the icelanders in america rev paul thorlaxen and rev jan bjarnason arrived in the colony paul thorlaxen who had served some norwegian congregations and an icelandic congregation which he had organized in wisconsin and had served as missionary preacher in other icelandic settlements was called as minister by settlers in new iceland in eighteen seventy six he arrived in the colony october ninth eighteen seventy seven and organized the first congregation there jan bjarnason who after leaving luther college had worked for a time as assistant on the norwegian newspaper scandinavian and 
bud sticken was also called as minister by some settlers in new iceland in eighteen seventy six in the summer of that year he visited the colony and on november eighth the following year he arrived there with his wife and entered upon his work as pastor and church organizer between these two leaders of church controversy soon arose which divided the icelanders in america into two parties paul thorlakson adhered to the conservative lutheran views of the german lutheran missouri synod and the norwegian lutheran synod he sought to prevail on his countrymen to associate themselves in church work with the norwegians of the norwegian lutheran synod but jan bjarnason opposed the plan he considered the synod too conservative as he rejected the doctrine of the verbal inspirations of the bible and differed with rev thorlikson also on other doctrinal questions the meetings held between the two leaders and their adherents march twenty five to twenty six eighteen seventy eight and march seventeen eighteen eighteen seventy nine to discuss these questions only widened the breach between the two parties during the first years in the colony the settlers suffered much as they were poorly equipped to live in the severe climate of canada an epidemic also broke out which carried away hundreds of people in these trying days the canadian government granted them a loan to aid them and rev paul thorlikson solicited aid among the norwegians in the united states who contributed one thousand three hundred dollars to the relief fund in eighteen eighty jan bjarnason had to go to iceland to visit his dying father he bid farewell to his congregations and did not return to new iceland in eighteen seventy seven steps were taken to organize a more permanent government for the colony two meetings were assembled each choosing five men to act as a committee in drafting laws for the people these laws were later submitted to a general meeting assembled at the town of gimli february five eighteen seventy seven the colony was divided into four settlements the fithin ness by goth arnis by goth flots by goth and the mcleyar by goth at an election held february fourteen each settlement chose five men to act as a local council each council chose one of its members as president Bithor Sturyori. the four presidents formed a general council for the whole colony the nylandu roth with a president and vice-president this council had charge of all matters common to the four settlements a constitution for the colony was framed at a meeting held january eleventh eighteen seventy eight this fundamental law the only one of its kind among the icelanders in america remained in force till eighteen eighty seven new iceland was a state with its own constitution laws and government even its own language and distinct nationality no other people than the icelanders were allowed to settle within its borders but in all except local affairs it remained under the authority of the canadian government in eighteen seventy seven a company was organized in the colony to print and publish books and papers the Presvelag Naya Islands. A printing press was bought in Minneapolis, and on September 10 of that year, the first Icelandic paper in America, the Fram Fari, began to appear, its editor being Haldor Briam. In 1880, the paper ceased to be published, but although it lived only a short time, it is of great importance as a source for the early history of the colony. Other papers were published later dags brun eighteen ninety three to eighteen ninety six the periodical savava eighteen ninety five to nineteen o four bergmalio eighteen ninety seven to nineteen o one balder nineteen o three to nineteen ten nye dags brun nineteen o four to nineteen o six and gim langer nineteen ten to nineteen eleven the colony of new iceland is still prosperous and remains the most exclusively icelandic settlement in america it has been represented in the manitoba legislature by several able men born in iceland first by captain sig Triger, jonasson and later by b l balwinson and s thorvaldson the religious controversy between the adherents of paul thorlikson and jan bjarnason together with the hardships caused by poverty and epidemics led to an emigration from new iceland which resulted in the founding of new icelandic settlements in other localities in the spring of eighteen seventy nine rev paul thorlikson accompanied by several leading men of the colony set out to search for a suitable location for a new settlement a tract in prembina county in the northeastern corner of north dakota was selected some settlers from new iceland arrived there the, that same summer and many people came the following year from new iceland nova scotia and from icelandic settlements in wisconsin and minnesota
before the new settlement in pembina county was ten years old it was one of the largest icelandic colonies in america in eighteen eighty the first congregations were founded there by rev paul thorlaxon the father of this new and flourishing settlement on march twelfth this gifted and faithful worker died deeply mourned by all his countrymen brave gentle and resourceful a true and devoted leader he had worn himself out in untiring effort to aid his people in their various needs in that year rev hans b thorgrimson graduated from the theological seminary of the missouri synod in st louis he was called as pastor by the newly organized congregations in pembina county arriving there in the fall of eighteen eighty three at this time a congregation was also organized in the town of pembina the real centre of the icelandic settlement in eighteen eighty four thorgrimson organized new congregations farther west in the settlement and also at grafton in marshall county north dakota where some icelanders had settled that same year he proposed that the icelandic congregations in america should unite and organize an icelandic lutheran synod at a meeting of delegates from various places assembled at mountain in pembina county january twenty three to twenty five eighteen eighty five this proposal was discussed a constitution for a general church organization was drafted and submitted to the various congregations for their approval on june twenty four eighteen eighty five a new meeting was assembled at winnipeg where the proposed synod was organized by the thirteen congregations which had already signed the constitution rev jan bjarnason who had returned from iceland in eighteen eighty four and had become pastor of icelandic congregations in winnipeg was elected president of the synod he was also chosen editor of the church paper Samminingen, which began to appear in december of that year in nineteen o five the icelandic synod had thirty seven congregations in nineteen nineteen the number had increased to fifty eight in eighteen eighty six rev hans b thorgrimson moved to south dakota where he took charge of some norwegian congregations he returned in nineteen hundred and continued to serve the congregations in pembina county till nineteen twelve many icelanders in the pembina settlement have become prominent in the public affairs of their state among these men may be mentioned hon d j laxdahl land commissioner of north dakota deceased hon m b brynjolfsson a brilliant lawyer and political leader also deceased in both houses of the state legislature pembina county has been repeatedly represented by men born in iceland while new iceland was being settled many icelanders came to winnipeg the chief point of communication in that part of canada many remained in the city forming a colony which dates its origin from the same years as that of new iceland this flourishing city in time attracted so many icelanders that it became the centre of the icelandic settlements and of icelandic intellectual life in america already in eighteen seventy seven an icelandic society the icelandinga felic was organized there for the purpose of guiding icelandic immigrants in finding homes and settlements founded by their own countrymen so that they should not become scattered everywhere another aim of the society was to provide instruction for children and young people both in the english language and in their own mother tongue to cultivate among their people love of reading and intellectual pursuits and to aid the sick and needy a sunday school was organized in which children received instruction in religion and in the icelandic language in eighteen seventy seven teachers were hired and a general public school was maintained throughout the winter instruction was given in writing arithmetic english and icelandic forty pupils being in regular attendance in eighteen eighty one the icelanding of feleg was reorganized under the name of fram Vara Vellig. the aim of the society should be to further everything which might be of benefit to the icelandic people in america a school committee was chosen and money was collected to support the school which had hitherto been maintained through the efforts of private individuals the same year the society of icelandic women was organized in the city the aim being to aid icelandic immigrants who were arriving every year in large numbers the society also labored and contributed money to the support of the icelandic school for this purpose one of the members a young girl gudrun jan's daughter gave one half of her yearly earnings of fifteen dollars a month a striking illustration of the devoted self-sacrifice which characterized the brave icelandic immigrants in eighteen eighty three two years after the society was organized the treasurer reported that about five hundred dollars had been contributed to various charitable purposes and that a cash balance of one hundred and fifty dollars remained in the treasury the society continued to exist till eighteen ninety 
both paul thorlickson and jan bjarneson had visited winnipeg on their journeys to new iceland but no icelandic congregation was organized in the city till eighteen seventy eight when rev jan bjarneson organized the trinity congregation the real growth of this congregation began in eighteen eighty four when rev bjarneson returned from iceland to become its pastor it was then reorganized under the name of the first lutheran church of winnipeg a church was erected in 1887 in 1904 it was destroyed by fire and a new church was built the same year finer than any icelandic church which had hitherto been built there are now four icelandic churches in the city and several societies rev jan jarnason made the church service as simple as possible discarding cassock and chanting the most characteristic features of the lutheran ritual he was not only a learned man and an able speaker but an inspiring leader more highly beloved and honored by his people than any other icelander in america when he died in nineteen fourteen rev bjorn b jansen was elected president of the icelandic lutheran synod a small unitarian synod has also been founded by the icelanders in winnipeg many icelandic papers and periodicals have been published in winnipeg leifer eighteen eighty three to eighteen eighty six heimskringla which began to appear in eighteen eighty six logsburg which has been published since eighteen eighty eight and many periodicals about six thousand icelanders are now living in that city most of them are prosperous not a few being wealthy merchants and men of prominence in civic life hon thomas h jansen who has represented central winnipeg in the legislature is one of the leading men in western canada one of the leading surgeons in this part of canada is dr b j branson f a c s professor in the winnipeg medical institute from the mother colony on lake winnipeg sprang other icelandic settlements in canada one of the most prosperous of these is the one at argyle in southwestern manitoba founded in eighteen eighty by sigurdur christopherson and other settlers from new iceland many icelanders have settled in saskatchewan alberta and british columbia in the saskatchewan legislature one of their leading men hon w h paulson has served as representative groups of icelanders are also found in various cities in the united states and canada in chicago and minneapolis they have settled in considerable numbers many also live in seattle bellingham victoria marietta blaine point roberts and other places on the pacific coast the icelanders in america now number about twenty thousand about one-third of them belong to the icelandic lutheran synod one of the most notable traits of the icelanders in america as well as in their own country is their love of learning poetry and intellectual pursuits even as immigrants in a new environment and living under difficult circumstances they did everything possible to educate their children and to foster intellectual life among their people in the newly established settlements literary societies were founded congregations were organized schools and reading circles were established papers and periodicals were published as soon as the settlers had thatched their first cottages well they were yet if few in numbers they began to consider the possibility of founding a higher school preferably a college for their own young people in eighteen eighty four a young icelander freeman b anderson from toronto came to winnipeg he urged that a higher school should be established for the icelandic young people much interest was awakened and a committee was appointed to promote the plan but the difficulties to be overcome were found to be so great that the plan was abandoned it was revived at the yearly meeting of the icelandic synod in eighteen eighty seven by rev frederick j bergman and fridjan fridriksen the president of the synod rev john bjarneson had received one hundred dollars as pay for his service as editor of the church paper this sum he donated as the beginning of a fund to be raised for establishing an icelandic college under the auspices of the synod since that time the college question was brought up at every yearly meeting of the church and money was gradually collected for the college fund in nineteen hundred the question of a higher icelandic institution of learning took a new turn it was then decided to create chairs in icelandic in wesley college winnipeg belonging to the methodist church and in augustavus adolphus college of the swedish augustana synod at st peter minnesota in nineteen o one rev friedrich j bergman was appointed teacher in icelandic 
in wesley college under the auspices of the icelandic lutheran synod which also paid his salary he continued to serve till nineteen o nine when he was succeeded by runolfer martinson who served till nineteen thirteen in nineteen o five another chair in icelandic was established at gustavus adolphus college st peter minnesota magnus magnuson of cambridge england a nephew of Ariker magnuson was appointed professor serving till nineteen o nine when the chair was discontinued the desire of the icelanders to establish a higher educational institution of their own was finally realized in nineteen thirteen when a resolution was passed at the yearly convention of the icelandic lutheran synod assembled at mountain north dakota to establish an icelandic institution of learning in winnipeg canada before the next yearly meeting of the church rev jan bjarnason died and the school founded according to the resolution of the previous year was given the name of jan bjarnason academy rev runolfer martinson was elected president of the institution during the first year it had thirty students and a faculty of three teachers the aim of the school is to bring the young people who attend it under christian influence to preserve for them as far as possible their icelandic heritage and to prepare them for useful service in church and state in nineteen fourteen efforts were made to raise an endowment for the school the jan Barnison memorial fund this fund now yields a yearly income of about one thousand four hundred dollars the other necessary means for the operation of the school are derived from tuition fees and private contributions unexpected difficulties were created by the outbreak of the world war collection of funds and the erection of suitable buildings had to be postponed until peace and normal conditions should again invite a distraught generation to constructive efforts what the icelanders in america themselves have been unable to accomplish for the promotion of scholarly interest in their literature and culture has at times been done by american higher institutions of learning which have created extensive collections of icelandic books and are offering courses of instruction in older icelandic language and literature the largest collection of this kind has been created at cornell university ithaca new york through the initiative of professor willard fisk formerly librarian of the university the collection which is now in the charge of a special custodian professor haldor hermansson is considered to be the largest icelandic library outside of iceland end of chapter nineteen end of history of iceland by canute